Thank you. Ms. Cano, are you the aunt of Lyle and Eric Menendez? Yes, I am. And directing your attention to the family tree, could you identify where you are on that? Uh, yes, I am the daughter of Maria and Pepe Menendez. I am the second one, the sandwich, the middle one. Jose was the youngest. Okay. And it says Peter. Is Peter your ex-husband? Yes, it is. And listed beneath you are Marta, Eileen, Marianne, Peter, and Andy. Is that correct? That is correct. Those and are my children. Okay. Ms. Cano, where were you born? I was born in Cuba. And um, your brother was Jose Menendez, is that correct? That is correct. And you have a sister named Terry. Yes, is I that do. Correct? Yes, I do. And did you live in Cuba in the early years of your life? Yes, I did. And at some point, did part of the family move from Cuba into the United States? That is correct. Who was the first to move? To move permanently, you mean? No, just to leave Cuba for a period of time. The first one to leave Cuba for a period of time was probably myself and my sister Terry. How old were you when you left Cuba? I was 13 years old. 13? That's correct. Okay. And how old was your brother, Jose, at that time? Jose was close to three years younger than me, so he was about 10 years old. And did you have an opportunity to observe him growing up up to the time that you moved when you were 13 and he was 10? Yes, I did. And were there any other children other than the two siblings that you've described? You haven't had any who've since died or anything like that, is that No, correct? no, that's correct. And in your family home, was there a difference between the way you and Terry were treated and the way your brother was treated? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. May we approach, Your Honor? No. Your Honor, I'd like to make an offer, because this is going to come up a number of times. OK, then you Thank may. You. All right, let's proceed, please. Um, Your Honor, I, I would ask the court's indulgence at this point in time. It's uh, 10 of 12. We have a witness who will be available at 1.30 who can lay the foundation for the questions that I'm asking uh, Ms. Cano. And yeah, that uh, witness is who? Dr. John Briere. All and, right, uh, and is there some issue uh, relating to that witness's testimony by the prosecution? Briefly. All right. All right, uh, do you have any other matters with this witness uh, to go on any other subject, or is that all she was going to testify about? No, there are other matters, but uh, I, I would, would ask that you go ahead with them then. <clears throat> Did you observe Kitty and Jose Menendez and their children as those children were growing up? Yes, I did. And were you frequently in their home? Frequently enough. And did you make any observations with regard to the treatment of Jose Menendez of his two boys? Yes, yes I did. Lack of foundation. I believe she said she was in the right, home. Right, we have a foundation as far as time. You're talking about any particular time frame. Were you, did you see these boys when they were small children? Yes, I did. And did you see them regularly during the years they were growing up? Objection vague. Well, that's foundational, and uh, you can ask the question. Do you understand what she means? Yes. Yes, I did. And were there periods when you were in the house visiting or watching them at various functions more often than others? Yes. Okay. And what period of time were you around the family most often? We were usually together uh, at least two weeks during the summer and at least two weeks during Christmas holidays, to say the least. Okay. And did you live near them for a period of your, your life? I lived very near them between 1979 and 1986 that I moved to Florida and Jose moved to California. And did you see the family regularly during that period as well, 1979 to 1986? Yes, I did. And were you able to make observations of the relationship of Jose Menendez with his two sons? Yes, I did. And did you make similar observations with regard to Kitty Menendez and her two sons? Yes. Could you tell me now what observations you made with regard to Jose Menendez and his eldest son, Lyle? Objection irrelevant calls for improper opinion. Well, it's vague when you say observations. could be more specific as what you're uh, referring to. Did you observe Jose and Lyle 
together. Yes, I did. And when you observed them together, could you describe what the relationship was? Was it lighthearted and laughing? Was it serious? What was the nature of the relationship? Objection, vague and improper opinion. It's, it's not an opinion, it's her, objection, her obser observations. All right, uh, re without the argument, the objection is overruled. You can answer the question. I observed Jose and uh, Lyle in many ways. Um, Jose was very possessive. Uh, it was always a monologue. What do you uh, mean it was always a monologue? Lyle was not allowed to express his opinions. Uh, he was told what to do. He was directed exactly to Jose's wishes. Uh, um, it was, uh, the boy seemed to be very tense, very frightened, very obstructed yeah. to his own opinion. Yeah, I moved to strike it. It's calling for a conclusion on the side. All right, the objection is sustained. The, the entire answer is stricken since it's gone beyond the question, so you have to proceed again. When you observed Lyle and Jose together, did you observe them having conversation? Objection, Vegas. Ever. The question is ever. Yes, okay. during the time she was in their presence. Yes. No, there was no conversation. There was a monologue. And can you describe for us what you mean by there was a monologue? Whenever a situation back up from the whenever a situation occurred that uh, something had to do with Lyle, Jose would tell him exactly what he should do, not do, what he did wrong, what uh, exactly needed to be done in a very, uh, very demanding, uh, intimidating way. Did Jose attempt to have control over Lyle with regard to the schools to which he was sent? Definitely. Definitely. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did you observe Jose and Lyle in situations in which Jose was having these, the monologue you describe? Yes, I did. Can you tell me how young Lyle was when these monologues began? Oh. Always. I mean, he was two years old. He would pull him on an arm and, and say, you stop that, and you do this, and you stay here, and you do that. And what was different about that from the way you disciplined your children? I, I didn't do that to my children. Objection irrelevant. the Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Were there periods of time in which Jose would sit Lyle down? and give him instructions. Yes, Jose always gave his instructions separately, though. He would take the boys, uh, especially any one of them, but in this case, Lyle, away from the family. And he would say, come here, I have to talk to you, and go on a place where they could be private. And how long would these talks last? It could be from 10 minutes to half an hour. Objection sustained. Excuse me, when did you come? I didn't get the objection. Seems facts, not in evidence, call for yourself. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. If you can back up from the microphone just a bit. Yes. So Your Honor, can you hear me here? She yes. indicated that he would take him aside and have talks with him. Yes, I heard that the That was testimony. the evidence. Okay, objection and sustained. And then the question was, how long would these talks last? Yeah, the court sustained the objection and stri uh, struck the answer. stricken the answer. You may ask your next question. As to the length of the conversation? Ask another question. You can re-ask it, go on mm -hmm. something else, or ask it another way. When I can come back, the game is you don't know. All right. Would you see Jose remove Lyle from the company of other people? Yes. And would he indicate what, he, what the purpose for removing him was? No, he, was, he would just say, I need to talk to you. Okay. And would they disappear from view for a while? Yes. And then would they reappear? That's correct. And how long would these periods of time be in which they were gone from your view? Depending on the circumstances. Objection overruled. The answer will stand. Okay. What is the range? The range would be between 10 minutes to 35, 40 minutes. Okay. And did these talks occur when Lyle was young or when he was older? Objection is in fact not having enough. Objection overruled. Uh, in different occasions at all ages, I recall from okay, age four. You've answered the question. Okay. What is the youngest that you remember these types of separate 
pulling aside to have conversations with him, incidents occurring? Four years old. And when they would return, how would Lyle look? He would be very quiet. He would just stay on a corner and practically don't continue whatever he was doing or whatever conversation he was having. And did you see uh, gestures of warmth from Jose to Lyle? Not really. Okay. Now, was there a different relationship between Jose and his younger son, Eric? Yes, there was. And what was the difference? Objection calls for conclusion on the part of the witness. Sustained. Did you see Eric treated differently than Lyle was treated by Jose? Yeah. Overruled. Yes, he was. And what was the different behavior that you observed? He was more inclined to be tender with Eric in certain circumstances. Um, he did not see Eric the same way he saw Lyle. Lyle was for his own image. Eric what you, was. What do you mean by Lyle was Excuse for? Me. A motion to strike the answer. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. What was the behavior you saw with regard to Lyle from Jose with regard to his expectations, if you know? Can I say what Jose said to me? Uh, objection, Jose. Okay. You can say what you saw. It okay. wouldn't be here, Your Honor, I'd, I'd like to stay with that other question. It's not hearsay. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter. It's being offered to explain his conduct at the time. All right, we'll take a recess at this point, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll resume. Since and the, the jurors for matters. both defendants are back in court, uh, and we'll resume with the <laughs> trial. The defense may call its next witness. We're going to recall now, Your Honor, uh, Mrs. Marta Cano. Would you state your name again for the record? A. Menendez Cano, C A N O. All right. Mrs. Cano, you previously testified that you were Jose Menendez's sister, correct? Right? That is correct. And the prior witness, Marianne Cano, is your daughter. That is true. All right. Um, in 1979, did you and your children move to Princeton, New Jersey, that area? Yes, we did. Before that, you lived where? Before that, I lived in San Juan, Puerto Rico for 14 years. And during the time that your family resided in San Juan, Puerto Rico, did you make trips to the United States during which you'd see other members of your family? Yes, I did. In 1972, <laughs> do you recall making a trip to the United States where you stayed with your brother Jose and his family in their home in New York? Yes, I did. At that time, were they living in the Muncie house that's on this chart? That is correct. And was this Muncie house, um, was the lot upon which this house stood at that time <clears throat> fairly heavily wooded? Yes, it was. Was it heavily wooded in the backyard? Yes, it was. Now, I want to show you a photograph. Um, what's next in morning? Excuse me? 178. Thank you. May I mark this 178, Your Honor? Yes. It's a photograph that appears to show a family gathering and a Christmas tree. Do you recognize this photograph? Yes, I do. Uh, there's a marking on the back of that photograph. Did you put the marking there? Yes, I did. And what is the marking? December 1972. And where was this photograph taken? That, that photograph was taken during the week that we spent on Jose and Kitty's property in Monsey, New York, during Christmas 1972. You said you stayed on their property. Did you uh, camp out or did you stay in the house? No, we stayed in the house. All right. And you stayed with them for a week? Yes, we did. And at that time, how old was Eric? Eric was a baby. He was not, he had been two in November. The end of November. So he was two years and one month? That is correct. And Lyle was going on? Lyle was four and he was going on five in January. Now, <coughs> was it uh, characteristic? Counsel, yeah, so if you go back to the uh, podium. Was it characteristic in the family to celebrate um, 
Eric's birthday at Thanksgiving? Or y yes, it was. And was it also typical of celebrating Lyle's birthday at Christmas? That is correct. So to the best of your recollection, did you ever attend any separate birthday functions for Lyle or for Eric, separate from these other holidays that were also happening? No, unless it was a, a family gathering on that specific month for another reason. Okay. Now, when you visited the family in 1972 during that week, uh, did you see any behavior uh, on the part, first of all, of your brother towards the children that you thought was notable? Yes, I did. And would you first describe the types of behaviors that you saw by your brother towards the children that you noted? Do you want it towards Eric or towards Lyle? Well, you can start with Eric if you like. Well, with Eric, it was totally ignored unless he was doing something that Jose didn't like. And then he would just get up from the social gathering and say, Eric, very strongly and go grab him, pull him, bring him, put him against between his knees. And then he would squat and hold him on the shoulder and say, listen to me. And Eric would cry instantly. The instant the father would touch him, he would start crying. He said, stop crying. I tell you to stop crying. Why can't you stop crying? And he kept on yelling at the kid. And of course, Eric would cry more. And then he would get completely frustrated and just send him to his bed, to his room. and just stopped right there. He just couldn't stand it. Now this is when Eric is two. Yeah. And did you see this on more than one occasion during that week? Yes, I saw it twice on that week. And when he would send this two-year-old to his room, would the child stay in the room? Yeah. We didn't see him anymore that afternoon. And would anybody, would, would his mother, would, would Kitty go to the room uh, to see what the two-year-old was doing in his room? No, as a matter of fact, I tried, and Kitty Wait. stopped me. Excuse me, there be an objection? No, no. sorry. No. All right. All right, the objection is sustained. The answer is stricken after no. Okay. You never saw Kitty go to see what was happening inside the room with the two-year-old? No. Did you go? Did you go? No. Did you try to go? Yes. And who, if anyone, prevented you from going? Kitty. And tell us what happened. Objection irrelevant. Overall. She told me that her father had punished him and that I should not interfere. Her father had punished His him? father. And you should not interfere? That is correct. Did you ever observe, uh, well, let's stay with this week for a moment. Did you ever observe uh, Kitty Menendez during this week ever interfere with Jose's punishments of Eric? No, not at all. Now. Was there any other behavior besides um, the yelling, the grabbing, the shaking, and the sending to the room that you saw demonstrated by Jose in 1972 towards Eric that you thought was notable? No, what I thought it was noticeable is that they were not supervising him and he was playing around with all the rest of the cousins which were much older and it just scared me to see such a little one outside playing with the big ones. And you never saw, did you ever see uh, Kitty Menendez go out periodically to check on the baby? No. Now let's turn then to what you saw that was notable concerning your brother's behavior towards Lyle during that same period of time. Uh, was well, it different than his behavior towards Eric? Yes. Would yes, it was. Describe what you saw with respect to Lyle. Well, he... He tried to, he was very proud of Lyle whenever Lyle was doing something competitive against any one of the other cousins. And uh, he would brag about it. Look at Lyle, I mean, he's strong and he can hit Peter and he can hit so and so and, and not cry. And he loved the fact that Lyle didn't cry and even if they were hitting him. Um, Is this was sort of roughhousing among the boy cousins? Yeah, Jose used to induce that type of competitiveness, fighting type of relationship, which I personally disliked. He induced it or he, he encouraged it between who? Between Lyle and whom? He encouraged it between Lyle and Eric or between Lyle and Peter, which was two years older than Lyle at the time. And, and he would brag that Lyle wouldn't cry even if Peter was hitting him? That is correct. What else did you notice with respect to the way that Jose treated Lyle? Oh, well, there was an instance similar to Eric's instance. And would you describe that? Uh, Lyle was playing with Peter and something occurred. I don't remember. It was nothing 
big. Jose did exactly the same thing. We were sitting on the gathering, we were all talking, and we didn't see the incident. Let me stop you for a moment. When you say we were sitting at the gathering, we were all talking, who were you talking about? My ex-husband Peter, Kitty, Jose, and I were sitting in the family room talking while the kids were playing. So that the four adults were sitting and talking? That's correct. And at one point while you were sitting and talking, something happened? That is correct. And what happened? I don't know exactly what happened. Something I mean, what happened that they you were see? running. Peter was, uh, er, Lyle was running after Peter, and uh, Jose got out and said, Lyle, and did the same thing, jank him on the, on the bicep and pull him up and put him in front of him. And there was a big difference with Eric's uh, respondo. There was a big difference in whom, in Jose, or a big difference in the child? In Lyle. He would get very stiff very, very stiff and look down and close his eyes and just listen to whatever his father had to say to him. So Lyle didn't burst into tears and start crying? No, he did not. And what was the resolution then of the confrontation between Jose and Lyle? Lyle is silent, he's listening, then what happened? He held him on the shoulders and showed him the same thing and being on a squat position looking straight at him and he said, you stop that. You listen to me, you stop that. And Lyle just stayed there. He just he stopped whatever he was doing. He wasn't sent to his room, though? No, he was not sent to the room at that time. He just went to one side and stayed there for a while. Okay. Now, Mrs. Cano, at that time in your life, in 1972, were you a teacher? Yes, I was. And what level did you teach? That's I irrelevant. Overall, you can ask the question. I was teaching preschoolers from uh, nursery to first grade. And for how long a period of time in your life were you a preschool teacher? 14 years. Now, did you in 1972 during this visit with the family um, make any effort to talk to your brother about these behaviors that you saw? Yes, I did. Did you make any effort to talk to your sister-in-law about the the, the punishments and the lack of supervision. Yes, I did. And what was your brother's <coughs> response when you tried to talk to him about his treatment of the children? He thought I was talking plain nonsense. He just made the fun out of me and asked me how many PhDs did I have in psychology and how many books they had I read and who wrote them. And he just diminished my, my whole issue like ridiculous and not important. What had you said to him? Sustain. And what about uh, Kitty? What was was she present when Jose was uh, mocking you this way? Yes, he, she was. And what did she do or say? She Objection. just irrelevant. Sustain. Well. Objection sustained. Did you ever talk to her separately? Yes, I did. And uh, did she seem to listen to what you were saying? No, she didn't think it was important. show you a photograph. One seventy nine is the vertical, one eighty is the horizontal. And if you want to put these two. these two photographs and ask if you recognize the people in them. Yes, I do. 
Uh, who's the smaller person? Oh, God, that's Eric. And who's the larger person? My brother, Jose. And do you recognize... Um, okay. All right, have you seen these pictures before? No, I have not. Did you see them in a small version? I don't recall. Okay. Your next question, please. All right. uh, does Eric appear to be between one and two years old in this photograph? Yes. In both of the photographs? Yes. Do you... Um, Well, um, whether your sister-in-law, Kitty, frequently took photographs yes. of the family. Yes, she did. Um, do you recall ever seeing your brother take photographs of uh, family gatherings or of the children? No, I do not. So was, was uh, Kitty the family photographer? Yes, she was. Um, were you aware in 1971 and 1972 that your brother would take the baby to the gym? Yes, I was. I did. I, I moved to strike the answer as lack of personal knowledge on the foundation. Sustain the answer straight. Did you ever see your brother take the baby to the gym? No, I did not. Okay. Did you ever see your brother? Um, have Eric hold on to a, a bar and lift him with it. Yes, I did see that. And uh, how old was Eric when you saw your brother doing that? In 1972. He was two years old. And uh, would you describe what your brother would do with respect to the baby and the bar? He would just pull it up and hold him up and see how much he could stand without crying. And eventually would the baby start to cry? Yes. And uh, after the baby started to cry, would your brother then put him down? He would laugh at him and then put him down and keep on laughing because he was such a little one. Uh, you know, he, he, he was such a sissy. He just cried for everything. And had you ever seen your brother uh, do the same exercise with Lyle? No, I did not. Uh, Mrs. Cano, are you Eric's godmother? Yes, I am. And do you love him very much? Yes, I do. Were you present for his baptism? No. Why was that? Sustain. Over the years of Eric's uh, childhood, between the ages of, <coughs> say, two and 15, Were you attempting to see him or be with him more than your brother and your sister-in-law would permit? Definitely. Did you feel that you were being purposely excluded? Yes, I did. Sustained answer stricken. Did you know before Eric's baptism that you were being named godmother? Sustained. After the visit in 1972, did you continue to see your brother and his family um, for certain family gatherings over the course of the year? Yes. Uh, what would you do, for example, living in San Juan, what would you do at Christmas? 
We will go over to either Jose's or Terry's and spend a week there during the Christmas holidays. So you came to, the, to uh, New Jersey for Christmas? That is correct. What about Thanksgiving? No, I did not. What about other holidays or events? Did you come over for any of those? It, during the summer, we usually spend two weeks also in the New Jersey area. And during those two weeks, would you see your brother and his family at family functions? Yes. Now, did you, over the years between 1970, say, and 1979, uh, develop a friendly relationship with your sister-in-law, with Kitty. Yes, sir. Overall. Yes, I did. And did you spend time even alone with her? Yes, I did. And did you find her to be a person who talked about her life much? Person irrelevant. Overall, do you can ask that, yes or no? No. Uh, did she ever talk about her children? Person irrelevant. Overall. Yes, she did. Did she ever tell you anything about any problem with either of her children? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. All right, did, did she, uh, well, when she talked about her children, did she tell you good things? No, not really, depend. Okay, did she tell you about Eric's learning disabilities? No. Did she tell you when they lost things, lost matches, no. lost rounds? No. Did she tell you when they got bad grades in school? No. Did she tell you when they were unhappy? No. Did she tell you Lyle okay, wet his Okay, let's not go through a litany of things here. My question is, did she ever say negative? Did she ever tell you about the negative things or the problems or the no. troubles? No. So when she talked about them, would she talk about the winning? Yes. And the competing? Correct. And the superior yes. qualities? Yes. Yes. And were those qualities all related to sports and athletics and competition? And school, yes. And school. What did she tell you, for example, about Eric's performance at school? That he was ex- Sustained. It's not being offered for the truth at all, Your Honor. Then it's irrelevant. Sustained. Did you ever have any reason to believe, based on conversations with either your sister-in-law or your brother, that Eric was anything but a fabulous student? That's no. Irrelevant. Sustained. The answer straight. Did they ever indicate to you, well, first of all, do you believe they were telling you the truth when they reported to you on their children's accomplishments? Objection, irrelevant. Sustained. I'd like to be heard in this area. Though. All right, we'll take but a I recess, think. ladies and gentlemen, and we'll resume at uh, 1.30. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 1.30. All right, the jurors have left. Uh, what was it that you wanted to uh, discuss? This family, I mean, I, I know the people are going to argue, and uh, the press has asked, and it's a common question, which is, uh, how could it be that these boys were abused and molested for so long and nobody knew? And one of the aspects of this family, which is very similar to uh, probably most uh, seriously abusive families, is the fact that they're incredibly secret and private. And what was typical in this family, and with Mrs. Menendez in particular, is that she would lie about her children's accomplishments uh, in order to present this facade of the perfect, perfect, high-achieving, winning championship family, um, and never, ever discussed anything, any issues that were problematic. Now, that has relevance to our defense and to the testimony of our expert witnesses and our clients in two ways. First of all, Mrs. Menendez was extremely concerned with status, and the court has been, based on prosecutorial objection, severely limiting us in the ability to show that she has this particular attitude that status is very important, not just material status, but respectability and people's opinions of her family as respectable and high achieving and high status. Um, and that has to do with how she would be predicted by or expected by her children to react when they are threatening to reveal to the world uh, probably the least status gaining activity parents can indulge in, which is sexual molestation. But it's also significant because it was another way in which these children were told that the secrets of the family must be kept secret, secret, secret. 
the fact that she would lie about their accomplishments, both in front of them and not, um, and hide anything troublesome or problematic uh, taught them at a very early age that nobody knows outside this family and nobody can know what happens inside this family, which was one of the ways that the, the boys were isolated and one of the ways they grew up believing there is nobody out there who would hear us, who would listen, who would understand. So I know it keeps coming up, but we, it sure hasn't come out yet for the juries that this is a very secretive, very duplicitous, very um, dishonest person who lies to keep family secrets and who lies to project this aura of perfection. And her boys hear this, I and mean, they don't hear this particular conversation, but there are other witnesses who will indicate that the boys hear this and this simply reinforces these three competing sets of messages. Number one, status and what people think is everything. Number two, we're really not good enough because mom lies to make us seem even better. And number three, no one must ever know that there's anything bad going on around here of any kind, even a bad grade. And so that's the themes that, that, that this kind of evidence supports. Do you wish to respond? Uh, yes, interestingly, for all their secretiveness, we've had four cousins now testify that they lived in the home over various periods of time, one on um, several occasions and for more than a year. And those witnesses have been permitted to testify as to the, fam the family's habit and customs. But to now try to prove that, I believe Mrs. Menendez um, was not forthcoming with this particular relative, does not seem to prove any issue that is, that is I mean, it seems to be remote and it doesn't seem to prove an issue which goes to a legal defense in this case. Um, they have put on at least four people who lived in the home. This particular type of evidence what was the precise question that you wanted to ask good question <laughs> I don't remember right now well, I tried well, to do it two or three different ways well you wanted to ask whether she had a personal opinion that the mother was truthful obviously well, that, was that would be a conclusion on the part of the witness okay um, I wanted to ask her if, if Kitty was a very private and secretive person who never revealed anything negative or intimate about the family. And I think she would say yes. All right. Well, that's a compound question and goes into uh, conclusions as well. Your Honor, we'd also... Well, you know, Your Honor, we all, we all warn us. Let me, let me just wait, wait, wait. Let me hear the people's position. We'd also assume that's not in All right. Yes. Ultimately, here as... Um, we have discussed before the issue is what uh, was in the minds of the defendants at the time uh, the parents were killed. And um, now we're basically having questions asked in regards to what the mother did or did not say in a time frame from 1972 until 1989. And that's really uh, calls for speculation and conclusion and also um, doesn't relate to the defendant's state of mind. So what this witness did or did not hear the mother say is not really the issue. It's what the defendants say they heard the mother say. Could be an issue in this case anyway. It does bear on the defendant's state of mind. Their state of mind is at least in part, was that their mother was quite capable and willing to kill them to keep a scandal like this from breaking. I mean, that at the very, very end, the ultimate, I mean, there's lots of intermediate states of mind that, that add to that one, but at the very, very end, they were convinced that this highly secretive, uh, highly status conscious, um, ally of dad more so in the last years than ever before would kill them rather than let them go public to get help by letting the world know what had been going on in that Would family. kill them and was going to kill them Would imminently. Would kill them and was going to kill them imminently. I mean, and she, she said before, the, the night before, she told my client, you're the reason this family isn't going to work out. She blamed him for the crisis that they were going through because he had had the, the effrontery to finally go to somebody for help, for having gone to his brother seeking his help in getting the molestation to stop. Um, she had taken a position in the last years uh, of openly telling both of her children that she hated them and wished they had not been born. And we have witnesses, including this one, to whom she made the same statement in the presence of the children when they were even smaller. 
Uh, this was not pure fantasy on this part. This is a woman who was a uh, hostile, secretive, private, dishonest, and concerned more than anything else with what the outside world perceived of her. And I am not being able, we have not been able through, even through the four cousins who lived there, to be able to get into what they all do know and haven't been permitted to testify to, which is that she was incredibly secretive and was incredibly private and never revealed any negative details. Now, that isn't a bare conclusion on Mrs. Cano's part, because after they're dead, all this stuff comes out that was never talked about. Eric's dyslexia, Lyle's bedwetting, uh, the burglaries, which no one in the family was told about, a uh, Jose's affair, which went on for eight years, which put Kitty in the hospital as a suicide attempt. She never told anyone about that, although it was the driving misery of her life for three years. She's in therapy twice a week, never breathes a word of it, because scandal is to be avoided at all costs. And that is a very important theme. And Council, moreover, again, uh, what you're slowly uh, and gradually um, moving towards here is uh, a psychoanalysis of the parents. And, and I think that's appropriate. Well, uh, that's an issue that uh, I'm sure we'll discuss. But at this point, uh, the court is going to sustain the objection. The relevance of this evidence, if it's relevant at all, only relates to what the defendants knew or were aware of in regards to the attitude of the parents and not what someone else has by way of opinion or perception of uh, the uh, mother's uh, personality or uh, behavior. But then you're saying we cannot corroborate our clients with anyone else. In other words, let's assume hypothetically I make an offer of proof. Eric will testify that he knew his mother lied about him all the time, that he knew his mother was very secretive that he knew his mother was concerned about status. Does that mean we cannot put on any other witness to corroborate them? They have to sink or fall on their own credibility, it, and they're the defendant? It would have to depend upon what issues uh, were relevant. If uh, the defense position is that the defense case will rise or fall on whether or not the parents disclose that uh, one of the defendants uh, wet his bed, then uh, that won't be relevant and won't be very persuasive. If there is something more significant at issue, then uh, exactly. perhaps it uh, might be relevant. But much of what you say are things that normally don't go outside of the household. Well, so it doesn't prove right, anything. In this household, nothing goes outside the household. And instead, lies are being told. Uh, and, and they're being told right in front of the boys most of the time. They hear all these false Then reports. those are the things you can but, bring out. But here's, here's my point, and that's this, when we talk about uh, opinions and conclusions. We all make judgments about other people's personalities, okay? Um, I would say, for example, if I were asked about you, that you are not a person who is ever personally forthcoming about anything emotional, and that has to do with having been acquainted with you for a very long time, although never close, but just as a personality type. Now that's not some wild speculation on my part. All I'm trying to, and people who, who have any acquaintance with me at all, as, and I'm sure you would agree, would say I am a relatively emotional speaking person. I talk about feelings a great deal. It, that's not a wild speculative type of conclusion. I think people would say you are a very private person. I am a less private person. And those are the only kinds of questions I'm really asking this witness. Kitty Menendez was known as a very private person. I don't think it takes, that, that's not a wild conclusion, and it doesn't call for hearsay. It is simply knowing that this is not a person who talks freely about their personal life. All right, so I um, think I should be able to elicit that. All right. Uh, the uh, nature of your arguments, uh, per, uh, personalizing it, doesn't help very much. But regardless of that, I'll make a public ruling that I don't find it's relevant. All right. All right. Anything else now before we take our recess? All right, we'll be in recess until 1.30. Record will reflect that both defendants are in court with their counsel and people are represented. You may continue your direct examination. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Connell, uh, drawing your attention again to the, uh, the photographs of uh, Eric um, on this bar. Was it at about this age that you also saw your brother holding him uh, pulling him up on a bar in the house? Yes. And did you have a, uh, uh, a conversation with your brother when, on one of these occasions when he was pulling uh, Eric up on the bar uh, in which you were trying to give him information about how dangerous that was? Yes, I did. And uh, what were you trying to tell him? Or what were you telling him? 
What did you say? Is that the question? Yes, Your Honor. Objection overruled. I pleaded him not to do it based on the major accident that my husband, my okay, son had uh, had. Did, just, what did you say? The objection is sustained, the answer is stricken. Just what did you tell say? Us basically what you said. I told him that uh, a, neurosur a neurosurgeon had told me that anything that was above the child's level height was a base to a skull fracture. Had your son suffered a skull fracture by falling off a jungle gym? Yes. Did you tell your brother about that? He knew about it. You had discussed it in the family before this evening? Oh, definitely. It was a major thing. And what, uh, and how old was your son when he suffered the skull fracture? Three and a half. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. But was your son older even than Eric when he was injured? Same objection. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Were you passing on information to your brother that you had received from the doctors that had treated your son? Yes. And what was your brother's reaction? He just laughed at it. Was your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, present when you were saying these things to your brother? Yes. Did she appear to be uh, part of the conversation, attentive? Yes, she was. And what did she do when you, when you made these statements? Same expression as Jose. She just la smiled as well. Over the years, did you have an opportunity to observe your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, with respect to whether she was a person who was physically strong or physically weak? Yes, I did. Overall. And how would you describe her as a woman with respect to physical strength? Kitty was very, very strong. She could do things that even Jose couldn't do. What kinds of things? For example, when they were moving from a very close apartment within the same block, they were uh, picking up furniture, and Jose went to get some help to move a mirror that he was not able to pick up. And when he came back, Kitty had already taken it by herself. Did you observe her doing things like that, moving heavy objects in her home in the presence of the boys? Yes. Did there come a time in approximately 1985 when you assisted Kitty in getting some drugs? Yes, I did. And would you tell us about that? Objection I'm sorry? 352. All right, did uh, counsel wish to be heard on that? Well, perhaps if I make it more specific, Your Honor. Uh, did you obtain some Valium for her in 1985? or give her some Valium? Yes. And was this a prescription of yours? Yes. And what was the reason why you gave her the Valium at that time? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. In 1985, Mrs. Cano, did you notice some change in your sister-in-law's behavior, even when she was in front of the children? Yes, I did. And what was the change that you noticed? Kitty was sort of incoherent. She was very tense and very nervous, and, and uh, she seemed to glare at things and, and just stay quiet and don't respond to things that we were talking about. Did that behavior seem, um, how would you characterize it? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. Did it seem normal? Did it seem unusual? Did it seem strange? It, it, it was not normal. Objection to move to strike the answer is improper opinion. Objection sustained, the answer is stricken. Why, did, why do you remember this behavior? Irrelevant. Sustained. What was there about this behavior that struck you at the time? Objection sustained. Let's move on to something else. Did you ever see the children react to this change in her behavior? Yes, I did. And what did you see by way of reaction on their part? They were sort of evading her. You mean avoiding her? Avoiding her, yes. Did she ever share with you any problems that she was having that might have caused that behavior? Objection, irrelevant. I don't believe Whose behavior doesn't. you're talking about? The children's behavior or the Ms. Menendez's behavior? Mrs. Menendez, did she ever offer an explanation for this behavior? Overall. Yes, she did. And what did she say was uh, the explanation for this behavior? Overall. 
She told me that uh, she was okay, but she was going through a very difficult time that uh, she needed to take some Valium and she needed to take some medicine, that she had run out of it. So she never did actually explain what was going on. Can I also conclusion on part Strike that. My previous question was, did she actually tell you what was the difficult period, what was going on, what were the problems? No. Had you commented on her behavior? Is that how you got, is that why she said what she said? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. Was what she said, did that follow immediately upon your commenting on her behavior? Yes. <clears throat> did you ever observe during the time the family was living in New Jersey and during the time that you were living in New Jersey did you observe your sister-in-law doing her children's homework? Yes, I did. Now, were the children there? Was she doing it with them or was she doing it for them? No, they were playing tennis outside. And she was in the house? Yes. Do, when you say they were playing tennis, were they doing practices and drills? That's correct. They weren't goofing off? No. And she was actually doing the schoolwork inside the house? She was doing Eric's homework. Did you ever physically, I mean, strike that, did you ever personally observe her writing Lyle's college application essays? Yes, I did. Was he present and contributing, or was she doing this on her own? No, she was doing it on her own. Do you recall, just to move ahead for a moment, you were here in Los Angeles in June of 1989, weren't you? Yes, I was. And did you attend Eric's graduation? Yes, I did. And that was at Beverly Hills High School? Yes. And did you um, go to the graduation with your sister-in-law? Yes, I did. With Kitty Menendez? Yes. And how many of you were in the car on the way to the graduation? On the way to the graduation, uh, it was Jose, Kitty, my mother, and I. Okay. On the way back from the graduation, was there a different group of people in the car with Kitty? Yes. And who was in the car with Kitty on the way back? It was Eric, uh, Uncle Gene, and myself. Now, as far as you understand it, Uncle Gene was the brother of Kitty's mother? That is correct. And did something unusual happen on the way back home from the graduation when Kitty was driving? Yes. And would you tell us what happened? Kitty hit a car on the back. She was accelerating very rapidly and the light changed and the car in front of us stopped and she hit the car on the back and uh, the car okay, turned. Just stop right there. After she hit the car, what did she do? Well, the car turned on the road to stop to, to talk about the accident, and she just put the accelerator on and asked, us, asked Eric to look back and see if he had seen the license plate. So she ran from the scene? Yes. Now, did she say anything to, to you or, and to Eric uh, concerning what had happened? Yes, she did. She said that she did not want Jose to know about this and asked Eric to tell him that she had, been, she had gone to the grocery store. Okay. She was asking Eric to tell his father that she went to the grocery store? That's correct. Uh, well, was she planning on going somewhere? She was going to drop us and go and fix the car. Okay. So she asked Eric, tell your father I've gone to the grocery store. That's correct. What did Eric say? He said, no, not me. I don't want to tell anything to my father. Okay. And then did she ask someone else to do something? Yes, she asked me. <coughs> she asked you what? To tell Jose whenever she dropped us that she had gone to the grocery store for some things that she needed. And did you in fact do that? Did you tell your brother this lie that she was going to the grocery store? Unfortunately, I did because when I walked in, he asked me where was Kitty. Had you been in other situations before that with Kitty Menendez where she did something dishonest and asked you to lie about it or asked the children to lie about it? Yes. Sustained. Answer straight. 
Did you ever on any other occasion hear her encourage either or both of her children to lie? Yes. Did you observe over the course of uh, the time that your brother and Kitty were married, did you observe her ever fighting back to your brother, arguing with him, physically hitting him? Yes, I did. Overall, the answer will stand. Yes, I did. Towards the, the end of, of their lives, in the last few years, did you still see that kind of behavior or was, had it changed? No, I did not. It was a big change. Do you recall seeing um, Jose and Kitty at your father's funeral? Yes, I did. Would you tell us when that was? February of 1987. And at that time, did you notice a significant change in the behavior that you had seen as between Jose and Kitty before that? Yes, I did. What did you notice in 1987 that was different? They were holding hands. They were together all the time. Jose will ask for Kitty's opinion on the issues that were being brought up. In conversation? Yes. And was that different than what you had seen before? Very different. And how was it different? Well, he used to humiliate Kitty and laugh at her and uh, intimidate her and uh, put her down and, and, and not would, consider her opinion at all. And would he do that in front of the children? Yes, he did it in front of everybody. In front of the family? Yes. By the way, did you see your brother do that kind of behavior with the boys when they were teenagers? Definitely, especially Eric. Did you see him do that to the boys even before they were teenagers? Yes. Did you see him do that to other children in the presence of the boys, like your son or any of the nieces? Yes. When your brother was in the presence of his sons, Let's first take it before they were teenagers. Uh, did you ever see him give them orders or directions, tell them what to do, tell them when to go, things like that? He did that all the time. And how did they respond to that? They just obeyed. It was a command. Did you ever see them in the, in, at any time when you were around them, when he was giving them any kind of direction or order, did you ever see either one of them argue, fight, refuse, mm -hmm. disobey? Oh, no. You say that, oh no, are you sure, never? Jose was not the type of person you could answer to. What about you, could you answer to him? No. Did you see adults try to answer him back? Yes, and they would be humiliated and ridiculed. In front of his children? In front of everybody. Now when the boys were teenagers, uh, had anything changed with respect to their obedience to their father? No, they were very obedient. Did you ever hear your brother um, uh, share his philosophy of winning? in front of his boys. Did you ever hear him make comments about his philosophy of winning in front yes. of the children? Yes, I did. And what was it you heard him say? Jose would believe that everybody could compete, but only one could win. And what? that was the only thing that counted, to win. And you heard him use those words, anybody can compete, but only one can win? Those were exactly his words. He used them several times. He used them once with my daughter. And did you ever hear him talking to his children when they hadn't won? Yes. And what were those talks like? Well, 
they were private talks. He would take the boys sideways and talk to them when they were older. When they were younger, he would use to do it in front of me and Andy and Eric, for example, which was with us. Well, let's start with that then. When, when Eric was younger and Jose was talking openly in front of you and Andy, and Eric hadn't won, what were those talks like? He would tell him he was a CC, that uh, it was about time that he became a Menendez, that uh, he was not worth his last name, that uh, he should be ashamed of his, of his average mediocre performance. And were those words that your brother typically used when criticizing average and mediocre and sissy? Yes. And was this notion about being a Menendez as being something superior, had you heard that on other occasions? Many occasions. It was this sort of your brother's uh, uh, cliche about the family Yes, tradition? he was very proud of himself and what he was, and he wanted the boys to be the same. Was he also proud of, of his parents and what they were? Yes. Now, did you have first-hand knowledge of the degree to which your brother was involved with the everyday details of his children's lives? Yes, I did. And how did you obtain that first-hand knowledge? In many ways. I mean, Let's talk about this way. Did you ever specifically overhear your brother in his office, his business office, giving instructions or directions to his wife at home? Yes. And how many times did, uh, did you overhear that? In the two occasions that I was with him waiting for a ride back home in his office. His office was where? In New York. And his home was in New Jersey? Correct, Princeton. And were there days when you would either go into the city, into New York City with him? That's correct. And he would give you rides home? Yeah, he would take me back and forth. Right. Uh, were you a working mother in that is from correct. 1979 on? Yes, I was. And did you work in New York City also? I had clients in New York City. What was your profession at that time, 1979 to, say, 1985? I was a financial planner. And you're now a stockbroker? I am both now, yes. Now, on these two occasions that you remember being in your brother's office in New York, um, what do you recall happening? We were listening to some records that he had just uh, brought up with RCA and uh, Let me he stop you there so the juries will understand. At that time, uh, did your brother work for RCA Records? That's correct. And would he, from time to time, talk about artists or up-and-coming groups and play the music for members of the family? That is correct. Okay. And is that what's happening here? Yes. While I was listening to the music, he's, he made a phone call to Kitty to, to check what the boys had done the, that afternoon, if they had been in the tennis court and how many hours, and gave him instructions of what to do until he got home. You said gave him instructions? Gave her instructions of what to do until he got home. Okay. And that happened both times that you were waiting for him to give you a ride? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Cano, do you remember what year that might have been? 1982, 1983. Let's go back, if we can, to that time around 1972. You've given us one example of an episode uh, between your brother and Lyle. Uh, did you ever see your brother, uh, apart from yelling at Lyle in the way you've described, uh, make Lyle go to his room? Yes, I did. Did you ever see him punish him by uh, not allowing him to play with the cousins? Yes, he did. Did you ever hear him in this era, 1972, call Lyle names? He ridiculed him because he did not know the answer of a question that Peter knew. <clears throat> what words would he use to ridicule him? He would tell him, you're a dummy. It's about time that you learn more. Did you ever hear him use the word idiot? Oh, yes. That was a special. Did he reserve idiot for Lyle, or did he use idiot for his other son as well? He used idiot for everybody. There Why, were a bunch of you, idiots. You idiots. So that was his favorite word. OK. Now, let's talk about the methods that you observed uh, when the children were small, beyond what you've already told us. Jose's methods for controlling the children. You've talked about his grabbing them. Were there other things that he did? 
Yes, he would look at them straight on the eyes, and he made them look at him straight on the eyes. And if, he, if they didn't, he would hold their, their face to make sure they were looking up to him. Yeah. Now, let's move forward to that time when you're living in the same community, basically, as your brother and his family. Um, Are you talking 1979? 1979 on. Uh, and with respect to how your brother treated Lyle, do you recall um, anything special about a manner or method or, or practice of your brother's uh, concerning having talks with Lyle? Yes, he, he, he encouraged competition, tremendous amount of competition he, where he always had to win. Who is he? Lyle always had to win. So you remember him telling that to Lyle? Yes. Do you remember your brother ever taking Lyle aside to talk to him? Yes. And do you recall how long those talks would last? Or at least how long they'd be off by themselves? Between 10 minutes and 45 minutes, depending on the issue. Did you ever attend, um, in, uh, during these early years in New Jersey, 79, say, to 82, did you ever attend any soccer games that Lyle or Eric were participating in? Yes, I did. And could you describe what your brother's behavior was during the course of the, his children's soccer games? He would run uh, parallel to the field with the boys and be yelling at them all the time what to do during the game. And if they did something wrong, would he yell criticism? Yes, he did. And did you ever see him uh, criticizing or yelling at the other children on the team? Yes. Did you ever observe your brother on weekends training and drilling the boys in soccer and or tennis? Yes. Do you recall ever seeing um, your brother coaching Lyle? Of course, yes. And what would be, what did you observe by way of his style of coaching Lyle? Is this soccer or tennis? Tennis for the moment. He would just hit and hit balls and hit balls and yell at him and and keep on hitting balls as hard as he could to, to Lyle. Did you ever see your, bro uh, your brother, uh, in effect, challenging Lyle to perform in front of the relatives? Yes. And what would that be about? That could be from a, a question of history to any kind of strength uh, action. Well, let's talk for a moment about things like history. He would do what, like ask him a question, make him show off to get the right answer in front of the relatives? That is correct. Peter was... Okay. Objection overruled. The answer will stand. Go ahead. Next question. Peter was a very bright young man, and he uh, but would... Peter is... You're talking right. about Peter, your son, not Peter, your husband. Peter, my son. Okay. Correct. And he would bring Lyle and try to challenge him, and if Lyle didn't respond, he would humiliate him. Okay. Who's he, though? You were talking about Peter. Is that who you mean? Who no, would bring Jose, Lyle? Jose would bring Lyle and challenge him against Peter's knowledge, which was older too, and uh, he would humiliate Lyle if he didn't know the answer that Peter had just given before. Okay, so he would try to bring Peter in, uh, rather try to bring Lyle in to compete now with your son, with Peter. That's correct. Uh, did um, you ever observe your brother Jose uh, talk to Lyle, you know, like sort of in baby talk or talking down to him like he's a child. At any age, did you ever see him do that? Objection, Did you ever see your brother talk to Lyle as if Lyle was a little child? At uh, what time frame are you talking about? Well, let me just ask you this. Did he, did he seem to treat Lyle as a, when Lyle was a small child, did he treat him like a small child from when no, he was? No, he always. Lack of foundation. Are you asking about uh, conversations or something else? I think I'd like to focus on the way he talked to him, okay? All right, why don't you rephrase the question? Thank you. Did, did he talk to Lyle when Lyle was a small child uh, as if he was a small child? No, he talked to him as an adult. And did that go on until Lyle was an adult? Of course. And what about with respect um, to Eric? Same thing. The only difference was he was very annoyed because Eric would start crying, and he just hated that. 
So when he would humiliate or yell at Eric, Eric would cry. Yeah. Objection. Uh, assume the facts not in evidence. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Calling for conclusion on the part of the witness. That he would cry? Never. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant obviously in your presence from what you could say. Right. And would Eric tend to cry when his father chastised him, humiliated him, did all those things you've discussed? Yes, he did. And would Lyle tend to do what you previously discussed, where he'd look down and yeah. be very stiff? Lyle would get very stiff, yes, and tense. I asked you before if you loved Eric very much. Yes, I do. How do you feel about Lyle? Same way. I love him very much. During his lifetime, did you love your brother? Very much. And how about your sister-in-law? I love Kitty very much, too. Did you, um, did you ever uh, hear your brother, in talking to Lyle, uh, compare Lyle unfavorably to other kids? Yes, I did. And what would those conversations be like? Um, he would challenge him uh, on a very humiliating way that, uh, look what, usually was Peter. I mean, I hate to keep on bringing that up, but it was usually Peter. When Peter became an All-American in 1983, I was telling Jose about Jose Peter's uh, doings, and he said, wait, and he called Lyle and says, I want you to listen to this. And he made Lyle listen to it, and I felt very embarrassed because it sounded like bragging. And he said to Lyle, why can't you be like your cousin Peter? Now, had you ever said to, to your children in front of Eric or Lyle, why can't you be like somebody else? No. No. Was that one of those things as a preschool teacher that you were trying to tell your brother not to do? That's correct. Now, let's turn for a moment to focus on Eric and uh, your brother's treatment of Eric from 1979 onward. Let's start with the swim meets. Had you attended, did you attend some of Eric's swim meets? Yes, many of them. And uh, did you observe physically what Eric's condition would be after he had been in the water for a while? Yes. And physically, how did he appear? He would tremble and get purple, and he just shivered, completely get very tense with his hands together because he was very cold. And was that common? I mean, is this what happened to Eric when he'd go in these pools? Did yes, it was a cold pool. Uh, concerning Eric's physical build at this time, in 79, 80, 81, when he was swimming, uh, was he a pudgy kid? No, he was very skinny. Did you ever hear your brother at any of these swim meets after Eric had swam and when he was in this shivering condition, say anything to Eric about a massage? Yes. And what, Mrs. Cano, do you remember your brother saying about a massage? He would say, come on, Eric, I'm going to give you a massage so you can warm up. And what would happen after he said that to Eric? Did they go off somewhere? Yes. Eric Where? would go to him to, to a bench or somewhere nearby. And did you see your brother massaging Eric? Yes, I did. Would Eric say anything when, when your brother said, let me go give you a massage? No. Do you recall uh, an episode in 1979 or 1980 when you recall Eric crying because he lost a, a match at the swim meet? Yes. And do you recall your brother's reaction or what appeared to be your brother's reaction to Eric's crying? Jose was very angry because he had been so stupid and had lost the, the meat. And did, did, did he say, did your brother say anything to Eric about his crying? Yes, he what? just told me that, what can I do with this sissy kid? I mean, he won't stop crying. I, I can't believe this kid. And was this said in front of Eric? Yes. And after saying that, did he take Eric somewhere? He had already taken Eric somewhere and Eric was crying. He, Eric was sitting down in a little corner with his head on his knees on the floor. And what did you do? I tried to go to console him. And what happened? Jose didn't let me.
let me ask you this, Mrs. Connor. You, you were an adult at this time, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and how many years older than you was your brother? I'm two and a half years older than Jose. You're two and a half years older than Jose? Yes. Okay, so you're the older child. Right. Oh, well, why didn't you ignore him? Jose was a very strong character. You just could not go against Jose's wishes. There's no way. I mean, he, the tone of his voice, of his voice and, and the aggressiveness of, of, his, of the way he said things was very intimidating. You just did not, did not dare to do anything he didn't want you to do. Even for your godson who you love so much? Well, he stopped me. He put his hand and said, let go, Marta. He's, he'll be fine. Leave him alone. He's not a little boy. Of course, uh, how old was Eric? It was seven, eight, maybe nine. Now, did you observe your brother at any soccer matches with Eric? Yes, I did. And did you hear your brother giving Eric any kind of lecture on aggressiveness or toughness or anything like that? Yes, I did. And what was it he was telling Eric at that time? Well, at that time, the competition was against Andy. Andy was younger, but was very strong and aggressive. And he said, why can't you be like your cousin Andy? Look at Andy. Andy's tough, and, and you have to be so weak and such a sissy. And I feel what very was, bad. What was Eric doing when his father was saying that to him? Eric was looking down, very embarrassed. Can I ask you something? You saw Eric play tennis, and you saw Eric swim, and you saw Eric play soccer. Yes. Was he a sissy? No, he was not. He was great. Was he a gifted athlete? I believe so. Did he play? As to which? Gifted athlete. Objection overruled. Answer all stand. Your children are athletic too, are they? We are all athletics, yes. The whole family? Right? Yes, right. Did Eric seem to work hard at his sports? Very much so. Did he play hard at his sports? Very, very hard. Did he seem to try hard? Yes, he did. And did he get better at things as he progressed through them? He did get, but not enough for Jose. Now, do you recall when Eric was um, a youngster, uh, under teenage, that he had some very picky food habits? Yes. And without getting into, without being so picky as to get into what the picky food habits were, do you remember your brother ever commenting in front of not just Eric, but the family yes. about Eric's eating? Yes. This is in front of Eric Menendez? Yes, Your Honor. Objection overruled. And would this be something that would occur during one of these big meals, these family gathering meals like Thanksgiving or Christmas or one of those? That is correct. Okay. Would you tell us what your brother did and said about Eric and Eric's uh, food habits. Jose, in several occasions, would take Eric's plate and show it to everybody, ridiculing him, because he used to pick things to the sides that he didn't like, and, and he thought it was ridiculous what he was doing. So what would, what would you say he would take the plate around and show, and show it? it to everybody, especially to all the other cousins, to see what Eric was doing and what a sissy Eric was. Now, Eric was at the table while his father's doing it. Yes. And what is Eric doing while his father's doing this? He, he wanted to disappear. Okay, but you're yes. very embarrassed. Embarrassed. You Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Just try to tell us what you saw. He used to blush. And would he sometimes look in a, a particular direction? Yes, he tried to make it a joke too, but it didn't work. He was still blushing. Yeah. And. You say your brother would show the plate and he'd make some kind of comment? Yes. And what would he say? He would say that, uh, you know, don't you think it's about time Eric grows up and eats his whole meal? And does, don't you think this is sissy? He would show it to different cousins. And, and what would the cousins do? Everybody would laugh. Was it a frequent occurrence at these family gatherings between 1979 and 1986 when Jose was uh, belittling or humiliating other people that everybody else would laugh? Yes. Would you laugh? No. You're the only one who wasn't laughing? That's correct. <laughs> Did your daughter Marianne laugh? I don't recall, but I doubt it. Do you recall times at these family gatherings when your brother would be watching TV 
and would have some kind of interaction with Eric. Yes. And what would that be about? I mean, not what it's about. Describe for us what you saw and heard. He would call Eric when he was gone and ask him to sit down beside him and watch the program with him. And when you say Eric when he was gone, where would Eric have been gone to? Eric used to go aside and play with Andy. This is when Eric and Andy had become friends? Yes. And if Eric was off playing with Andy, is that when your brother would call to him? Yes. And what would then happen? He would just stay the rest of the afternoon beside Jose watching TV. Did he complain? No. Did he argue, oh, Dad, I don't want to. I want to play no. with Andy. Nothing like that. No. Did you observe your brother encouraging uh, competition such as arm wrestling or other physical acts between Lyle and Eric? Yes. And when your brother would encourage this, would, would both boys participate? Yes. And what would be the usual outcome? The usual outcome is that Lyle would win and he would praise Lyle and uh, ridicule Eric for losing, make a big deal out of it. And what about um, your sister-in-law, Kitty? When she, was she present for these little competitions? Yes. And how would she react when Eric lost and your brother was ridiculing him? She would smile with Jose. Did you, between the period of 1979 to 1986, when the family moved, did you ever, or do you remember, ever seeing Kitty? intercede with Jose's belittling or berating or making fun of Eric? No. Did you see how Eric treated his mother during those years? Yes. How did he treat his mother? He felt sorry for her. He looked like the, he was worried about her. He would run errands for her. Was he nice to her? Yes. Do you recall when Lyle was very young, when he was just a baby? Not much. I wasn't around. Okay. Do you recall when he was a little toddler? Yes, I do. You recall, particularly during that week even, that you stayed with them in Muncie? Yes, I do. Do you recall how Kitty treated Lyle when he was very young? She did not like Lyle. She seemed to resent him. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did she pay much attention to him? No, she did not. Did she pick him up and hug him and kiss him and coo and fondle and cuddle and do any of those things? No. Did you ever see situations, uh, particularly during that week's visit, when Lyle would express hunger, that he was hungry? Well, he would fetch for himself. He would go get on top of whatever was needed and just try to reach whatever he wanted to eat. Okay. And did, uh, did you comment on this to your sister-in-law? Yes, I tried to grab whatever he was trying to grab at one time, and Kitty told me, Marta, leave him alone. He can do it for himself. He, can, he was he's used to it. Four and a half, going yeah. on five. Had you seen anything like that even earlier? Yes. At, at about what age? I mean, what of Lyle's age? Not two, two and a half. And how did it come up at two or two and a half? Eric just uh, Lyle, Lyle. Well, Eric the same, but Lyle would just go and climb a chair and get on top of the counter and get his cereal and rip off the box mm -hmm. and pour it out and. It was just a disaster. But well, did Luke just trying to last his okay. conclusion apart? Right. The last portion of the answer was just a disaster as stricken as a conclusion. At that stage, did be, before the child went and climbed and tried to do these things, did he express hunger? And did she did she, in other words, ever did you ever hear her tell him as a little guy, go get it yourself or feed yourself or do anything? No, I did not. He 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 seemed to know that. He seemed to know that he would just go and get it himself. Sustain the answer stricken. When you observed Lyle at that young age climbing counters and reaching in cereal boxes, was your sister-in-law present? Yes. Did she make a move to grab the baby so he doesn't fall off the counter? No. Nothing. Did no. you make a move? Yes, I did. And that's when she stopped you and said he can fend for himself? That's correct. 
Let's move on to a time um, when Eric was approximately seven or eight. Do you recall a time that you were supposed to go um, shopping with Kitty? Yes, I do. Now, was this before you moved to New Jersey in 79, or was it after, and, and were just there for a visit, or was it after you moved? No, that was during the first six months that I had moved into New Jersey. All right, then Eric would have had to have been eight and a half to nine. Right. All right. Um, now, during this time, was there a day when you were supposed to go shopping with Kitty and you went over to her house? Yes. And when you got there, did you become aware that Eric go, was in some kind of condition? That is correct. And would you describe for us what, what condition you observed Eric to be in? I saw Eric in the kitchen and I went to give him a kiss and I found that he was burning in fever. Okay. And then what happened? I asked him what was wrong and he told me he was sick. You keep using he. I know it's the I'm Spanish sorry. English Eric told me he was sick. All right. And was Kitty present? Kitty was upstairs finishing getting ready to go. All right. And you think this was during, when did you move to, uh, what month did you? I moved in July 1979. This, was pro this is probably around January 1980, January, February 1980. Okay, so Eric would be just a couple of months past nine. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, at the end of the year. I know, it's confusing. Your next question, please. Eric turns his age on November 27th at the end of the preceding year. That is correct. All right, so in most of 1980, Eric is actually nine. Yes. All right, so what, uh, when, at some point, does Kitty come downstairs and you have a discussion with her about Eric's condition? Yes, I did. And does this discussion go on in front of Eric? Yes. And would you tell us what that discussion was? I just told her that we didn't have to go shopping, that uh, I didn't know Eric was sick and that, you know, we could leave it for another, another day. Okay, and what was uh, your sister-in-law's response? Oh, she told me, oh, no, Marta, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, Eric knows how to, he's fine. He's, he just has a fever, it's no big deal. And uh, was there any discussion about uh, whether he had seen a doctor or was being taken to a doctor? Overall. No, she just said to me, he knows where the aspirins are. We don't worry about it, he's used to staying by himself. Uh, what time of day was it when you were leaving to go shopping? 9.30 in the morning. And did you see any, whether there was any food prepared for the child for the course of the day? No, as a matter of fact, that's why Eric was in the kitchen. He was trying to get some breakfast. And was there any discussion with Kitty about what he would eat during the day when you guys were gone? No. And did you go shopping with her that day? Yes, we did. We went to New Hope. What was New Hope? New Hope, it's a small town in the upper section of Princeton, which was a very charming place to go. Was it a shopping area? or just It was a, a very special uh, things, like boutique type of shopping. Okay. Did it have a Dutch theme of some, or a Danish yes. theme? Yes, they do. All right. And uh, how long ago were you gone shopping with uh, Kitty Menendez that day? We were gone until 2.30 in the afternoon. And did you go back to her home with her after you were done shopping? Yes, I did. And did you observe Eric at that time? He was in his room. Did you see him or did you just... I did go in to see him and he still had fever. And do you know if he had eaten anything? I didn't ask him. During the course of the shopping trip, uh, from 9.30 in the morning to 2.30 in the afternoon. Do you recall any time when Kitty went to a telephone and called home to check on the child's health? No, I, I asked her to do so a couple of times and she told me it wasn't necessary, that he would be fine. Now, were there other occasions that you were personally aware of when Eric was left alone when he was under the age of 10? Yes. And what other occasions do you recall? One occasion I needed to go to a parent's weekend and I had asked Kitty if I could leave Andy. Okay, let me stop you there. This is an occasion when, just to make it shorter, when you went to the Menendez home on a, on a day to drop Andy off? That is correct, in 1980. Okay, so this is another time when Eric is nine years old. That's correct. And what time was it that you got to the Menendez home? About nine o'clock in the morning. And when you, uh, what day of the week was this, do you remember? This was a Saturday morning. And you were going to leave town for a short I period. I was going to leave for the day and come back in the evening. 
So when you, and, and how old was Andy at this time? Andy was two years younger than Eric, so he was about seven and a half. And would you, of your own accord, have left a seven and a half year old and a nine year old boy alone in a house? For no, I would not. Now, on this occasion, when you get to the Menendez house, is Eric there? Yeah, he was there waiting for us. Is Kitty there? No, she was not. Is Jose there? No, he was not. Is Lyle there? No, he was not. Is there a housekeeper in it or a coach or? No one was there. Just Eric? Yes. So did you drop Andy off and go off and do what you had to do? No, I asked Eric where was his mother and he told me she would be back, that she had gone shopping. And did you wait for her? Yes, I did. And what time did she get back? At 1.30. In the afternoon? Yes. And uh, during that time that you were waiting for her, uh, was, did you do anything with respect to feeding Eric? Yes, yes I did. I gave uh, Eric breakfast and um, sit with, sat with him and watch both of them play until Kitty came back. Did uh, Eric indicate to you that he hadn't eaten before you got there? No, I could see he had not because he was trying to reach for some food. Sustained the answer is stricken. At some point shortly after you arrived, did you observe Eric trying to do something? Yes. What was he trying to do? He was trying to reach some cereal. Um, over the course of the time that you visited the Menendez homes, and I believe you, you've already testified, you visited the Muncie house, correct? Yes, I did. Um, let me just, if I may approach her on it. The Muncie house, the one on the wooded lot, that's the one that you spent the weekend in 72. <coughs> that is correct. Did you visit that house other times as well? Yes, I did. Uh, during the summers? Yes. During the Christmas holidays? Yes. But you didn't stay there? No, I did not. When you would come back during the other summers and the other Christmases, when you'd come from Puerto Rico, would you stay with your sister or your mother? I stayed with Terry, my sister. Okay. So this was the only occasion when you spent an entire week inside your brother's home? Yeah, that was the only time that they invited me to stay there. Okay. And was there a fair amount of bickering going on concerning treatment of the children? Section uh, begs to when and where? During that week in Muncie in 1972 during that Christmas time. Could you repeat that question? Yes, during that Christmas time when you were there for a week, were there a number of occasions when you were having disagreements with your brother and sister-in-law about their treatment of the children? Definitely. Do you think that's why you never got invited back? Question, cause or speculation? Sustain. Let's turn to the next house, which was the Princeton Junction House. Uh, is it your understanding that the Menendez family only lived there for a year while their Pennington house was being built? That is correct. Did you ever visit them at the house in Princeton Junction? No, I did not. Did you ever even see that house? No, I did not. <laughs> now, would you say that you had the most contact with your brother's family when they lived in the Pennington, New Jersey house? Yes, I did. Now, Pennington is just a sort of suburban tract outside Princeton. Is that, that is correct, yes. In fact, was the community in which they lived, the actual development called Elm Ridge Park. Park? Yes, it was. And was this house also in a wooded, on a wooded, dark lot? Yes, it was even worse because he had a big lake in the back. Worse in what sense? What's wrong with having a lake in the back? Well, I did not like the idea of Andy and Eric being alone in the house with a lake on the back. And were there woods around that lake? Yes. And were there fields beyond those woods? Yes. And did the family, did the Menendez family have a canoe that gave them access onto that lake? Yes, they did. And was that one of the things you were worried about? Yes. Okay. And then you were aware, were you not, of the time when your brother and his family moved into the Princeton, the township of Princeton House? Yes, I did. Yes, now, I know. Mm -hmm. They lived there how many months total? About six, seven months. Total? Yes. And then they moved to California? That is correct. And the next house that they lived in was this one in Calabasas? Yes. Okay. So would it be fair to say that most of the contact 
that your your son Andy had, for example, with Eric, was had at that Pennington Elmridge Playhouse. Yes. Did uh, Andy and Eric appear to become close friends? Yes, they were very close. And did Andy spend uh, nights sleeping over at Eric's house, that house? Yes. In Pennington? Yes. And were there uh, some occasions when Eric was permitted to stay overnight at your house? Yes. On how many occasions was that allowed? I only recall two occasions. On how many occasions, conversely, was Andy allowed to sleep at Eric's house? Eric was allowed to stay at Eric's house any time I needed you to leave Eric him. Was allowed to I'm stay. sorry, Andy. Andy was allowed to stay at Eric's house or Jose's house every time I needed him because I needed to go away. You had children who were much older than you. That is correct. And they were away at school? They were in college, yes. Did you have to go see them? I wanted to go and see games or parents' weekends or things of that nature. And so would you drop Andy off at your brother's house? That is correct. Now, you've been very critical of your brother's parents at school, so yeah. why would you leave your son there? At the time, I, that's the only place Andy wanted to stay, and he was already eight and nine, and I would remind him that I was, for him to consider himself alone, and that he had to ch be careful and, and protect himself, because he was not going to get any supervision. Okay, well, what about getting criticism? Did you also give him warnings about how to cope with that? He, yes, I, I told him what to do and how to, how to behave and what not to do, even though his, his cousins will do it. I asked him to remember that I was away and that I was not there to take him to a doctor, and I wanted him to do me that favor in exchange of the favor of leaving him with Eric at the house. Okay, now I'm confused about two things. Let me ask you, were you concerned about your son's physical safety? Yes. Did you, had you observed over the years what, what you believe to be a lack of adequate physical supervision of Eric and Lyle? Yes. And in fact, was there an occasion when your son was young and was with Kitty at her home and he sustained an injury? That is correct. An injury that required stitches to his face. 17 stitches. Now, so you had concerns that your child might have some physical harm if he stays with them? Yes. So you would drill him, be a good boy, don't run like your cousins, do that sort of thing. That's right. Don't what about emotional harm? Were you at all concerned that your Andy, if he were subjected to the belittlement and the other things that you have seen, that it would harm him? That concern didn't bother me too much because I knew, he, he knew that I did not believe that and I did not agree with Jose's beliefs of putting the kids down. I, I, he heard me comment about that many, many times. And in your own parenting of Andy, were you supportive? Definitely. And encouraging and non-critical? Definitely. So you didn't think it would do that much harm for an No, because I made clear every time he would put down Eric, I would say how unfair his uncle had been with Eric, that uh, Eric shouldn't feel that way. Okay. I want to call your attention to uh, at least one of those times when Eric stayed over at your house. Was there something Eric did with respect to the doors in your house that drew your attention? Yes. What did he do? He locked the door in the bedroom when he was with Andy. And was that, didn't Andy lock his door? No. Irrelevant. Sustained, the answer stricken. Well, Your Honor, I'd like to be heard on this. Objection sustained, the answer stricken. During the entire time that Eric was there, uh, did he keep the door locked? Yes. Did you ask him not to? I did. Did he lock it anyway? Yes. Did you overhear Eric say anything about the fact that he could lock the door? Yes. What did you hear him say? He, I'd like to be heard on this, Ron. Who is the speaker? Eric. All right, you may. There was animal feces all over the place. There was animal food all over the place, spread out in the kitchen. There were leftovers of foods all over the place. It's, it's just... Uh, Towels were dropped on the bathroom, toothpaste without closing, everything was just a mess. What about the children's clothing? Did you observe how it was or was not maintained? The boys were always with stains and rips on their clothes and they were just very sloppy dressed. Now, you were a financial planner at this time, were you not? Yes. Did you have some notion, without revealing it, as to your brother's income level during this time? Yes, I did. Overall, 
Yes, yes I yes, did. No. Yes, I did. Was it your understanding that your brother earned sufficient money to pay for a housekeeper? Objection calls for speculation of part of the witness. Overall. Yes. Was it your understanding that your brother earned sufficient money to buy clean new clothes for his children? Yes. Did you ever observe the laundry room area in the Pennington house? Yes, I did. And w what would you see uh, on a given day if you looked inside that laundry room area? There were piles of dirty clothes and piles of clean clothes. And both in piles? Two, two opposite extremes of the laundry room, but they were all on piles, just dumped there. And would you observe your nephews ever obtaining clothes from the laundry room? Yes. And what would you see them doing? They would just go and fetch for socks or shorts or t-shirts on that pile of clean clothes. Uh, were you ever with your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, when she was preparing to send either of the boys to a sports camp for part of the summer? Yes, I was. And uh, is, was there a typical behavior, something that she would do just before the boys went off to camp? She would go to the store and buy everything new to send them to camp. All new clothes? Yes. And what would she do with all the old ones? She would give them to me for Andy. And were you able to use them for Andy? Some of them. Some of them were not in good condition. And were they stained? That yes. Sort of? Was it the kind of thing that, um, I mean, you took care of your own home, your own laundry, did you Yes, know? yes. You a housewife expert on laundry, like all other housewife <laughs> experts? Okay, so let's move on to something else. Right. Was it your experience that if you don't wash clothes, they wind up getting Let's move on to something else. All right. Uh, was, were there times when uh, Kitty Menendez would be planning an event or a family gathering when she would call upon your daughters to come help her? Yes. Irrelevant. Sustain. The answer is stricken. Was there an occasion when your daughters were over at Kitty Menendez's house um, assisting her in some cooking? Objection irrelevant. It's a sustained. foundation, Your Honor, for the next. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did you go over to Kitty Menendez's house on a day when your daughters were there cooking with her? Yes. And on that day when your daughters were there cooking with her, were your nephews there as well, Eric yes. and Lyle? Yes, they were. And did Kitty Menendez make a remark concerning your daughters and her sons in front of her sons? Yes. And what did she say to you? She said she would switch with me any time, that if I wanted to take her boys, uh, she'll keep my girls. And what did you say? I just found that outrageous. I Objection. didn't know what to say. Objection sustained. The answer is strict. <clears throat> Was it said in a joking, bantering way? Yes. Then why were you so upset? Because it wasn't joking. She meant it. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Were there other occasions when your sister-in-law said in front of one or both of her children uh, that she was sorry that she had boys or words to that effect? Yes. And moving ahead for a moment to 1986, um, when they were living in the Princeton house, the one on Mountain Avenue, mm -hmm. Did you go over there one morning and, and uh, meet with Kitty? Yes. And uh, on that particular occasion, uh, did you see Lyle and one of his girlfriends? Yes. And was there a conversation on that occasion in front of Lyle uh, when Kitty told you something about how she felt about her children? Yes. And what was it she said she felt about her children? She told me she wished they would have never been born because they had broken her marriage. And did she give you any other reasons why she wished they had never been born? In other words, we said broken their marriage. Did she say anything else about how they had broken her she marriage? She told me they had made her life miserable and, and separated her from Jose. Did she say anything to you in that conversation about Jose's obsession with or focus on the children? Did she say yes. anything about his calling, for example? Yes. What did she say in that regard in that conversation? She said, my husband only cares for the boys. And did she give an example of that? Did she say yes. anything about when he calls, for example? Yes. What did she say about she that? She said that she... Overall. She was tired of getting orders from Jose what to do here and what to do there for the boys, that he never asked her how she was or how she felt.
that his telephone calls were totally concerning For the voice, me. yes, concerning the voice. Did Lyle say anything when his mother said these words in front of him? Yes, he did. What did he say? He was very unrespectful. After he heard her say that? Yes. So it seemed to upset him? Yes. Did you observe, um, I'll strike that. I want to just move back for a moment to February 1987. You say, at your father's funeral, you observed this different behavior with Jose and Kitty, this holding hands, nice stuff. Did, you saw them again after that, did you not? Yes, I did. On the other occasions after that, after your father's funeral in 87, uh, was, did you see more of that behavior, the holding hands, the being nice? Yes. Uh, in fact, is that, did that behavior pretty much continue? That's correct. Did you have any idea what had brought about this change? Sustain. Did you inquire of your sister-in-law or your brother what had brought about this change? <coughs> Overall. No, I did not. They had never shared anything. Yeah, you have answered the question. You said no. No, I did not. Did you ever discuss this change with any other members of the family? Objection irrelevant. Sustain. During the year, I want to move on for a moment to, to Eric and some aspects of his personality, okay? Um, when you saw Eric in, in Muncie in 1972, was that the first time you had seen him or had you seen him before that? No, I had seen him before. Um, when he was a baby, even younger than that, could you describe what his personality was with respect to how did he act around people? He was a sweetheart. He just... Uh, open his uh, arms and throw himself at you, and, and uh, he was just a, a darling little boy. So he seemed to like people, he'd go yes. to people, he didn't seem afraid? Yes. Or, uh. no. Now let's talk, let's fast forward. O over the years, did you see that gradually diminish? Yes. By 1979 through, say, 1982, um, how would you describe Eric during that period of time? He was very distrustful, he would not look straight to my eyes. He would not allow me to, to have a conversation with him. He was stuttered. Don't. Stuttered? Yeah. Did he seem uh, happy, sad, what? He looked like a very sad young man. Well, he was a little uh, boy at the time yet. Yes, in 79 to, mm -hmm. to 82 he was... Mm -hmm. Council, well. ask another question, please. Did he seem outgoing or did he seem shy? No, he was very shy. Did he seem self-confident or did he seem nervous? No, he felt, he seemed very insecure and very, very un, un, distrustful was the word. I mean, he just did not. Was he, at that point, between 79 and 82, um, a talkative child? Not with me. Did you see him being talkative with anyone? Only with Andy. It's the only way, found, way that I saw him talking. Now. As the boys got older, did it appear to you that their sports activities kept increasing? Yes, definitely. Were they around the family at family gatherings less and less as they got older? Yes. Were there even occasions when one or the other wouldn't be there for Christmas or wouldn't be there for Thanksgiving? Yes. And when they would come to family gatherings, were they staying as long when they were teenagers as they had when they were children? No. Were there certain critical family occasions, in fact, in which the boys were not there at all because of sports? Yes. Was one of those, in fact, the grandfather's, your father's funeral day? That, that is correct. And was it also uh, your eldest daughter, her name is also Marta? That is correct. And did you have a, a big wedding for her? Yes. And uh, was Eric there at all? No. 
And was Lyle there for part of it? Lyle was there, left to play tennis, and came back. Now, uh, when you say he left to play tennis, was he on some kind of practice or tournament schedule at that time? No, Jose just said he needed to practice, so he was late for the wedding, late for the reception. He played tennis twice in between the wedding. And w w your brother told you that that was on his insistence? On your brother's oh, insistence? He told me he just needed to play tennis, that he was going to start the season and he needed to be playing tennis. Okay. <coughs> So would it be fair to state, say that by approximately 1984 until August of 1989, you actually saw very little of Eric? Yes. And after his parents were dead, did you see a great deal more of him? Oh, yes. And did you get very close to him during that time? Yes, I did. And do you think that was the time in his life when you best got to know him? Yes. Now let's uh, turn our attention for a moment to Lyle. Do you remember Lyle as a, as a very young child? Yes, I do. And can you uh, describe, as you did for when Eric was basically a baby and a toddler, can you describe what Lyle was like as a baby and a toddler? At age two, three, you're, you're saying? Anywhere what? from birth to two, three. Between age two and age four is the one that I recall the most. Uh, I would go to family gatherings mean very few times in the year, so I tried to get some report and I tried to grab him and hold him and he wouldn't let me, he would go running away and hide behind the sofa and just peek at me and whenever I looked at him he would run away somewhere else so I wouldn't find him. So did he seem shy? He was very shy. And did he seem um, less willing to go to people than his brother seemed at the same age? Definitely. Now, from 1979 on, um, did you see a difference in Lyle's personality? Oh, there were two times there. Lyle was one person in 79 and was another person in 1983. Let's hear about the 1979 Lyle, that model year. Uh, Lyle was very restless. He would not stay still one minute. He loved to tease. Uh, he would always look up to his father and, and look for his father's approval. He loved to play with, with um, stuffed toys and, and uh, make uh, conversations with uh, coming with his cookie monster. He would go around, you know, teasing everybody that cookie monster was going to eat them or do something to them. And, and he liked to socialize with his cousins. Okay, well now let's talk about Lyle 1983. What's the next phase? He became very reserved. He would measure his words. He would make sure he thought answers before he answered. Um, he was uh, very unrespectful to his mother. He would answer back to his mother. He would not obey her. And that was different than what you had seen before? Definitely. And that was the same thing you saw when she said right in front of him that she wished he had never been born. That's right. When, um, in the years, say, between 1982 and 1986, at these family gatherings, um, would you see Eric and Andy together? Yes. And did that become a very routine thing that Eric and Andy would go off together? Yes. Did you ever see Eric with any other friend besides Andy? No. Do you recall attending any of Eric's birthday parties? I beg your pardon? Did you ever attend any of Eric's birthday parties? I don't think he ever had any. Not any that you attended? No, other than the family gatherings, I don't recall Well, that's any, what I mean. Was his birthday celebrated at family that gatherings? That is correct. So Eric's birthday was uh, celebrated in Thanksgiving. Okay, so there was no separation between his birthday and the Thanksgiving celebration? No. But there would be, he'd have like birthday cake or... That's correct. Okay. To the best of your knowledge, did ev Eric ever have any parties to which friends were invited? Not that I can recall. Now, did you uh, give birthday parties for Andy? Yes, I did. Were those just for the family, or were they for other boys, for friends? They were irrelevant. Just 
Did you ever invite Eric to Andy's birthday parties? Yes, I did. Was Eric ever permitted to attend? No. What about your other children? Did you have birthday parties for them? At the time, they were older, so they were already on, on high school level. Post-birthday party yes, age? Yes, exactly. OK. Your Honor, this would be a good time to take a break before we go into an area that the people may want some 402 input on. All right, we'll take a recess, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll resume. Let's then proceed with this hearing um, that um, relates to some of the offer of proof here. Um, could you get back on the witness stand, please? Brother and your sister -in -law killed. I was called to my office in West Palm Beach, Florida around noon time, which was 9 o'clock in the morning, California time on the 21st. So that was Monday? That is correct. Did you then begin to make plans to leave to come to California? Immediately. And yes. when did you come to California? I arrived in California around 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the 21st. On Monday? Yes. And when you arrived on Monday, where did you go? I was, being, I was taken to the Bel Age Hotel. Bel Age, B -E Bellage, B-E-L-A-G-E. Bel Age, yes. And at the Bel Age, did you see Lyle or Eric? Not at that time. I saw them later. Okay. When did you see them first, after you came to California? I believe I saw them Tuesday morning. And where did you see them Tuesday morning? At the Bel Age Hotel. At the Bel Age? Bel Age. Okay. And were there other relatives around at that time? Yes, definitely. And did you go to the house at any time on Elm Drive? No, I did not. Now, at some point after you got to California, did you make efforts to figure out what the financial situation of the family was? Yes, I did. And did you do that based on your experience as a financial planner? That is correct. And did you at some point then have a discussion with Eric and Lyle concerning what you believe to be the status of the assets of the family. That is correct. Do you remember when that discussion was? Yes. When was it? That was either Wednesday night or Thursday night. I don't recall which of the two nights. But okay. I'm definitely sure that it was before Friday, which was the memorial. So it was before the memorial? Service. Definitely. And where did that discussion take place? It was at their hotel, at the Bel Air Hotel, in their room. And was anyone else present for this discussion besides yourself, Lyle and Eric? I don't recall anyone else. And had you, over the course of uh, Tuesday and Wednesday at least, gathered some information? That is correct. And was one of the pieces of information that you had the employment contract of Jose Menendez with Live Entertainment? Yes. Now, were you aware from the moment you heard that your brother had died that he he had uh, an insurance policy that you had obtained for him. Yes. Uh, and did you, at some point, start putting into um, effect a claim against that policy? Immediately, on Wednesday, I called Sun Life and I put a claim instantly. And did you even talk to Larry, Eric and Lyle before you did that? No, did no, they had no idea. So you were just doing that on your own to put in the claim? That's correct. I knew that that was my job anyway. I was the agent that wrote it. Ask their permission or discuss it with no. them, you just put in a claim. That's correct. And you hadn't discussed that with them uh, on Tuesday when you saw them? No. And had you discussed with them before this meeting, that was either Wednesday night or Thursday <coughs> night, anything about the financial status of no, the family? No, I was just gathering information together over at live entertainment at Jose's office. So you went to his office? That is correct. And you went through your brother's papers? Yes, all his files. And was that the basis of the information that you were gathering? That is correct. Marcy helped me put it together. Marcy Eisenberg, his secretary? Yes. Now, before you had your conversation with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday or Thursday night, had you yet seen the will that, or the wills for um, Jose and Kitty that have now been probated? Well, I remember the wills because I was one of the witnesses on that will. I didn't have to look at it. Well, you remember when the wills were written in 1981. Right. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is in 1989, since the death of your brother, before the meeting with his children, had you seen the will again? No, I had not. Did you know if the will had been located yet? 
I am not sure. I don't remember that conversation. I, I knew the information, so I didn't look for the will. You knew the information in the will because you would witness the will. Correct. But you didn't know if anyone had physically located it as of the time that you were having your conversation with Lyle and No. Him. I know that Terry and Carlos were working on that, but I don't know. Okay. It, it, you knew from having witnessed the will that Terry and Carlos were the executors under that will? Definitely, yes. And therefore they were taking on the responsibility of trying to find it? That's correct. Now, what did you bring with you, if anything, to this meeting that you had with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday night or Thursday night? I brought several things. Okay, would you just give us the list? Yes, I brought two things. I brought Jose's financial statement roughly done by me by hand. I also brought notes of things that I wanted to make them aware of because I wanted to prepare them for a meeting that we were going to have Friday morning with Peter Hoffman. And Peter Hoffman was the president of Live Entertainment? Peter Hoffman was the chairman of Carolco at the time, and he was the co-chairman of Live and became the chairman when Jose died. All right, let me show you some documents and ask you if either or all were prepared for this meeting or taken to this meeting or referred to in this meeting. Let's start with... Uh, the paper, this package that has um, a list of things and numbers in mainly in blue ink. Do you recognize this piece of notebook paper with the mainly blue ink on it and the black ink on the back? Yes, that was taken out of Jose's notebook paper, as a matter of fact, that Life Entertainment Inc., and I wrote Let me that slow information. You down. Slow you down. Whose handwriting? Mine. Was this... Hey, hey fellow, wait, wait, stop for a sec. Get back. Get back to uh, where you're supposed to be. All right, let's go. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'll do that. One eighty-one. Thank you. Um, was this paper the paper that you prepared roughly from the documents in your brother's office? Yes. To give you some rough idea of what the assets and liabilities might be? That's correct. Now, connected to that paper when you gave these documents to me was this thing called personal financial statement as of 831 AE 8 Jose E. Menendez. Yes. Did you, look, did you find this amidst your brother's papers in his office? That's correct. Did you use this in any way to compile any of the data that appears on 181? Yes, I did. Let me mark this 182, Your Honor. Yes. And did you take this personal financial statement with you along with 181 to show it to uh, Lyle and Eric for the meeting? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, the third piece of paper in the package is a piece of gray lined notebook paper with black ink writing on it. Whose handwriting? That's my handwriting. When did you prepare this? At the same time at Live Entertainment Inc., the same time that I was doing the other one. And was this, did this paper purport to show some very rough ballpark figure of <coughs> potential tax liability against the potential assets of your brother's estate. That is correct. I prepared that paper to, for my conversation with Peter Hoffman in reference to the... The upcoming conversation. Correct. Was this document uh, taken to the meeting with Eric and Lyle? Yes. Was it shown to them? Yes. So may I mark this one, Your Honor, 183? Yes. Thank you. As a matter of fact, if I recall, I gave them a copy. Okay. If you recall. Why don't you wait for a question? So okay. It's too late in the day. Now, let me show you this other package, and perhaps you can tell me what this is all about. Here is another uh, white line paper. This one does not have red margins on it to distinguish it from 181, and it also is black uh, handwriting. Uh, do you re did you discuss, did you strike that? Sorry, Your Honor. Did you prepare this paper? Yes, I did. And what was the purpose in preparing this? Uh, this document's entitled, Issues to Discuss. That document was prepared to discuss with Eric and Lyle. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything important that I thought they should know about. This was to make them aware of some of the potential financial and life issues they might be facing? That is correct. And was this taken to that same meeting that you had with them at the Bel Air Hotel? Yes. 
And if I might, Your Honor, I'd like to mark this document 184. Yes. Now, there is another staple uh, set of typewritten documents on IVE letterhead, uh, beginning with a letter dated October 3, 1986, and then followed with a personal financial statement of Jose E. Menendez, and this one does not appear to have a date on it. It's attached to this one, so I think it's the same time. Well, we don't know. The, this financial statement itself has no date on it. Is that that was as is. It was on his file. If I understand you, you're saying that you found the financial statement already stapled to the IBE letter of October 3rd, 1986. That is correct. Did you take this package of documents to the meeting uh, with Lyle and Eric? Yes, I did. Do you know if you ever showed it to them? Yes, I did. It is now 185, yes. All right, it'll be marked 185. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, I also have in my hand now what appears to be uh, five pages of uh, fax paper with printing on it. That is correct. And uh, this was a fax uh, apparently from attorney Stephen Goldberg to yourself on February 27th, 1990. That is correct. I take it this, you did not have this in hand in 1989? No, that's the, okay. Okay, so that has, this was definitely not taken to the meeting? No. So let me just segregate it out. Okay, um, just in, in looking over the asset list so we understand it, um, the first item is a deferred, is deferred compensation. Yes. Where did the 500... Which exhibit are you referring to? I'm sorry, you're on 181. Um, and that's the amount of $500,000? Uh, the deferred compensation was $2.5 Mm-hmm. But there was a million in tax that you anticipated? That is correct. So the figures down the right-hand column are net figures? That was my guest my guest guesstimate at the time, yes. Okay. You have not stayed on top of the actual estate or what these items all ultimately valued out at? No, I have not. In fact, have you ever even seen the original estimate of value that was um, compiled at the time the estates, the wills were first submitted for probate? No, I have not. Let me ask you, how did this meeting take place? What, what caused you to meet with uh, the two defendants? Uh, I wanted them to be knowledgeable for the meeting that I was going to have with Peter Hoffman. I mentioned to them that I wanted to them present at that meeting, that I was going to invite as well Carlos, which I, know, I knew he was the executive. And I wanted them to have some idea so it wouldn't go up over their head of what I was going to be discussing and why and what were my findings. And when did, uh, when did you tell the defendants that you wanted to meet with them? I told them during the, the day sometime that we were, we were all gathering together, I told them I would really like you to give me some of your time tonight, I need to talk to you. And Did you say why you wanted to talk to them? I told them that it was in reference to a meeting that I was going to have, yes I did. Did you tell them what the meeting was? I told them that what the meeting was, no, I told them I needed to talk to them about that. I did not give any information of what I was talking. There were too many people around. Did you say what you were going to talk to them about? Not at that time. I just told them it was important for me to talk to them. And did you talk to them any other time before the meeting occurred? No. And um, so it's your testimony that you did not tell them in advance of the meeting why you were going to meet with them? The that is correct. what you were going to talk about? That is correct. All right. Was Go ahead. the reason for that um, based on the fact that when you were able to approach Let's not leave the witness. Let's not leave the witness. Well, I, I think you, you said something to the judge in response to this question that you didn't mention the reason for the meeting because there were other people around. That is correct. Um, and, and before you actually had this meeting with them Wednesday or Thursday, were you, did you have any private time with them? No, I did not. Were there always a lot of other people around? Yes. Uh, 
were those other people all family, or were there some non-family people? There were some non-family. Mark, for example, Mark tennis Heffernan. coach. Yes. How about Ozil, for example? Just I did not see Ozil. Okay. Um, so you waited until you were in private with them to discuss what the purpose of the meeting was? Right. Um, does the court want me to go through the items on that asset list? Does, does the court think that? That's up to you. You're the one who's offering the evidence. Okay. I'm not. Now you, you have down on this list, for example, that the uh, um, you have down something called Life Insurance Group at Live. Yes, I what, did. What was that? That's a group insurance that Life Entertainment had. I was meant. I was informed about that from the yeah, on Live that they had a fifty thousand dollar group insurance Whatever to all the employees, and I wasn't sure if Jose had it or not, but I wrote it down. Okay, do you know to this day if Jose had it or not? I haven't heard anything, so I really don't know if that was substituted by the five million or supposed to be or whatever. I don't know. But you have no information that any such insurance policy ever paid out. No, this this information was gathered between Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday of that week. Do you have any confidence whatsoever in the reliability of any of these numbers? No, I do not. Okay, I think that probably is. All right, so you don't know if the numbers on that list were correct or incorrect? No, the numbers were gathered from Jose's files and information that Live gave me at the time of benefits that Jose had. All right, but but your que the question is, you don't know, as a matter of fact, whether uh, the information on that list was correct on the date that you had the meeting with the two defendants? That is correct. That is correct. Okay. All right, anything else? Um, well, I did want to get into the meeting itself. Do you recall about approximately what time of day the meeting was? Yes, the meeting was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon while the reception was going on. Um, what, I thought you said the meeting was Wednesday night or Thursday night. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were talking Peter, Peter Hoffman. I'm no. sorry. I mean the meeting with Lyle and Eric. Yes, it was before dinner, and I'm pretty sure it was Thursday night, but I'm not sure if it was Wednesday or Thursday, but I think that I tried Which Wednesday. I look, just... Thursday night, I think it was. All right, so your, your best guess is Thursday rather than Wednesday. Right. Fine. Now, what was the first topic that you brought up with uh, Lyle and Eric at the meeting? I told them that uh, I wanted to tell them what his father's assets were. Okay, now well, let me take you through a few of these because there's no reason for us to go through all those numbers mm -hmm. that didn't turn out to be anything. Did you mentioned to them the life insurance policy that you had purchased, I mean, that you had obtained for your brother in 1987. Yes, but that was later. I, that was not the first thing I mentioned to them. Okay. What was, if you can remember, the first thing you mentioned to them? That I wanted to talk to them about all the assets that okay. their father had. Well, wasn't that life insurance policy, isn't that on that asset list? Yes, uh, but I gave them a bulk figure at that time. The reason why I, I'm stopping you there is because they reacted to tell me that none of this was theirs. Okay, well, but let's start with what you, you said. You gave them a bulk figure. Right. All right, tell us what you I said. I told them that I thought that their, fa their, their father net worth was around $14 million. Excuse 14. Me. 14, yes. Okay. Net worth. Yes. According to that list you've got in front of you. you Eight million know. after, exactly. I'm sorry. Eight what million. Is, what did you tell them? Did you tell them eight million? Or did you tell well, them? Well, the, the gross was million? around fourteen, fifteen, and the net was eight million. Okay, so you told them both figures. Yes. And what was the reaction of either or both? Lyle at the time said to me and Marta, "We're not the beneficiaries of that money," and he didn't seem to be interested in what I was had to say. Did either of them say to you, "We had no idea our father was worth"? Excuse that me, money? Um, that's leading. Sustain. Well. What else was said besides we are not the beneficiaries of the estate? Right. Then what Eric Eric went about to add, and Marta, we are not the beneficiaries. No, no, I'm, I'm confused now. You had testified that Lyle said none of that is ours. We're not the beneficiaries. Right. Okay. And what, if anything else, was said? Right. I, I said something to the effect, I don't remember, like confirming that they were, and then Eric responded shutting me down that Anne Marta we were not the beneficiaries. Our father disinherited us over a year ago. Okay. 
Did either of them at that time make any remarks concerning their knowledge or lack of knowledge that their parents were worth or not worth that much? That is correct. And who made a statement in that regard? I think it was Eric. Okay. And what do you think Eric said? I can't believe my father had so much money. Okay. And was that said at the same time as the statement about they were not the beneficiaries, they had been disinherited? That was right afterwards when I was confirming them that I was sure that they were the beneficiaries. Okay, now, there are two other topics I want to question you about. I'll tell you what they are and then you can tell us which came up next in the conversation so we don't have to go through all those assets. One is the Sun Life Insurance Policy. The other is the contractual provision for a $5 million policy. Which of those two, assuming they came up, came up next? I told them about the life insurance policy. Which one? The Sun Life Insurance Policy that I had written for their father. Okay. And um, did you tell them that after you had assured them that they were the benefit? Counsel, let's not lead to uh, Did you tell them that after this discussion that you've already told us Or about? before it. Or before it, exactly. Right. I told them right after. I told them that that one, at least, I was sure that they were the beneficiaries. Okay. And what was their reaction, either or both, when you told them that? They couldn't believe it. They, they asked me, are you sure that my father didn't change it? And I said, no, he wouldn't. He, I would have known if he had changed it. Did they, did they evidence any other kind of surprise with respect to that information? Well, they were totally shocked. They had no idea what I was talking about. Right. Mrs. And Tano, this is the five million dollar policy. No, this is the. Summer. No, we are in the four hundred thousand. Okay. And the two fifty. Mrs. Cano, it's it's helpful to us if you tell us what was said rather than tell us what you think they were thinking. Okay. okay. Yeah. What was there about what either of them said or how either of them looked that lead led you to say you thought they were shocked? What did you see? What did you hear? Well, they started looking at each other and I said, I can't believe this. Can you believe this? And the other one said, no, I mean, uh, are you, it can't be. I mean, there's some mistake here. You're missing something on Marta because we're not the beneficiaries. They were totally convinced that we're not the beneficiaries. They were carrying on with one another in that sense. And I kept on arguing with them that I was sure they were. Well, let me ask you something. Did either of them say anything during the course of that conversation that conveyed to you that they even knew the existence of that Sun Life policy? No, they had no idea. They even asked me who, what insurance was I talking about. Okay. They, as a matter of fact, now that you say it, Eric said to me, oh no, my father never took the, the physical. And I explained to him, I'm not talking about the $5 million policy, I'm talking about a private policy that I wrote for him years ago. And what, if anything, was his or Lyle's response to your saying it was a private policy that you wrote years ago. They seemed to question that. They had no idea that this well, the, existed. You're, you're giving us a conclusion now. Did either of them say anything that led you to believe that they had no idea this existed? Well, I believe it was Lyle that asked me, are you sure that that policy is not canceled? So one of them, Eric, mentioned a change in beneficiary, and the other mentioned the policy canceled? Yes. Now, was there also a discussion then about the contractual provision for a $5 million policy? Yes. And would you tell us what that discussion was like? Eric said that his father had not taken the physical, that uh, he was not feeling good and he was waiting for him to feel better, and that he was sure they didn't have that policy. Well, you've already testified that when you were talking about the Sun Life policy, Eric said something about his father not taking a physical. Right. Okay. How did it go from the Sun Life policy to the $5 million policy? Within the conversation, I separated both. I told him that uh, uh, that this insurance had nothing to do with the, the insurance in his benefits that he had not done. 
that the five million dollar policy I was aware that was never done and I was told that life that Jose never, never took the physical but that I questioned that issue and I started telling them why. So you started telling them that you questioned whether or not the five million policy did or did not exist? No, I was sure it did not exist. I questioned if uh, we could negotiate with the company due to the fact that they did do a $50 million policy within the same time frame that Jose should have had his $5 million from his benefits. Okay, and was it then that Eric said something about that they knew he hadn't taken the physical for that policy? Yes, he had already said that before when I was talking about the Sun Life, he was confused and he said he didn't take the physical on Marta. Okay, but after you're saying this about how you want to try to negotiate with the company about it, did, did either of the Yes. The boys say anything about that? Yes, Eric, Eric repeated again that he knew his father had not taken the physical. Then I went about and tell him that he did take a physical for the 15 million. I'm confused now, you're confusing me. Okay. You said that you told them that even though you knew there was no five million policy, that since your brother had taken the physical for the 15 million policy, you wanted to see if something could be negotiated. Correct? That is correct. Yes. Now, what was the boy's reaction to that? They didn't respond to anything. They just looked at me like, you know, questioning what I was saying. They didn't think that there was any way of, of connecting one thing with the other. Did they say that to you? We don't think that makes any sense. We knew we didn't take the, you know, we knew we took one physical and not the other physical or anything. Well, they had no idea of the first physical that I was talking about. I don't know. They, for some reason, they had no idea of that $15 million policy that I was talking about. Okay, so they, they didn't, didn't know it existed, no. So they didn't know that existed, but they did no. know that there was no physical for the $5 million. Policy. Right. They knew that his father had that pending. So they knew he didn't have a $5 million. Policy. That is correct. Can you remember now, going back, apart from Eric's remark, when you were talking about the Sun Life policy, where Eric volunteered something about a physical, can you remember now what the first thing was that you said in reference to the $5 million policy? In other words, in straightening it out, is, is, ask you this, did it come up? Did you first start talking about the contractual policy because Eric said something about no physical? That is correct. Okay. Can you remember, in, in other words, you're trying to straighten Eric out? Would you tell us what it was you said to Eric to clar straighten him out? I told Eric <coughs> that the policy that I was talking about was a policy that I had done for his father w before in 1981, and then I had converted it to a larger policy in 1986, and it had nothing to do with the company policy that he was talking about. Well, how did you know Eric was talking about the company policy? Because that's the only thing he seemed to know. What did he say? He said, my father never took the physical on Marta. He, he didn't have that policy. Well, how did you know he meant the company policy? Because he said it. He said that his father never had the $5 million policy because he didn't take the physical. Okay, so he mentioned the $5 million policy. Right. But hadn't you already told him about another number? No, I just told them that uh, there was a life insurance. I have not given them any account amount of, of dollars. I just told them that I had gone ahead and, and claimed that insurance for them. Okay, and that's when Eric responded, no, he never took the physical for that $5 million. That's right. Had you handed them the asset sheet before you started the discussion? I don't recall. I don't think so. I think I had them in my hand. I wanted to keep their attention. I didn't want them to start nosing around what I had written. You want them distracted. Right. right. Cross-examination. How long do you think it'd be? that you were um, a witness to the wills from 1981 of Jose and Kitty Menendez, correct? That's correct. And I think you indicated that um, you came to Los Angeles on Monday the 21st 
was it on the 21st that you went to um, your brother's business to start going through his files? No, it was not. It was next day, Tuesday morning. And how long did you spend? Was it the entire day or did you also do it on Wednesday? The entire day of Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Okay. Um, was it at the conclusion of those three days that you made your presentation to the defendants? That that's what I don't remember. It was the conclusion of my numbers. I believe that I went back after that, or that's what I don't remember, if it was Wednesday night or Thursday night. I recall going back and fighting for the $5 million and asking for the $15 million policy papers, which they did give me. I wanted to see the application of the $15 million that had been done for the key benefit of the company. When did you leave California? I'm sorry. When did you leave California? Friday night. Okay. With uh, everybody else. All right. And on Friday, did you go back to uh, live? Friday at 11 o'clock in the morning was the memorial. And right after that, there was a reception at live. And during the reception at 1 o'clock, I met with Peter Hoffman. Okay. And prior, did you do any searching on Friday in your brother's files? No, I did not. Okay. So your memory is, is that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday you spent at your brother's office trying to straighten out his financial affairs? That is correct. Okay. And your best recollection of when you had the meetings with the defendants was on Thursday night, is that I correct? I believe so. And that was at the um, Hotel Bel Air? That's correct. And did you eat while you were there? We ate, but later. This was around 6 o'clock when they were, we were all getting ready to go down to eat or to eat. I don't know where we ate, but we ate all together. I know that. Did you eat at the hotel or did you eat somewhere else, if you recall? We either ate at the Bel Air or the Village. I don't recall which of the two it was. Now, why was it that you were involved in this? In other words, did someone ask you to do this with the estate or did you do it voluntarily? How did that come about? Well, it's interesting. Tuesday morning, around 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, there was this call. We, Carlos had left uh, with Brian at the time, which is Kitty's brother. Okay, now, is this Carlos Baralt? Carlos Baralt and Brian Anderson had left, and uh, my mother, my sister, and I were left in the room, and the phone rang, and Terry answered, and it was about a Fed call, and Terry had no idea what they were talking about. They were a federal call, yes, a Fed call. And she said, Marta, they're calling from, um, I think it was Payne Weber, and there is a Fed call. Would you take this call? And I knew exactly what they were talking about. So okay. I. What is a Fed call? A Fed call is a call when your, your stocks go down in value and you have a line of credit, a margin taken against that, though that value of the stocks, the stocks go down in value. You have to replace whatever it's over the amount that you're allowed to have at margin. Okay, and so there was a call from Payne Weber to this hotel where you were regarding the Jose Menendez's margin account? That is correct. Okay, then what happened? That's when I realized that uh, we were there gathering, doing nothing, at least I was, and that I should start doing something because maybe there were important issues of my brother that I should be attending. All right, so you decided on your own to do this? That is correct. Okay. I uh, called Marcy and asked her to pick me up, and okay. she did. She sent me a limo, and she came in the limo to pick me up. And that was on Tuesday, correct? That is correct, Tuesday morning. All right. Now, during the meeting that you had with the defendants at the, Bel the Hotel Bel Air, um, I believe it was your testimony that prior to the meeting, you had not informed them of the nature of the meeting. Is that correct? No. All I said to them is that it was important that I talk to them because I was having a meeting with Peter Hoffman the next Friday, and I needed them to go with me, and I wanted to inform them what I was going to bring about in that meeting. Okay. And did it appear to you that they understood who Peter Hoffman was? They were very confused at that time. They didn't understand anything. Well, did they ask you who's Peter Hoffman? No, they didn't. All they right. say, okay. That's all they did. By the way, did they, in fact, attend the meeting that you had with Mr. Hoffman at 1 o'clock on the 25th? Yes, they did. Now, um, so then you, you went to the hotel for the purpose of discussing your brother's assets. Is that That's correct? That's correct. And, um, who was the first one to talk about the assets? In other words, did you just sit down and start speaking at them? That's correct. Did they ask you any questions? No, they didn't at the time. I started talking, and by now you know that I talk, so. Okay, well, did you, well, how did you start off the meeting? I don't recall exactly my words, but I told them that uh, I had been at their father's office for three days gathering information, and that uh, it was important for them to know that they're now responsible and beneficiaries of this, and it was important for them to know what they had, and that's when they jumped at me and said, Anmarda, we're not the beneficiaries. 
All right, and I believe it's your testimony that they both indicated to you that it was their belief that they were not beneficiaries. They both tried to convince me that they were not the beneficiaries. And did you, you had personal knowledge as to the wills that you had witnessed in 1981, correct? That is correct. I also had personal knowledge that there was no new will because I had discussed that with my brother in April in Florida. Okay, now when you discussed it with your brother, Your Honor, I'm going to object to this. I think we're getting too far afield from the purpose of this. Meeting. I haven't heard a question yet. Okay. What did your brother tell you about there being no new wills in April? I'm going to object to that. It's being too far afield and hearsay at this point. Overall. Okay. I, I, exp I told my brother I had just finished doing an estate planning for a $50 million uh, client and that his, his, he had come up to my mind and I had decided to prepare some kind of document for him to consider as far as doing trusts and wills, new wills and new trusts for the boys. And at that time, did Mr. Menendez indicate to you that there had been no superseding will since the 1981? That is correct. Did you, in fact, convey this information to the defendants during your meeting with them on Thursday night? Yes, I did. And did you tell them what your brother had told you in April? Yes, I did. And um, I believe you indicated that when you got down to a figure that you told the defendants that the father's estate was worth a net of about $8 million? I believe I told them that, yes. Okay, well, you said you believed. Did you tell them that? I think I did. I'm not sure if we got to the numbers because they were so honestly convinced that they had nothing, that uh, they were not interested in the numbers, but I'm pretty sure I told them. Okay. Well, I believe that one or both of the defendants indicated I had no idea my father's estate was worth that much. That is correct. It does was that, Eric. Yes, you're that, right. So I did tell them the figure. <laughs> yes. And I believe you also indicated that the gross amount was $14 million. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Now, I think you indicated that there was some discussion between the two of uh, the two defendants where they spoke back and forth with each other um, after you conveyed some sort of information to them. That is correct. Okay, now what was the information you conveyed to them that preceded this discussion back and forth? Mm. I don't recall right now, but it's the same one I said before. There were, uh, it was either about the beneficiaries or or the insurance? No, it wasn't the insurance because Lyle didn't, didn't respond anything on the insurance. It was Eric, the one that said, I know my dad didn't take the physical for that insurance. All right, so what was it that prompted the discussion back and forth between them? Um, I think it was when they were talking about the beneficiaries, that they were sure that there was no beneficiary or, you know, that. Uh, now, is that a beneficiary on a policy or a beneficiary to the will? At all, to the will. They were totally convinced that they had been disinherited. All right. Now, they conveyed to you that they were convinced that they had been disinherited. Is That's that correct? correct. And then they proceeded to have a discussion between them that lasted for some period of time. Because no, it was just instant. I mean, they, they were asking me, I think that uh, Leslie was asking me, how did I know that they didn't believe this? And I was telling her because they were going back and forth saying, I mean, uh, with each other. Right, but not about doubting that they were beneficiaries. They were totally sure they were not beneficiaries. All right, and they were discussing this in your presence, correct? Yes, just for two seconds, but yes, it was not a long conversation. Now, you indicated to them that you wanted to try to pursue the $5 million policy, is that correct? Not exactly pursue the $5 million policy because it didn't exist. It. I wanted to pursue the $5 million uh, from some way from the company. Okay, now, how much money did you tell them was contained in the Sun Life policy? I believe I told them by this here, because I was talking memory, 750, but it was really ended up being 650. Did you indicate to them that they would be dividing that money equally? Oh, I told them that they were both equal beneficiaries on their policy. How did they act when you told them that? Very surprised. Did they look? happy or sad or how did they look aside from they they kept on not believing me they they really felt that uh, that I was talking something that I wasn't really knowing what I was talking about they they looked very distrustful for what I was saying to them hey, did you have any discussion with them during this this Thursday night about how they were going to support themselves now that their parents were no longer around no I that didn't come about at all do you have any discussion with them about any spending they had done prior to your dinner that night? No, no, we were just uh, 
these kids were very upset at that time. I mean, Eric wouldn't stop crying. Uh, he was crying, and I would, and Lyle would say, Eric, stop it, and Marta's trying to talk to us, and he would keep on crying. And there was no such conversation. I mean, that's the least worried in my mind is how much they were going to spend or how was it going to be. I mean, we knew that things were going to be resolved one way or another, so that was not an issue. You have a moment, please. In terms of how long did the conversation last regarding the assets? Well, we were together for about half an hour to 45 minutes. I don't know the assets itself, how long it would take. I, I would honestly tell you the one I think was the least long. Um, I believe you indicated you went to dinner with them that night? We all did, as a family. And that was you and who else? All the Andersons, <coughs> all the Barauds. Uh, not all the broads, I'm sorry, my sister Terry and Carlos and Carlos Menendez and my mother and uh, all the Andersons that were present, which were about seven of them. Did you have any further discussions at dinner about the subject matter you discussed with them at the hotel? Not at all. As a matter of fact, they were not sitting beside me. All right. I have nothing further of this witness at this time. I have one question. All right. Um, you said you told them, when they told you they were not the beneficiaries, they were disinherited. You told them that you didn't believe there was a new will because of this discussion you had, had with Jose in April. That is correct. Did they tell you why they thought they were disinherited, that there was a new will? They didn't tell me why. They just were very convinced that they had been disinherited over a year ago. Did they tell you that their father had told them that? Yes. Dad already told us he disinherited. Yes. You didn't know about the burglaries at that time, did you? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I'm done. I'm sorry. Was it April of 1989 that Jose Menendez told you he had not changed his will? That is correct. Okay, thank you. The information that uh, you used to prepare your lists of assets, um, where did you get that? From Jose's private files in his, in his office. Where in his office? Uh, they were right behind his desk. He had file cabinets on the back, uh, not a cabinet, he had like a credenza which had files and he also had files on the right side of his desk at his office. How did you get into the files? Marcy, they were open. Marcy is the one who told me where, the, where Jose kept all his private information. Did you have any information as to whether or not the, either of the defendants had access to uh, that office at any time prior to Mr. Menendez's death? I don't know about it at all. I mean, Marcy, that, that Jose's office was pretty secluded. It was also a new office. They had just moved in, and half of the things were in boxes. Okay. Anything else? I have a question. Did you know Lyle Menendez worked at uh, Live Entertainment? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right, what, anything else? Yeah, where, where was the Sun Life Insurance policy? The Sun Life Insurance policy, I don't, as far as I know, they, I don't know if they found it. Did you it. see it? No, of course not. So that was not part of his paper. Oh, no, no, I had that at my office. All right. My question was, oh, there's no, no reference even to the Sun Life Insurance policy. No, not Jose's at all. Papers. Not reference to any insurance policy. As a matter of fact, not even the benefit package of Jose was in his files. I had to request that. So what was it that you found in the files? Did you find Just that this that you saw here, that yeah, the that financial statements that were old and... Okay, so just that fi those financial statements. That's correct. So the numbers that appear on your sheet don't come from the information that you found in Jose's files? Not at all. Did those come from talking to people at live? They also came from phone calls that I did to the banks and to find out loans and that type of thing. So just to make sure I understand, the only financial information that you did find that helped you understand assets was this 1986 financial <coughs> statement package, which is 185, correct? That's correct. And the 1988 financial statement, uh, which is 182. That is correct. From that, I gathered the names of the banks, and I called personally and found out, I explained and found out more information about it, plus Marcy also helped me. Do you know what the purpose was for this financial statement of your brother's of August 31st, 88? Yes, I do. And what was it for? Marcy told me that he had that done to buy the Beverly Hills house. Yes, and uh, was it your understanding that the numbers on this were highly inflated to make them look good for the bank? She told me. She told you that as well? Yes. And in fact, when you started checking to find out if any of these numbers were right, you found out they were all highly inflated. That is correct. <laughs> All right, anything else? Okay, thanks, you may step down.
All right. Uh, in the trial, we have uh, both juries back in court. Uh, good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. And unfortunately, we had a delay in uh, the sheriff's transportation this morning, which uh, got us a little bit late in getting started, but we're now ready to proceed. Occasionally, those things happen. It's not the fault of uh, anybody here. It's just occasionally that uh, things like that do happen. But we're now ready to proceed, and um, we had a witness on the witness stand. Uh, where is she? She's in the hall when you're on. All right, if you would get her, please. Would you state your name again for the record? Sure. Marta, M-A-R-T-A, Menendez Cano, C-A-N-O. All right. Further direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to go back with you for a moment to uh, 1972 when you stayed in Muncie. Okay. Yes. Uh, during your visit there, did you and uh, your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, uh, take some children to a shopping mall? Yes, we did. And uh, who were the children that were on that trip? I believe I had Marta and Eileen with me and Eric and Lyle. Marta and Eileen are your two oldest daughters? That is correct. And did something unusual occur during the course of that shopping trip at the mall? Yes, it did. And would you tell us what happened? The boys were not holding hands with us like I had my two girls at the time. And I mentioned to Kitty, you know, why don't you hold us? Oh, no, they would be fine. And they were running all over the, the store, destroying all the dresses. And then all of a sudden, I didn't see Eric and Lyle anymore. And I said, Kitty, where's Eric? Where's Lyle? And she said, oh, don't worry about it. It will be fine. Let me stop you for a moment. At this time in 1972, Eric was two and Lyle was going on That's five? That's right. OK, go on. Marta tried, as a matter of fact, to hold him, but there was no way. I mean, he was used to being wild on the, st on the store, so she couldn't hold him. Marta, you, by that you mean your I'm oldest sorry, daughter? I'm sorry, Marta, my eldest daughter. And at that time, she was known by her nickname, Martika? That's correct. OK. Would you uh, tell us now, now you don't see the ch uh, Eric or Lyle, is that correct? That's correct. And okay. I... Just let me ask a question. Uh, do you go looking for them? I wanted to, but Kitty told me not to worry about it, that they were fine, that they knew what to do if they got lost. And subsequently to that, did you hear anything over the public address system? Yes. Five... Just answer one question at a time. I'm sorry. Okay. And what did you hear over the public address system? I heard Kitty being called Mrs. Menendez to go to the information booth to pick up her children. And that's what the message was on the... And so did she then go and pick up the children? No, she did not. Uh, did she say anything? Yes. I said first... Did you say something to her first? Yes. I said, oh, Kitty, they found the boys. And then she went ahead and said to me, oh, great, we know where they are so we can keep on shopping. And did she keep on shopping? Yes, she did. And how long um, after the announcement that the children were at the information booth was it before she went and got them? About 45 minutes to an hour. Now, was this the only time that something like this occurred where the children got lost while shopping? No, it wasn't. And was there another occasion about three years later? Yes. And do you recall where uh, this took place? Was oh. it the same mall in Muncie or another mall? No, it was a very large mall that she took me that had escalators and all kinds of, I don't know where it was, but it was somewhere upstate New York. OK, because they were still living in Muncie at that time? That's right. And uh, on this occasion, Eric was five and Lyle was about eight? That's right. And uh, what happened on this occasion? Same thing. I was alone with Kitty and the two boys. And uh, Did you they, have any of your girls with you? Or was it no, just... I did not at the time. I don't think so. And at some point while you were shopping, the boys disappeared? They were always running around loose. I mean, that was part of, of the behavior, normal behavior. And all of a sudden, again, I, I couldn't rest not seeing the boys. And all of a sudden, I didn't see them. And I said, Kitty, where are the boys? And again, she's just said to me, don't worry, Marta, they'll be fine. They're big guys. They know what they're doing. OK. And was there some period of time later when there was, again, uh, some indication that the boys had been located or someone had yes. them? Yes. And on this occasion, did she go and get them right away? No, she did not. But I, I had it, and I went to meet the boys. I told her I would wait for her in the information booth. So she had indicated that she wanted to continue to shop again? She continued. She was about two hours that time because I went myself, so she was not worried. 
Now, I want to talk to you. You said that went out and about with the boys. They were running around. When they were in their own home, were they running around wild the way they would when they were out shopping? No, they were not. Also, uh, staying with 1972 for a moment, during that entire week that you stayed at the Menendez home, I believe I showed you a photograph, a family photograph, and in that photograph, uh, Eric is sitting on his mother's lap. Correct? That's correct. Apart from when that photograph was taken, did you at any time during that week see Kitty holding Eric? No. Or picking him up? No. No. Neither Lyle. Did she have either of the children ever near her when she was sitting and talking to adults? Did she ever have the, the children sitting next to her? No. Now, you have described some incidents in which you saw your brother um, being critical or being hostile towards the children. Did you ever see any incidents where uh, Kitty uh, was angry or hostile towards the children? Yes, many of them. And what was the typical way, based on your experience over the years, of her demonstrating her anger or hostility towards the boys? Oh, well, she will go. Sustain. Was it always? Did she always have the same way of demonstrating anger? Yes. And what was that method? Uh, she would all of a sudden get very violent and throw things and bang things and scream at the kids and pick them up by an arm just like Jose used to do and and shake them and throw them and send them to their room. Did you ever hear her calling uh, either Lyle or Eric uh, names? Yes. And uh, what names do you recall her most frequently using? Idiot, stupid, uh, clumsy. And with these outbursts of hers um, come on gradually? I mean, could you see the steam building or would she just blow? No, that's the difference with Jose. She just, all of a sudden, she was talking to me and all of a sudden she would just raged out of nowhere. So with your brother, was it more predictable? Could you see it coming? Yes. Did you uh, drive uh, in a car with uh, Kitty Menendez uh, as the driver? Yes. Okay, strike that, that wasn't English. Did you ride in a car as a passenger when, when Kitty Menendez was the driver? Yes. And did she have a particular style or method of driving? I don't know if I would call her a style or a method. She was a reckless driver. Was that occasionally or more no, often than occasionally? That was all the time. And what do you mean by reckless? She would accelerate to the end, even if we're going to stop in the corner, she would turn 90 degree angles. Uh, she wouldn't look before she turned. She would accelerate, and if she could, we would be 90 miles an hour instantly. It was very uncomfortable. Do you ever remember seeing any car seats in her car, ch children's car seats? No. Do you remember riding in the car with her in 1972 when Eric was two and his being unsecured in the car. Definitely, the boys were out of the window. They drove with their hands out of the window, pulling them out to get some fresh air, which scared me to death. Did you ever see the, the boys, um, or either of them, hanging on to a strap uh, to keep from sliding no. off the seat? No, they were standing. They did not, were not even sitting. And was this in 72? Yes. And later on, did she obtain a car that had a sunroof? Yes. And was there a typical way in which she allowed the children to ride in that car? Yes. And would you describe that for the jury? They would go standing with their whole uh, body, half of their body, out the window and on the sunroof, <laughs> with their hands up like the kids do in the roller coasters. Mm -hmm. And would she ever tell them to sit down or to sit No, still? she thought it was silly that I didn't like it, that the kids had a lot of fun doing that. Now, after Eric was about uh, 13, uh, did you see less of him at his sports function, say? Yes, I did. And why was that, that you saw less of him? I was asked not to go. Asked by whom? By Kitty. 
And would you have, in the past, before that, routinely taken Andy along? Yes. And by being asked not to go, did that mean Andy didn't go either? That's correct. And at about the same time, was there also a difference in the frequency with which Andy was allowed to stay over at Eric's house? Yes. And what happened there? Was it less frequent, more frequent? Well, Andy would call constantly to go and spend weekends or go and play for an afternoon with Eric, and uh, Kitty will always answer the phone and say that, uh, sorry, Andy, but... Eric's very busy. Maybe when his father is out of town, you can come try next weekend. But the bottom line was that Andy didn't get to go very often. Did no. He? Did you ever hear um, Kitty in, in, when she was talking to you about her unhappiness uh, with her marriage, the, the fact that she didn't feel she came first. Yes, that was a constant talk. Did she ever use the phrase, I'm garbage? Yes. Would you tell us how that fit into that conversation? Well, I used to minimize it. I used to say, oh, Kitty, don't feel bad. I mean, it's just that Jose is so obsessed with the boys that, oh, he thinks of that, but he loves you and he cares for you. And she says, I don't think so, Marta. Sometimes I feel like garbage. And did she say that on more than one occasion? Yes. Now, way back when you first started testifying, uh, you had made mention of a discussion that you had with your brother in about 1987, where he was describing how he perceived Eric. That's correct. Now, was this a discussion in person or over the telephone? No, it was over the telephone. And was the basic topic of this discussion your son? That's correct. You were talking about Andy and schools for Andy? That's correct. All right. But somehow in that discussion, your brother started talking about Eric. He felt that maybe I should not put Andy in a, pub in a private school, that, for example, with him, with Eric, when he took him out of PDS, uh, would have been uh, sort of better because Eric wasn't as strong and, and as powerful. He was uh, too soft and too tender and too mediocre to go, and he felt better in the public school than in the private school, that maybe I should do the same with Andy. So he started talking about uh, matching children to schools and, and then gave you this description of Eric as soft and weak and tender? Right. He, well, you also misstated it, so objection sustained. Was softness and tenderness, uh, and in the way your brother was describing Eric, did that sound like those were compliments or no. were those criticisms? No, that was. Sustain. Well, what was, uh, what, what was his tone of voice when he was saying this? Jose, for years, had been very aggravated with Eric's softness and tenderness and, and ridiculous crying and, and sensitivity, and was he had. The answer is true. Were there other occasions upon which your brother complained to you about Eric's weak personality? Many times. And had he referred to him in the past as too tender, too soft? Definitely. And did those descriptions of Eric as uh, sensitive, tender, soft, did that comport with what you saw in Eric? Judge, Overall. Yes. Now, after your, um, <clears throat> strike that, at some point uh, after Sunday, August 20th, 1989, did you learn that your brother and sister-in-law had been killed? Yes. And uh, did you then come to California? Yes, I did. And how soon after you learned uh, of their death did you come? As soon as I could. Well, when was that? Within three hours. On what day did you learn of their death? Uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning, East Coast time, uh, on the 21st, Monday. And were you in California Monday afternoon? Yes. And when you got to California, where did you go? I went straight to the Bell Age Hotel. The Bell Edge. I'm sorry. Yes. B E L A G E. Is okay. that the place? Yes. And was that a place where other um, Menendez and Anderson family members were staying? Yes. 
And how long did you stay in Los Angeles on that trip? Until Friday night. And that was Friday night, the 25th? That's correct. And on Friday night, the 25th, uh, where did you go? The whole family, including myself, went to Princeton, New Jersey for the funeral. And was there a memorial service here in Los Angeles before the funeral in Princeton? Yes. And what was the day of the memorial service here? Friday morning, same day at 11 o'clock in the morning. Friday the 25th? That's correct. And what was the day of the funeral in Princeton? It was Monday. So it was uh, Monday, I believe, that it was around 11 o'clock in the morning as well. That was the 27th? That is correct. Okay. Now, when you got here on Monday, did you, uh, at any time on that day, did you see Eric or Lyle? I don't recall. I don't think I saw them that day. Did you see Eric or Lyle on Tuesday? Yes. And where did you see them on Tuesday? I saw them at the Bell Edge. Uh, Eric came with Mark Hefferman. Lyle came before on his own. And were they with other people as well as Mark? Were they with relatives? Yes. Was there talking among the relatives? Yes. Did you have any time alone with them on that day? No. On the next day, uh, at some point on Tuesday, did you go to uh, Jose's uh, business office? Yes, I did. Overall. And was that uh, a, an office at Live, L-I-V-E, Entertainment? That is correct. And where was that office located at that time? Here in Van Nuys. And uh, did you spend a portion of Tuesday at his office? Yes, I did. And did you have some a conversation, without telling us what, with his secretary, Marzi Eisenberg? Yes, I did. And with, um, with Ms. Eisenberg present, did you look through your brother's papers? Yes, I did. And did you continue to do that on part of the day Wednesday as well? Yes, I did. And uh, did you, as a result of looking through those papers, uh, write up a document? Yes, I did. Did you also remove some of those papers and maintain them? Yes, I took all the files. And was there some specific information that you were trying to gather as a financial planner? Yes, I was. And was that information information about the assets and the liabilities of your brother's estate? That's correct. Now, at some point on um, Wednesday or Thursday, did you uh, set up an appointment to talk to Eric and Lyle? Yes. And did you approach them and tell them something? I told them that Council, I uh, the court sustains its objection at this point. And did you have a, a private meeting with them at some point? Yes, I did. And what was the day, to the best of your recollection, of the private meeting? Thursday, early evening. And was that the first time you had been alone with Eric and Lyle, or either of them, from the time you came in on Monday? Yes. Now, without getting into it, did you tell Eric and Lyle what the purpose of the meeting was before the meeting? Sustain. Your Honor, I'd like to ask this question as a foundation for future testimony. Well, I'm not going to get into the meeting. Foundation for what? Future testimony. All right. If um, you can answer that question, yes or no? No. No, you didn't tell them the purpose? No. Now, were um, your sister, Terry Baralt, and her husband, Carlos Baralt, <coughs> here in Los Angeles for th that same period of time that you were, Monday to Friday? Yes. And uh, to your knowledge, were they the executors of your brother's will? Yes, they were. Were you a witness on your brother's will? Yes, I was. And were you aware that that will had been written in 1981? Yes, I was. Now, were you aware during that week that you were in Los Angeles that your brother had an insurance policy with Sun Life Insurance? Yes, I did. 
And in fact, were you the person uh, who was the broker for that insurance policy? That is correct. And when was it that you had basically sold your brother that insurance policy? In 1986. Now, had you ever discussed the existence of that insurance policy with either Eric or Lyle before your brother's death? No, as a matter of fact, I had not ever okay, discussed Okay, you've answered the question. You can just say no. No. Had you at any time before your brother's death, uh, death ever heard Eric and Lyle themselves discussing any insurance policy? No. During that week that you were in Los Angeles uh, from Monday to Friday, did you file a claim against that insurance policy? Yes, I did. And did you do that um, before or after any discussion you might have had with Eric and Lyle about that policy? I did it before while I was at Life Entertainment. So without even discussing it with them, you just filed the claim? That is correct. Did you have, in fact, the paperwork on that policy? It was in my office, and I called my secretary, and she faxed it to Sun Life. It was in your office in Florida? That's correct. When you went through Jose Menendez's papers at his office, was there any copy of that policy no. there? No. Was there any reference to the policy No, I there? looked for it, and it wasn't there. Now, when you filed this claim, were you claiming on behalf of the contingent beneficiaries? That is correct. And were Eric and Lyle the contingent or second beneficiaries? Yes, they were. Did you tell anybody else in the family that you were doing this before you did it? No. I might have a moment, Sean. Yes. Uh, did you uh, um, maintain any kind of written record that uh, showed the exact date upon which you had the meeting with Lyle and Eric? Yes. You have oh, a written no, the date? sorry, no. Okay. Um, is there any uncertainty in your mind about whether the meeting was on Wednesday or Thursday? Yes. Your Honor, if we might approach briefly concerning scheduling. All right. Thank you. All right. There's, well, two, two matters. I just needed to mark a couple of photographs. All right. You recall testifying, uh, Mrs. Cano, that you were in your brother's office when he was at RCA on two occasions when he, you overheard him calling home and getting detailed instructions and asking details. Yes, I did. And I'd like to mark a photograph. Where are we? One. 186. Thank you. And uh, that's an 8 by 10 black and white photograph. I also want to mark another photograph, 187. And that's a smaller photograph of uh, Eric Menendez at approximately 9. First, the black and white photograph is this um, picture of uh, how your brother looked uh, during that time uh, when he worked for RCA when you described the phone calls? Yes. Um, he pretty much maintained that look uh, throughout his life, did he not? Yes, he did. And now, remember uh, describing a story for us about when you and Kitty were going shopping and Eric was homesick? Yes. And does this photograph, 187, uh, 
accurately depict what Eric looked like at that, at that age. Yes, he looks a little bit uh, fuller there, but he was like that. <coughs> this was about the same age. It's a little thinner. Mm -hmm. that episode. He was thinner on the day that he was sick? Yes. And finally, one other matter. Uh, have you seen uh, today a police report from the Beverly Hills Police Department dated August 19, 1993? Yes, I did. And is this a police report that purports to uh, contain a conversation between yourself and Detective Zoller back in October of 1989? That's correct. Now, in fact, from the period of August 21st, um, for several months after that, did you have frequent uh, telephone contact with Detective Zoller? Yes, I did. Were you making some efforts to be of assistance to him? That is correct. Were you giving him names and information? Yes, I was. I'm sorry, I'm going to beg the court's indulgence. I just remembered an entire area that I meant to go into that I forgot, so. Yeah, not too. When you first got to Los Angeles, in the week of August 21st. Um, had you already received some kind of indication that the police were interested in or pursuing a theory of who was responsible for your brother's death? Yes. And where had you received that information from? Marcy. Overall. Okay, so Marcy my, told my, you something. My brother's secretary, when she called me and informed me about Jose's death, she told me, I asked okay, her what... Okay, without I, anything further. That's fine. I'm not asking you for what Marcy told you, okay. but you had in mind that the police's investigation was taking a particular path or direction. Is yes. that correct? And did you have a number of conversations with the police where you were talking about uh, the notion that Jose's death may have been related to business? Correct and may have been related to some underworld pipes in the business. That's right. And uh, do you specifically recall a conversation with Detective Zoller at the Hamburger Hamlet restaurant on Sunset on some day in October of 1989? I remember going for lunch with him. Do you, can you now remember four years later what no. that conversation no, was? No, I did not. And you're aware of the fact that this report dated August 19th, 1993, is the only memorialization of supposedly of that conversation. <laughs> Have you ever seen any other police report or notes that purported to contain a conversation with, between yourself and Detective Zola? No. No, they were all informal. You had informal talks with him? Yes. Did you ever see any notes of his relating to your conversations? I don't recall seeing any. Do you recall asking me as recently as two weeks ago, Does how come? This is the only time you've seen a police report that claims to have a conversation between yourself and Detective Zoller. That's correct. And in the course of this, uh, well, according to this police report, so we'll strike that. Do you recall talking to Detective Zoller, whether on this day at the Hamburger Hamlet or in your phone calls, about one of your brother's um, business connections, one of the businesses that he had been involved in. Yes. And do you recall talking about people, uh, Morris Levy and Noel Bloom? Yes. And was it your belief at this time, based on what you originally heard from Marcy, that they were suspects? Yes. Uh, in October of 1989, uh, did you have any reason to believe that Lyle and Eric were responsible for this? Not at all. Now, in the course of talking to Detective Zoller, whether on this day or another day, did you, did you ever tell him, uh, did you ever describe your brother's family to him in very positive terms? I'm sure I did. And uh, let me read you, for example, did you ever describe your brother's family as close and loving? Close, yes, loving. I wouldn't say that it could be that that was his conclusion of my conversation. Okay. But it could be. I mean, I, at the time, I had no reason to disclose Jose's truth uh, and change anything that he always wanted to portray. I had 
I didn't want to do that. Let me ask you this. You've, you've testified here for uh, you know, a day and some um, about a lot of behaviors of your brothers and your sister-in-laws that you didn't like. Right. Did you tell the police about the treatment that you saw your brother and sister-in-law impose on their children? I didn't tell anybody. But why didn't you tell that to the police because in 1989? It, it would break the image that I know Jose and Kitty always wanted to give, and I had no reason to do that. Okay, you didn't have any reason to believe that at that time that those things that you saw had led to their death? No, not at all. <laughs> Did you discover after your brother and sister-in-law's death that there were things that had been concealed from you by them over the course of their life? Yeah, she calls for here, did you learn things about their family uh, after they died that you didn't know when they were alive? Same objection, any relevant. Uh, had you ever heard uh, from your brother or your sister-in-law when they were alive that um, Eric had any kind of learning problems? Ask me answer. Did you know about your brother's eight-year affair while he was alive? Sustained. Did you ever know before your sister-in-law died why she was taking those pills? Objection calls for speculation. Calls for hearsay. It asks if she has personal knowledge. Objection, sustained. Did you have personal knowledge of why Kitty was taking Valium? Objection, no. sustained. The answer is no. Objection, sustained anyway. Next question, please. Did you ever stay over at the house on Elm Drive? Yes. And was that a very large house? Yes. I would like to show the witness some photographs, Your Honor, if I could. How much longer are you going to be with this witness? You indicated that you had completed your examination. I think it's going to be another 10 minutes. On what subjects? Approach the sidebar, please. Uh, brief further direct examination showing a couple of pictures and asking a couple of questions of the witness and then they'll have cross-examination. I'm not sure that the couple of questions, but... Uh, that's what you indicated. They always grow. Um, were you aware, Mrs. Um, <coughs> Cano, that there was an investigation of the deaths of your brother and sister-in-law uh, instigated by live entertainment. Yes, I did. And was that to try to deal with the uh, issue of whether it was uh, business related? Yes. And uh, were you familiar with an um, a firm of private investigators called Palladino and Sutherland? Is that the one that called me on the phone? Yeah, that's the one that called you yes. on the phone. And in fact, in February of uh, 1990, uh, were you interviewed over the telephone by somebody from that firm? Yes. And did you talk to them about uh, some of the same information that you would talk to Detective Zoller about these business contacts of your brothers that you were suspicious about? Yes, I did. Now, did you um, say flattering things about your brother to this investigator over the telephone? I probably did. Did you tell them, for example, that your brother was moral and ethical to the extreme? That was the picture Jose wanted to portray, and I was not going to change it for any other reason. Did you think your brother was moral to the extreme? I thought he was in the business world. I knew he wasn't in the family world. Did you also tell them that your brother was undefeatable, the only way to get rid of Jose was to kill him? Yes, and I do believe that. And were you, uh, in talking about one of these business connections, did you even mention to Palladino that your brother was sarcastic and put this person down? Yes. And was that 
let's strike that. Did you see your brother being sarcastic, being a put-down artist with adults as well as children? He did that all the time. Anytime anyone tried to defy him, he would humiliate them and ridicule them and win. Was your brother in your family held up as an idol, an ideal, something to aspire to? Yes, because he was extremely successful in the business world. Now, did you also tell Palladino uh, and Sutherland that, uh, ho with respect to your brother and his children, that your brother would tell them what to do and what not to do, that he gave them no choices? That's correct. Did you also, however, tell them that the boys couldn't have been more loved and pampered? I'm not sure I said it that way because they were never loved and pampered, but I probably told them that they had everything they wanted or needed to want, you know, materialistic things, they had them all. Well, do you think that in talking to these investigators you were trying to paint a, a rosy but untrue picture I'm of the sure, family? I'm sure I was. Did you also, however, tell them that uh, the boys were very good kids? Yes, they were. Did you also tell them that uh, neither boy is much of a talker, that's how they were raised, just like their parents, very reserved, very private? That's correct. Joanna, I have nothing further with leave of court so that it won't delay things. I'll show the photographs during redirect. Would that be easier? Only if the purpose is to show photographs and nothing else. If yeah. there's going to be extensive examination on any events that occurred when she was at the house, then I no. want you to do it now. No, they won't be. <laughs> All right, cross-examination. Mrs. Cano, at the time that you spoke to Detective Zoller, specifically at the Hamburger Hamlet, did, were you aware of the fact that he was trying to solve the murder of your brother and your sister-in-law? Of course I was. And did you I think that... I the use of the word murder, Your Honor. That's for the juries to decide. Overruled. Did you think that that was something that was important? That, did, yes. It was a, okay. And at that time, you gave him information which now it seems you knew to be misleading. Is that correct? I wouldn't say that. I just omitted certain f issues that I did not see any reason to reveal at the time. Okay, did you tell him that Jose did everything for Eric and Lyle? That is correct. He even instructed him what to say. He would often travel with them as a family to various parts of the United States to watch their involvement in tennis. Did you tell detectives all of that? Not exactly to watch the involvement, but to tell them how to play tennis, yes. You to be part of their tennis match, okay. yes. Did you also tell him or describe the family as being close and loving? They were close. They were not loving. I what? could not have said that. I know that that's part of that, and I believe that that was probably a conclusion from Dr. Zoller from saying that they were always together. Yes, they were always together. You want to help the defendants in this case, don't you? Not necessarily. I have my own personal integrity, and remember, I'm talking against my brother here. I'm not talking against a stranger. Um, you also told Detective Zoller, Detective Zoller asked you, did he not, if you knew of any problems within the family, and you said no. That is correct. The problems that I knew, I did not think at the time had anything to do with the killings, and I would reserve them because Jose never wanted to portray that out to the outside. But Jose was dead at that point, is that correct? That is correct, but his image was still there. And you didn't, you didn't think that the things that you've described to this jury were problems enough to, d to tell Detective Zoller about, is that correct? I am sorry, could you repeat that question? Well, you've told this jury about several instances in which you viewed either Mr. Menendez or Mrs. Menendez mistreating their children. Would that be a fair characterization? That is correct. And you didn't think that was important to tell Detective Zoller when you spoke to him on October of 89? No, he didn't ask me any on those, on those issues. If he would have asked me, maybe I would have said something to him, but he didn't ask me any questions on, that, on those issues. But it was your intent when you talked to Detective Zoller to paint a rosy picture. It was my intent to continue to portray my brother's and his family's image. Yes, it was. And when you talked to the Palladino uh, investigators, you tried to paint the same picture. That is correct. And now you're trying to paint a different picture. No, now I'm saying the truth. Okay, so before you didn't tell the truth. 
I omitted certain issues of the truth because, as I said, at that time, I did not have to <coughs> carry with the conscience that if I didn't say the truth, horrible things could happen. And are you saying that you feel differently now? I don't feel different. I feel exactly the same way. I just know things that I didn't know before, and I have to have the integrity to say what I know. And you didn't have the integrity to say what you knew before? Objective I always... I've always worked, talked with integrity. I just omitted issues that he never asked me direct. As a matter of fact, if you see on the detectives, the other person that interrogated me, he did ask me how did they behave, and I told him that they were very secretive. I didn't say that to, to Zoller. He never asked me. Now, in, 19, in October of 1989, um, I believe you indicated in your direct examination that you had no reason to suspect the defendants. Is that correct? That's definitely correct. So all of the mistreatment that you had observed over the years did not, in your mind, provide any kind of motivation. Is that correct for them to have done the killings? Yeah. Rephrase the question. In October of 1989, you were aware of all these incidents of mistreatment which you've told the jury about that today. That is correct. And that information was all done because the parents were dead as of October of 89. In other words, you had witnessed all these things prior to October of 89. Yes, and I still think that they would Wait, not have killed him for that alone. Okay, but that is your opinion. That right. is correct? That is correct. Okay. So the fact of, of all these things going on did not cause you to be suspicious, is that correct? No, they were very good kids. Okay. I take it you love your nephews very much. I do, and so I do love my brother and Okay, kid. well the question is, do you love your nephews? Yes, I do. Uh, your brother and Mrs. Menendez are gone. Not in my memory. But they're gone, they're dead. In your mind, not in mine. And you want to help these defendants, don't you? I want to say the truth about the defendants. I think I have a need and an obligation to reveal the truth. Why didn't you tell Detective Zoller the truth when you talked to him in October of 89? The boys were not at stake at the time. So since they're at stake, it's then that you will paint this picture. Again, the same thing I said to you. I didn't lie to him. I just deviated portraits of image. I did not reveal personal details that I knew that were confidential reports. I didn't reveal them to anyone that knew me. When you were asked by Detective Zoller if you knew of any problems within the family, you said no. He was referring to other kinds of problems. Well, did you think that the things that you've told this jury about, both the juries about, do you think those were problems? Those were mistreatments and definitely were issues, but I didn't see them as problems in reference to threaten my, my brother's life. I believe you indicated that on one occasion when you were coming back from, I think it was Eric's graduation from high school, that Kitty Menendez got in an accident. She asked you to lie for her, to that Jose. That is correct. And, and you did that, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you Very embarrassingly wise. But, but you, you lied to help Kitty. I wouldn't put it that way. I would, I would have done it for you, too. I mean, it, it was a matter of avoiding uh, a confrontation with Jose. That's the way I understood it. And the last thing I wanted to do on Eric's graduation was to set up an issue that apparently was an issue according to Kitty's uh, behavior. Okay, so you were willing to lie about what happened to the car. Is that correct? I find that a very minor detail. I was not in anyone's life at stake. If their lives would be today, I would not be lying. Whether it's in their behalf or not, I would not be lying. Now, I believe you've told the uh, juries about several instances of bad conduct by your brother and by your sister-in-law. Would that be a fair characterization? Would you rephrase that? Yes. You've talked about many things that your brother did to his sons that were mistreatment in your mind, correct? That's correct. And at, at, you also testified to many things about Mrs. Menendez, too. That's correct. Do you have anything nice to say about your brother? Were there any good character characteristics that he had? His total dedication to his children, which became an obsession and a possession, unfortunately. If it would have been only a total dedication, I would have admired it all my life because they did have, both of them, total dedication. The problem is it became a sick type of obsessive dedication. Well, what I wanted to know is did they have any positive character traits? 
either I, one of them. I believe that's a positive thing. To be dedicated to your children is very positive. But I believe you've indicated that it became an obsession, which is a negative character. Fortunately, it did. Okay. Do you have anything positive to say about your brother? He was an admirable person. He controlled every business negotiation he would encounter. He would control every single conversation that we were into. He would manage to have the right words to ridicule and, and intimidate and humiliate and manipulate anyone that was present so he could control. So in my eyes, believe it or not, I admired his ability to control and to turn things around to his behalf and to his favor. I and did admire that. He was unbelievable. You admire that in him? Of course. Okay, what about Mrs. I didn't admire that manipulation, but I admire his ability to do that. <coughs> What about Mrs. Menendez? Is there anything about her that you liked? Or I admire her. She was a, a tremendous um, athlete. She was very strong. She could pick up a Christmas tree and move it from one place to the other and didn't have to wait until her husband came home to do it, which I couldn't do. I admire that strength. I admire the fact that she was always, she was intelligent and she was a handyman and she could put together a barbecue. I remember once we bought a barbecue and I didn't know where to start and she had no problem putting it together and getting the right tools. And, I admire all that on her. She was great on that. She was very abil she has she was very you know, she had a tremendous amount of abilities. So you admire the fact that she was physically strong, correct? Yes. That she was intelligent. That's correct. And that she had mechanical ability. That is correct. Okay. Now I believe you indicated on your direct examination that you lived in Puerto Rico for the fourteen years prior to nineteen seventy nine. Is that, that correct? That is correct. So from nineteen sixty five to nineteen seventy nine. That is correct. And I believe you indicated you stayed with your brother for one week in 1972. Is that, that correct? Is, that is correct. And between 1972 and 1979, on how many occasions did you see your brother interact with his family? Every Christmas and every summer. Okay, I believe the summer vacations were for two weeks. I went from two weeks to a month, depending, always went in the month of July and spent, uh, I stayed at Terry's, but they lived within five miles, so. So the only time that you actually lived in the Menendez home during that period of time when you were residing in Puerto Rico was the one week in 1972? That's the only one I recall. Did you ever live in the Menendez home again for any period of time, including an overnight stay between 1979 and the time of their deaths in 1989? I stayed overnight when I was moving. And when was that? That was in 1986. And was that at the Princeton House? That is correct. And how long did you stay there in 1986? I'm sorry? How many nights did you spend there while you were moving? Just one night, Jose was on a trip, and Kitty was alone in the house. All right, so the t total number of nights that you spent in the house would be the one week in 1972 and the one night in 1986? To sleep, yes. And then I believe you indicated you spent some time in Beverly Hills, is that correct? Yes, I came for a week within Eric's graduation time. And did you spend, the, did I you stay I spent one week at the house, yes. So that, so that it would be two weeks during the course of 17 years and one night when you were moving? Yes, but we were a very close family. We interrelated and, and got together many, many times. I believe you indicated on one occasion that um, Eric Menendez was, I believe you said, a toddler or a baby and that he was running around in the woods outside of the house. Do you remember your testimony in that regard? Yes, I do. Uh, were there other uh, cousins of his around him at that time? That was a danger, that there were kids from all ages and he was a baby. He was two and there were kids four, five, seven, which were not looking after him. They were too small as well and they were playing rough. All right, and so there were, the oldest child involved was seven years old? There were the boys were playing, which was Peter, Eric, and Lyle, and uh, Peter was only two years older than Lyle, and Lyle was five, so we're talking Peter seven, five, and two and a half, I mean, I mean two, not even five, Lyle was not five yet. And, are, so and is Peter it, had just turned seven because Peter was born in December 65. So Peter was not old enough to look after a child? They were not looking after anybody, they were playing hide and seek and running and hitting one another. I don't call that looking, you know, it's not a sitting down plane. Um, I believe there were some photographs on the board yesterday showing Eric as a an baby holding on to some some bars. Is that That's correct? Right. That's correct. Um, those photographs, do you know where they were taken or when? 
I know that they were taking at that time, I know from Eric's age, I mean, during that time, plus at the time, Jose used to brag about the fact that he would take the boys to the gym and, and make them strong, showing them all this strength in the, the bars. But you weren't personally present when the photograph was taken, were you? No, I was not presently taken. That's a gym bar, and I think I stated that I have never been at the gym. I believe you testified about some uh, driving on Mrs. Menendez's part. Um, at the time, did she have seat belts installed in her car? Of in, course. In 1972? Of course. She had top of the line cars and they all had seats in the back seat and the front seat. I had my kids put the, the, the seat belts because I didn't feel comfortable didn't she have, le leaving them loose there. Didn't she have an older model, model Jaguar? No, it was not a Jaguar. I don't know what kind of car it was, but I think it was a Buick. I'm not sure, but I, I, I recall it was a Buick. I'm not sure of that. It was a big car. It was not a Jaguar. I believe you indicated uh, during your testimony and just recently that Mrs. Menendez was a strong woman. Is Very that? so. Okay. Now, between 1986 and 1989, how many times did you see uh, Kitty Menendez? 1986 is the year that you moved to Florida and they moved to California, is that correct? I saw them uh, several times. Well, how, several times a year? From 86 to 89, I yes. saw them in Christmas. Uh, Christmas 86, I don't think they attended. I think they did not, they didn't go and meet with us. But I saw them in February 87 when my father died, and I saw them in September 87 when my daughter Marta got married, and I saw them in April 87 when they went to the to Florida for the Easter Bowl, which they attended every year. April 87 or 88? I believe so. I think they went 87, 88, and 89. So you saw them on those occasions? That's correct. Did you see them Christmas of 88? As a matter of fact, let me get back. Christmas 86, they went to New Jersey. I didn't because it was the last Christmas of my father, so I remember that. I did not attend that Christmas myself. Christmas 88, we were together. How many I mean, maybe months? Maybe not. I don't recall, really. I mean, I know at the time they were not attending too many Christmases anymore, so I can't recall exactly if it was 88, the one that I didn't see them, or if it was 87. I think we met in 87. That's it. We met in 87 after my father's death. We were all there for Christmas. We were not together in 88. And these Christmases you've talked about, were they celebrated on the East Coast? They were celebrated at Terry's, yes. Okay. They used to be celebrated at Jose's when they lived in the East Coast, but when they moved, we celebrated them at Terry's. How many months before their deaths was it that you last saw them in Endes's? Was it June, the end of June, 1989. So um, at that time, was Kitty still a strong woman? Oh, yes. Now, I believe you indicated that you moved to the East Coast in 1979 from Puerto Rico, and you stayed there until your move to Florida in 1986. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Could you repeat it again? I was yeah. You, you moved from Puerto Rico to the East Coast in 1979, right. and you stayed there until 1986 when you moved to Florida, correct? That, that is correct. Who moved out of uh, New Jersey first, the Menendezes or you? I did. And do you remember what month you moved? Sure. I moved in June 1986, and Jose, I believe, moved in October, September, October. My daughter Marianne stayed that summer with them because I was gone, so I'm sure that they moved after me. Now, uh, during that period of time, 1979-1986, um, were you aware of the fact that relatives, cousins of the Menendezes would spend the summer, various cousins spent the summers at their home? I'm only aware of one that spent the summer there. And who was that? Alicia. Alicia? Yes, after Marianne left or something, I think Alicia stayed there babysitting the house. All right, now I'm referring to the years between 1979 and 1986. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Before you moved to Florida. Yes. Were you aware that cousins on Mrs. Menendez's side uh, came and stayed for the summer or longer at the Menendez home? Sure. Okay, do you remember which ones? I saw? met, I saw Diane very much. Diane is the one that I really remember the most. I Do, don't remember Alan. You don't remember Alan at all? Not myself, no. I don't think Alan was there after 79. How about um, Kathy? No. You don't remember her either? No, I don't think she was there after 79. Not that I saw her anyway. If she was there, it was a very short period of time because I did not see her. Did you ever see your brother strike his children? With his hand? 
once I did see it. And who did he strike and what year, if you can recall? It was Eric, and it was after a soccer game. He was angry because Eric had been a sissy. And that was the only time and you ever... And he just strike him on, on, on the side and Where? push him on his side. He just hit him hard. That the kid lost his balance. He hit him on the arm? Yes. Did you ever see your brother hit Lyle? Not hit him. Okay. Did you ever see your brother, uh, excuse me, your sister-in-law hit either of her children? Kitty would throw things at them. Did you ever see her hit them with her hand? They would move out of the way of the object that she was throwing. Did you ever see her hit them with her hand? With her hand, yes, I saw her hit Lyle once with her hand. How old was Lyle when she did that? 12, 13. Was there a period of time where, where Lyle was disrespectful to his mother? Yes. Could you tell me when that started? That started in his teenage years. He sort of started resenting his mother. I felt well, that. You had to move to strike, started resenting as a conclusion I'm sorry. part of the witness. That's, that was my. I believe you indicated then when he started to become a teenager, what, what age would you say? I would say he was about 14. By the time he had a girlfriend, more and, or less. And what would he do to his mother to show disrespect? What he would not obey her. He would answer back to her. He would uh, talk very rude to her, very unrespectful. Did you see that kind of behavior continue in him past the age of 14? Yes. Uh, when was the last time you saw Lyle being rude or disrespectful to his mother? The last time was at the Princeton Avenue house in 1986, right before um, they were on the process of moving, which I stated uh, when Kitty made that, that comment to me that... Okay, you've answered the question. Um, so that was 1986, Lyle was 18 years old at the time, is that correct? That's correct. I also saw him with her in 1989 when I went to Eric's graduation, but Lyle didn't attend the graduation with us. Lyle show up very sloppily later at the back of the graduation. He was not with the family that day. I knew something was happening. Move to strike, I knew something was happening as a conclusion on the part of the witness and non-responsive. Now, um, when you saw Lyle at Eric's graduation, did he continue to treat his mother in a disrespectful manner? I saw him in interact with both his father and mother very little. As a matter of fact, I saw Lyle, I stopped at mass, and he was there. Yeah, you, you can, you can no. answer the question, yes or no. Just name the answer, we ask the question. Could you repeat okay, the Yeah, questions? the question is, when you were at the house for Eric's graduation in 1989, did you or did you not see Lyle treat his mother disrespectfully? I don't recall really. I don't recall seeing him. Didn't see him much. Um, Mrs. Cano, I believe you've indicated just recently in your testimony that you saw Mrs. Menendez throw things at her children. Yes. Did you ever report her for child abuse? No. You don't do that with your, your, your sister-in-law unless the boy is hurt. I mean, you just don't do that. You, I knew that was out of hand, but I, you know, in my mind, I tried to diminish it because I just didn't want to believe that of Kitty. But you saw it? Yes, I did. So it wasn't someone else telling you about it, you actually saw it? No, I saw it and I found it completely out of hand and I did feel that she needed some help on, on her aggressive way of uncontrolled temper. So what did you do to get her help? I told her that she should go to a psychologist, that you, it was not normal behavior, and she looked at me very upset. She didn't like my comment. You also gave her Valium, didn't you? She asked me for Valium, and I told her I had some, and that uh, she could take it because I didn't take it. So you gave her your Valium, is that correct? That is correct. Was I that had been prescribed Valium once, and I never took it. The um, incidences that you've related to these juries, did you ever discuss them with other members of your family, like your sister Terry or your mother? Yes, they were always discussed uh, about the, the, the cruelty and the aggressiveness of Jose and Kitty treating the kids, yes. And so at some point, did you decide to intervene and try to get help for No, these? because I had no idea that it went further than that. All that we saw was cruel and was wrong, but, you know, in the society that we live, uh, you can't just go to the police and say the kid is being pulled. I see that in jail every day when I go, and the, the 
the jail people are there yeah, and they don't do anything about it. Everything after, everything starting with when she goes to jail. Aside from going to the police, did you ever think of going for any kind of professional help for these? I'm going to object at this point that this is irrelevant. It's not her job. Counsel, let's not argue with objection on the ground. Relevancy, I don't have the question. It's irrelevant. Let me turn the question. The, re the question was, did you and your uh, other family members ever try to go to a psychologist or someone aside from the police for help? I did tell Kitty, and I did mention, we did discuss in the family several times that uh, Kitty should go to a psychologist because it was not normal behavior, the way she behaved with the boys. Yes, we did. What about Jose going to a psychologist? Did you ever discuss that? It's interesting we did, and Jose was such an image that uh, my mother had always justified anything Jose did, so we just, in our mind, we just um, I knew that Jose was very aggressive, but I didn't. Now, I believe you indicated that you had been a teacher for 14 years. Is yes, that, I was. Did you have training in uh, dealing with uh, child psychology? Yes, I did. I believe you indicated there was an incident when Eric was eight or nine and that you went over to pick up Mrs. Menendez to go shopping and you discovered that Eric had a fever. Is that correct? That's right. It's the time of this picture, as a matter of fact. And I take it you were upset by the fact that Eric had a fever. Is that correct? I wasn't exactly upset. I was concerned. And so you told Mrs. Menendez, did you not, well, I'm not going to go shopping with you because I'm not going to help you to leave this child here. No, I didn't say that. I told her, Kitty, we don't have to go shopping. We can go another day. As a matter of fact, it was her invitation to take me shopping and for lunch at New Hope. I told her, Kitty, we don't have to go today. I can go another day. And she told me, oh, no, Marta, there's no need. He'll be fine. So you went shopping with her? Yes, I did. So you didn't refuse to go shopping in spite of the fact that Eric had this fever? I didn't want to. I didn't want to hurt her feelings. She seemed to be conf confirmed, convinced that Eric would be fine. I believe you indicated there was an incident where you were going to go out of town and your son Andy was about seven and a half years old. And you went to drop him off at the Menendez home and found that the only person in attendance was Eric. That is correct. And so he would have been about nine or nine and a half at that time. Is that correct? Uh, it was uh, a during the spring of 80, so well, 80, he, 80, 81, I don't remember. Probably. He, I don't recall. He was around nine years old. So he's, he's two years. He was years not 10. I know that. He was small. He was eight or nine. I believe you indicated then that you waited at the house until Mrs. Menendez came home. Is that That's correct? That's correct. At mm -hmm. that point, did you leave your son at the house? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I was not able to go to where I was going to go, but I went shopping for a little while and came back. So after Mrs. Menendez returned home, you left your son there? For a couple of hours, yes, I did. But you were concerned before she got home because Eric had been left alone. That is correct. I asked her if she was going to go out again, and she told me she was. And she was very angry, too, because I had waited. She thought it was ridiculous that the kids could fetch for, her, for themselves while they were, she was gone. I believe you also indicated that the Muncie house had a lake, and that you were worried about the lake. No, not in Muncie. Well, which house? The house was in the Pennington house. The lake was in the Pennington house. I don't recall any, any lake on Muncie. If there was one, I don't remember. All right, so the Pennington house had a lake, and you were concerned about the lake. It was right behind the house. It was, the house was at the border of the lake. Did you ever let your son go over to the house when you weren't there? Yes, I did. When he was a little bit older, I left him more than when he was smaller. But when he was smaller, did you leave him there? I left him. I left Marta, my daughter, many times with him to watch over him. Did you ever leave him alone without Marta being there? Yes, I did. And you knew about the lake, correct? Yes, but Kitty was there. And you knew that, in spite of Kitty being there, that she often did not supervise her children? That is correct. And I made, made very sure that Andy remembered the instructions of what to do and what not to do. That was the condition. He loved so much to be with Eric that he would do anything for me to be with Eric. So I would say, OK, Andy, I'll let you go if you promise me that you're going to behave as if you have no supervision because you're not going to get any supervision. And how, he did. How old was Andy when they moved into the Pennington house? Do you remember? Well, I don't know when they moved to the Pennington house. They were living in the Pennington house in 1979 when I arrived in Princeton. That was the first time I went to the Pennington house. And I when think. was your son, and when was Andy born? Andy was born in July 14, 1973. So when you got to the United States, Andy was about six years old. That is correct. How old 
was your son Andy when he got the injury which required 17 stitches? He was three. And I believe you indicated that you had left him alone with Kitty Menendez. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Well, you'd left him at the Menendez home. No, I was in Puerto Rico and he had gone on a trip to my sister's with Marta and he was spending a month with Marta in New Jersey at my sister Terry's house. And it's your understanding that your son Andy was in, at the Menendez home when he cut himself, is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to object to this because this is beyond her personality. She was in Puerto Rico. Objection sustained. I believe you indicated that your son Andy required 17 stitches at some point after being at the Menendez, Menendez home. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And was it your state of mind that somehow someone had neglected him? No, I'm going to object to that. state of mind <clears throat> is not an issue. Okay. When your son Andy was three years old, you saw him with a cut on his chin, correct? Not on the chin. Where was this cut? Right on his forehead. And it had stitches in it, correct? Of course. Okay. And then when you moved to the Princeton area, I believe you indicated that it was 1979 and the Menendezes had a lake behind their house, correct? Yes. Okay. And you continued to leave your son Andy at the Menendez home after he had sustained this cut with the 17 stitches, correct? Andy was not three years old. He was six years old. He was six, six and a half, seven. When he was six and seven, I would leave him with his sisters. When he was older, around eight or nine, he used to stay by himself with, with Eric and Kitty and Lyle. I believe you've indicated in your testimony, in your direct examination, that uh, your brother encouraged competition among the boys, including your sons. Is that, that is correct? correct? Yes. I believe you indicated in your direct examination that there were animal feces inside of the homes that the Menendez lived in. Is that correct? Yes, all over the place. I believe you indicated there was animal food in the house. Yes, because there ha they had uh, the dog and the ferret as well would go into the laundry room where the food was and just pull it out and spread it all over. I believe you indicated that there was dirty laundry in the house. Yes. And that sometimes the defendants wore clothes that were dirty. Yes. I believe you indicated that Kitty didn't really participate too much in meal preparation, that the children got their own meals on occasion. The only meal that Kitty prepared was the evening meal. I believe you indicated that Mr. Menendez spoke abusively to his sons. Oh, yes. I believe you indicated that Mrs. Menendez drove rec recklessly. Yes. And that, on, that at least on one occasion you saw her take Valium. That's correct. And you left your son there. Objection, Your Honor. It's argumentative. Yes, Andy loved Eric so much that it would bro break my heart not to leave him playing with his cousin. It was only for one day, and I knew one day was not going to hurt him. I believe that you indicated you let him spend, th spend the night there as well. One day. That's it. I would leave him Saturday morning and pick him up Sunday afternoon. How when many? I was going to my other kids. Uh, they were all in sports in college and high school, so I was going to travel with them to watch their matches and games. Were you worried about your son Andy when you left him in this environment? I would call him a couple of times Saturday night and Sunday morning many times. Did you ever consider taking him with you? Yes, I wanted to take him with me. He didn't want to go. He said it was boring to sit down beside a swimming pool or in a volleyball game or a water polo game, whatever the kid was, to sit there all afternoon. And I could understand. He was only a seven-year-old, and he really wanted to be and play with Eric. I could understand that. He so was my brother. We're better. And so all of these things that you've complained about in the Menendez household did not keep you from leaving your son there? Objection no. argumentative. It worried me, though. But you left him there anyway. Objection argumentative. Yes, I left him there anyway with a lot of instructions, but I did. And you also, uh, your daughter, um, Marianne, also lived there for a period of two months. Marianne was an adult at the time. She could make her own choices. She had just finished college, so she was an adult. She decided to stay there because she wanted to work in town, and Kitty offered her to stay there. It was her choice, not mine. I have nothing further at this point. All right, is there a redirect? All right. Were you afraid of your brother? I wasn't afraid of him. I was intimidated by him. You were afraid of his mouth and his anger, weren't oh, you? Oh, yes. And on some level, were you also afraid of Kitty, of her anger as well? Objection Vegas to what level? I'm sorry? Vegas to what level she's talking about. I think she said on some level. 
Objection. Do you understand the question? Yes, I do understand. Right. Objection yes. overall. Kitty was, uh, I was even more scared of Kitty because at least with Jose, I know when he was coming. Kitty would change from being very quiet to being very abruptly aggressive, and it was very scary. You didn't know what to expect. So Kitty was somebody that I was very careful not to get in her rage because it's, it was just out of hand. Uh, the prosecutor was basically asking you, why didn't you interfere and intervene and run to the police and have them all arrested for child abuse? Um, did you feel that you actually knew everything that was going on in that home? Of course not. Did you feel these were very secretive and private people? Overall. They were very secretive and private. And with respect to your brother, um, would you say that in your family circle, the exception perhaps of your mother, that he was the strongest willed person in the family? That is correct, and your ex exception is well taken. <laughs> <laughs> and wasn't your brother your mother's darling? Yes. And were you conscious of the fact that if you criticized your brother or tried to do anything that would harm your brother, that it would bring down the wrath of your mother? Excuse me, there's a Objection sustained. Well, did you have some concerns with respect to your relationship with and your ability to continue uh, within the family um, headed by your mother <laughs> if you were to say or do anything that could hurt your brother? I didn't have concerns at the time, but it's definitely true. When you were living in New Jersey uh, with your five children, yes. were you a single mother? Yes, I was. Were you supporting those children on your own? Yes, I was. <coughs> and was your family um, important to you? Very important. That's why I moved to Princeton when I divorced. To be with your sister and your brother and their families? That's correct. And uh, did you have any desire to uh, disrupt and bring scandal to your family? No. Overall. Not at all. That's the last thing I wanted to do. I had enough disruption in my own family. And even after your brother and your sister-in-law uh, were dead, uh, were you conscious of the notion of not bringing any negative scandal to your brother and sister-in-law? Of course. Uh, there was a very beautiful image of what the Menendez had been, and I didn't want to change that. I wish I would have never had to change it. With respect to this notion of image, was image and status as important to Kitty as it was to Jose? Sustained on the former ground. Did you did Kitty talk to you about the importance of one's status in society and other people's perceptions of one? Yes, that was the most important thing for her. What people thought of her it was very important. I have nothing further on her. Any redirect on behalf of Lyle Menendez? Any further cross examination? All right, how long will the examination of this witness take before the Eric Menendez jury? Oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as far as the Lyle Menendez jury is concerned, we'll excuse you until 2 o'clock. Um, as far as the Eric Menendez jury, we'll have you back at 1.30. There's some testimony the lawyers have uh, that would relate only to uh, this witness before the Eric Menendez jury, so uh, the Lyle Menendez jury is excused until 2 o'clock. Uh, don't discuss this matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it here at your respective appointed times. All right. Mrs. Cano, in 1989, were you at that time working for Smith Barney? Could you repeat the question? All right, let me ask it open. Who were you working for in August, September, October of 1989? For Smith, Barney, Harris, and Upham. That's correct. Okay. Barney. Harris and Upham. That was That's a the... stock brokerage company. That is correct. And you were working in West Palm Beach, Florida. That is correct. Now, you've testified uh, earlier today that you were the person who uh, made the claim on the Sun Life Insurance Policy. Yes, I did. Now, with respect to Eric Menendez, um, are you, do you remember when the policy, well, strike that, do you remember that time when the company, Sun Life, paid out on the policy? Yes, I do. And did they pay out in one installment or in more than one? No, they paid in two installments. They, 
They pay two different things. Okay, they pay two installments. That's correct. correct. And uh, where did the checks from Sun Life, the payments, go? They go to the agent, which in this case is me. And what did you do with the checks, uh, Eric's checks, when you received them? I informed Eric that I had received the money. And did he give you certain instructions about what to do with it? Yes, he did. He, what did he tell you to do with it? Uh, he told me he didn't want to deal with money, that he didn't know what to do with so much money to put it in his account at Smith Barney. Did he already have an account at Smith Barney? Yes, he did. From before the time his parents Their were father had opened it for them two years before. And so what did you do then with those two proceeds checks uh, as you received each one? I deposited them in Eric's account. And did you, subsequent to that time, make investments of some of that money on Eric's behalf? Yes, I did. Now, did he tell you what to invest in, or did you advise him? No, I advised him. And did he follow your advice? Yes, he did. Now, over the course of the next few months, were you consulted by Eric whenever he wanted to spend any significant amount of money? All the time. How frequently did you talk to him? I talked to him practically daily. And did you write checks and pay his bills for yes, him? Yes, I did. And did you write those checks from this account that you had opened for him? Yes, and other accounts as well. You had, he had other accounts at other places? He had, I suggested that he should have an account in a bank in New Jersey and a bank in California. So he wouldn't have problems cashing checks and, and getting cash of a machine. You mean that was why, why the, he needed the California account? That's correct, because he was, he was traveling at the time between New Jersey and California and living in California, so I didn't feel that having an account with me in West Palm Beach was enough for him. He should have a local bank. So on your suggestion, did he open an account at uh, the United New Jersey Bank? Yes, he did. And did, he, and did you maintain those accounts? In other words, did the statements go to you? Did you write a lot of the checks? That is correct. But he also was able to write checks on the Jersey? That's right. Gotta wait till I finish the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Did he also write checks on the United uh, New Jersey Bank account? Yes, he did. And uh, did, you, did you write checks on his California Bank account? Yes, I did. Did you reconcile all those bank accounts each month? Yes, I did. You did all the accounting? That's correct. I paid all his bills. Do you recall sometime in, um, I believe, October of 1989, receiving a telephone call from Eric in which he was inquiring about the balance in his United Jersey Bank account? Yes, I did. And do you recall, um, he asked you something, didn't he? Yes, he did. Okay. And did he also tell you something about his having written a check? Yes, he did. What did he tell you about having written a check? Your Honor, this is foundational. All right, I'll seek counsel at the sidebar. Thank you. We're going to change the subject. Um, did Eric contact you uh, con and ask you questions about the advisability of his buying a Jeep? Yes, he did. And did he tell you that he was thinking about buying a Jeep before he actually bought it? Yes. And did you, in fact, write the check to buy the Jeep? Yes, I did. And uh, did he indicate to you whether he would, had received any advice before buying the Jeep? Yes, he did. And did he indicate to you who he had received advice from? Yes. And who did he tell you he received advice from? Steve Goldberg, which is the lawyer of the estate. Steve Goldberg is the lawyer for the estates of uh, Jose, Jose and, and Mary Louise Menendez? That's correct. And you're, you're acquainted with him, are you not? Yes, I am. <clears throat> and to your knowledge, he was... Uh, uh, obtained to be the estate lawyer by your sister, Terry, and your brother-in-law, Carlos Baral. That is correct. And did you have dealings with Steve Goldberg having to do with Eric and financial planning for Eric? I'm sorry. Expenditures of Eric's and structuring Eric's life. Did you have yes. discussions with Steve Goldberg yes, about that? Yes, I did. Turning to... Uh, the issue of cars. Were you familiar in um, August of 1989 with what kind of vehicle Eric uh, owned? Yes, I did. And, and what did he own? He owned a 1987 Ford Escort. 
And was it your understanding that that's a car that his parents had purchased for him? Yes, it was. And do you know what happened to that 1987 Ford Escort? Yes, I do. And what happened to it? Eric wanted to sell it, so I bought it from him. And you bought it for whose use? For my son Andy, which at the time had become 16 and a half, and he could be driving. And did Eric indicate to you any reason why he wanted to uh, sell that car? Overall. Overall. He told me he didn't want to have that car anymore. Did he give you any other explanation? No. Now, do you recall a time when Eric rented uh, an apartment at the Marina City Club? Yes. And do you recall having a discussion with him concerning uh, furniture? Yes. And what did he indicate was his intention with respect to furniture at that time? Direction here, sir. Let me have a question right back, please. Question, what did he indicate was his intention with respect to furniture at that time? Overall. I was present in California, by the way. All right, let me, let me get to that. You were here when he was uh, seeking to furnish the apartment in the marina? It was more than that. He called me to come to help him close the contract of the deal in the rental. Okay. I was and present when that contract was closed. Okay, and then was there some discussion about how he would furnish this apartment? Yes. And what was his stated intention as to how he was going to furnish it? He wanted to rent some furniture. And uh, did you have a conversation with him concerning the advisability of renting versus buying? Yes, I did. And did you give him certain advice? Yes, I did. What advice did you give him? I told him that paying $1,200 a month for rent for a period of time of a year or six months or seven months, which at the time he was renting for, was ridiculous that he should con take some money that for that same amount of money that he was going to spend, he could have his own furniture and do whatever he wanted afterwards. And did we you clarify that $1,200 for rent was for furniture? Yes, Your Honor. That monthly. was for the furniture. That's, That's what it would have cost That was the monthly that rental that he, on the furniture that he had already looked at, and he took me to see. Okay. So you advised him to buy? That's correct. Did you then go shopping with him? Yes, I did. And did you assist him, did you advise him in the purchase of furniture? Definitely. We did it together. And were you aware of the fact that he purchased a pool table? Yes. And did he discuss that with you before he bought it? Yes. And did you approve that purchase? Definitely. They always had a pool table. The family always had a pool yes. table? Yes. Now, to your knowledge, uh, apart, do, do you know what furniture, if any, Eric uh, had moved from the Beverly Hills house to his apartment? I know that he didn't want any furniture from the Beverly Hills house. I don't recall what furniture he had. Do you know if he moved his bed? Yes, that's right. I suggested him, that's right, that he should keep his bedroom because they were expensive and he loved water beds. That's what he wanted. Was so I had his water bed repaired, which had been broken for a long time. Okay, let me back up. The question was... I'm sorry. I know, it's hard. question was, did he have his bedroom furniture moved from the Beverly Hills house to his apartment? Yes. Did he have any other furniture from any other part of that house moved to his apartment? No. Did he take anything from any other part of the house to his apartment? No. And you advised him and assisted and helped him in purchasing all the other furniture for his apartment? That is correct. Now, you know that he had a roommate in that apartment. Yes. And uh, did the roommate come with his own furniture? The roommate had his own bedroom and his own desk. And was that roommate a young man named Noel yes. Nedley? Yes. He pronounced his name the way a girl pronounces yes. his name. And were you aware uh, of whether or not Eric lived with Noel Nedley before they moved together to the Marina City Club? Yes, he stayed at his home for a certain period of time. I don't know how long, though. He did. He, that was one of the places that he was staying at. One of the places that Eric was staying at before he got the apartment? That's correct. Now, you are a financial planner, and uh, by, by, you've been a financial planner, you're a stockbroker. Do you also manage money for clients? Yes, I do. 
and you were managing Eric's money for him. That is correct. Did he do any spending uh, that you consider to be excessive or extravagant or equivalent to a spree? Objection no. Objection calls for improper opinion. Objection Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did he do any spending for things for himself without consulting you? Objection. Lack of foundation. If you know. Yeah, that you your know. Own knowledge no, he from did not. From Other than a T-shirt or a pair of shorts, or he clubs. did not. Exactly. So anything that he purchased of any size, you knew about in advance. That is correct. Did you have a discussion with him about his uh, spending habits or? strike that. Did he share with you his attitude about spending this money, the insurance money? You can ask it yes or no. Yes. And did he indicate to you what his <clears throat> state of mind was with respect to spending this money? Yes, he did. And what did he indicate? He told me that he, he was very scared of, of managing money. He had no idea what to do with it. All he wanted to do was play tennis and be with somebody. He didn't want to be alone. What do you mean by be with somebody? He did not want to be alone. He wanted to have some company. He just uh, didn't want to think. Did, did he tell you that he was uh, interested or enjoy, let's strike that. Did he tell you that he was, it, that he enjoyed spending large sums of money? No, not at all. Did he tell you the opposite of that? Yes, he told me that if he did inherit, he would give this money to the homeless kids that run away from home. Now, as far as you know, before the time that Eric and, and his brother were arrested, they had not inherited any of the money from the estate. That is correct. The only money they got was from this insurance policy that you made the claim on. That is correct. And as far as you know, the estate is still in probate. Nothing's finished with it. That is correct. Over the course of his life, had you ever observed Eric to uh, be extravagant with money? He never was. Now, the things that he was doing, renting this nice apartment, buying this furniture, getting a Jeep Wrangler automobile, did that, based on your knowledge of the family and on his parents' spending habits with respect to the children, did that mark for you a change in lifestyle of any kind? Not Overall. Not at all. Now, you had mentioned before in your testimony an individual named Mark Heffernan. Did you know him to be a tennis coach of Eric? Yes. And were you involved on some level in negotiating a contract with Mark Heffernan? Yes, I was. And do you remember when those negotiations with respect to that contract began? Around October, November. Of 1989? That is correct. And who first brought this issue to your attention about having a contract for Mr. Heffernan? You mean who told me that of the issue? How would you get involved in this? Who Eric called me and told me that Mark Hefferman had suggested that he could do this, that he would work for him only and he would make sure that he got his training and his psychological things and on and on and on. Okay. The minute you say a sentence with the word he in it for two different people, we got lost. Okay? I'm sorry. All right. Eric calls you. That is correct. And he told you that Mark Heffernan suggested that he, Mark Heffernan, would be available to work full time with Eric. That is correct. He told me that he had said that if he... Who's he? Mark had said that if Eric wanted Mark would work for him only. Okay. And was Eric calling you to tell you that he was going to do this or to ask your advice? He asked, Eric asked me to come to California to discuss this with him. And did you come? Yes, I did. Was this a different time that when you came to buy the furniture with him and to close the lease? Yes, it was. Now, did uh, when you got either well, strike that when you got here, did you have discussions with Eric about why he now was wanting to do this full-time tennis thing? Yes, I did. Was it your understanding before um, 
his parents died, that Eric was planning on going to college. Yes. Did he discuss that intention with you at the time of his graduation in June? Yes. And when you talked to him after his parents died, on this occasion, did he indicate he was not going to go to college? No, he indicated that he was going to postpone to January going to college. I mean, to the next semester. It wasn't January. It's uh, the following year? September, right, the fall. And did he indicate to you why he was doing that? Objection calls for sustained. Sustained. Your Honor, it's being offered for a state of mind. Objection sustained. You were in touch with Eric on, I think you've told us, on like a daily basis from the time of the insurance money, which was September? Was it yes. September? Yes. Through this period. That's that correct. And did he seem in those daily contacts to be um, stable and secure and calm and confident and know what he was doing in life? Objection no. compound calls from proper things. Or, or any of those things? Same objection. How did he strike you on the phone when you spoke to him? Eric was completely lost. He would cry. He would claim that he was having these nightmares, horrible nightmares. He did not want to be alone. He was scared. He was very confused. He was totally lost. He had not, no idea what to do with himself. And he expressed to you the fact that he didn't know what to do with himself? Yes. Did he express to you the fact that he didn't feel he could go to school and think? That is correct. He told me that I wanted him to go to college and try to put his back, life back together that way among, among young people. And he told me he just couldn't concentrate at that time, that he just needed some time. And did he indicate to you um, what it was about this notion of full-time tennis that appealed to him? Was it your understanding in your negotiations with uh, Mark Heffernan that Mr. Heffernan would be controlling every moment of Eric's life? Yes, it was. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did Eric express to you a desire to have every moment of his life controlled? That's not offered for the truth, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Did you ever try to get Eric to come to Florida to live with you? Yes. Was that during this period of time? Yes. And he refused? He told me he wanted to play tennis. He wanted to be with Mark. Now, did you today hand me this coffee-stained yes, copy? Yes, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Who spilled the coffee on the gun? I did, in my office. OK. A long time ago, we hope? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I need to mark this next. Exhibit 188. This is kind of, uh, what is that? This is the contract that was um, uh, drawn between Mark Hefferman and Eric and indirectly with Lyle as well. Okay. This is a contract to provide coaching services to both Lyle and Eric. Right. And that's the contract that Mr. Hefferman signed. That's correct. And does this particular copy in fact bear uh, Eric's signature and Mark's signature? Yes, it does. And to the best of your knowledge, was this particular draft of this contract prepared at the law offices of Stephen B. Goldberg? Yes, it was. It was drawn between Steve and Mark's lawyer. And was Mark's lawyer named Ronald Goldman? I don't know. Yeah. Probably. Probably. I don't know. And uh, do you remember now whether it was yourself or Eric, who wrote the monthly checks for Mr. Heffernan that that contract provided for? Uh, they were alternated. Sometimes he wrote them, sometimes I wrote them. At the beginning, it was the estate that wrote them when they had no, con no money and no contract. Well, the insurance money, though, came in September. Right. But he, was, he kept on playing tennis with Mark before, I believe. All right. But before there was a contract, he continued that, that Mark had been giving him hourly lessons. Was yes. that your understanding? That's right. 
Do you recall um, Eric indicating to you why it was he felt it was necessary that he play tennis at that part point in his life rather than do anything else? Sustain. That can be answered yes or no, Your Honor. All right, you can answer that yes or no. Yes. And whatever it was he said to you, did that make sense given your daily contacts with Eric? In a way, yes. I have nothing further to but before the people cross-examine, I think they need to show me something. You don't have it quite yet? No. All right, well, okay, well, how long is your cross going to be? Oh, 10 minutes. All right, we'll take a recess then uh, until 3.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case, or 2.30, rather, I'm sorry. Uh, don't discuss this case with anyone. And don't form any opinions about it. And uh, we'll resume at uh, 2.30. I do have the note from uh, Mr. Emerson. Uh, is it your feeling you won't be able to get here by 11 or? Um, I don't know. That's supposed to be a 45 minute session and. Uh As to what you think uh, the arrival time would be. I move it back a half hour. And I can Feel More comfortable, like 11:30. Yeah. Then I've got to have some casting done on my foot, so okay. I'm have to clean up. Okay. All right. Well, we'll work it out. Uh, it might be that we'll just take the morning off then to get everybody uh, the whole morning off. All right. We'll be in recess until 2:30, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We'll see you back here at 2:30. Council, please remain. All right. The uh, jurors have left the courtroom. Miss Abramson, you tend to shake your head negatively when the court rules against you. Yes, I do, Your Honor. And you had better stop doing that or the court's going to find you in contempt. Well, the court may be finding me in contempt pretty soon anyway because I'm finding the court's rulings astonishingly biased. Are you inviting the court to find you in contempt because you're in indicating you're going to do contemptuous things? No, no, I'm just saying there's only so much unfairness one can bear. And well, I counsel, can't if you... That I can't do it. If you feel that you are going to be unable to uh, behave professionally in a non-contemptuous fashion. We'll deal with that very uh, effectively and uh, deal with you and uh, your conduct, and uh, it is not going to work to the benefit of you or your client. I understand that, Your Honor. We do the best we can. To well, you had better behave professionally. I'm warning you at this time. Is that clear? I heard you. Yes, indeed, sir. It's uh, something the court will take seriously if you misbehave. I'm sure you will. All right, then we'll be in recess, and uh, you've heard what the court had to say. Yes. All right, I believe we have everybody back in court, so all the jurors are present. Uh, the witness can get back on the witness stand, please. This is cross-examination. Mrs. Cano, I believe you indicated that you were responsible for filing the claim with Sun Life in order to get the proceeds of your brother's life insurance policy. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you remember about when it was that you filed the claim? On August 23rd, right from Live Entertainment Office. And I believe you've indicated that when the policy paid out, that the money was sent to you and you deposited it in the defendant's accounts at Smith Barney, is that correct? It could be at Smith Barney, it could be at United Jersey Bank, either one of them was. Well, I some money at Smith Barney and some money at United Jersey Bank. Well, I believe it was your testimony on direct examination that the money was given to you and then you divided it up afterwards. Is, is, that is, is correct, United Jersey Bank was one of the places where I placed money. And at the time that you made these transactions, was Eric Menendez in the same city that you were in? In other words, were you both in either the East or in California? I don't recall that. I know that I require his signature on the check, probably, so. 
All right. Cool, then. Do you remember what day it was that the um, Sun Life policy made the first payment? No, I do not, but I, I know the amount. All right. It was approximately $400,000 divided evenly. Is that That's correct? That's correct. $200,000 each. Okay. Your Honor, I have here an Exhibit 140. I'd like to approach the witness, please. Yes. I'm going to show you an affidavit of a custodian of records of Sun Life Assurance Company. Sure. And uh, referring you to paragraph 6, I'd like to have you read that, and then I'm going to ask you a question about paragraph 6. Now, also, as long as I've got you it hit up here, would you look at paragraph 7 as well? Yes. Now, this is kind of the um, affidavit of the custodian of records from Sun Life Assurance indicates that the money was wired directly to the United Jersey accounts. That is, the $400,000 was wired directly on September the 8th to two accounts at, in New Jersey, one for Eric Menendez and one for Lyle Menendez. I don't recall that, to be honest with you. I have the check um, stubs of the checks that came in, and I have them in, I, I believe that I gave them to our lawyers. Um, may I approach, Your Honor? I have here a um, bank document, which is not yet the market exhibit. I'd like to show it to the witnesses to see if it refreshes the recollection. Okay. Right. I've shown it to counsel. I'm going to show you a check right here which is dated September the 11th. It's the amount of $50,000 to Smith Barney for Eric Menendez. That's right. All right. Does that um, particular check refresh your memory that, in fact, the money was transferred from the United Jersey account to Smith Barney? But I believe this is the second money, though. Well, um, if you This is not the first money. Well, this check is dated September the 11th, the one I just showed you, right? Yes. Your Honor, may this be marked as the um, exhibit next in order? 189. Thank you. May I approach again? Yes. Um, you said that the check that I just showed you in Exhibit 189 represents the second payment, but... That's look, my recollection. Well, looking at this, the paragraph 7 of the affidavit of Ms. Bonin, it appears that the second payment wasn't made until September the 15th. Could be. Could be. It doesn't really matter. I was controlling both of the accounts. You were controlling both defendants' accounts? <coughs> both of Eric's accounts. That is correct. I believe you indicated that you wrote the check for the Jeep. Yes, I did. I have here. I signed for Eric. That's your question. Okay, I have here until 138. I'd like to approach the witness, please. Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object to, to that. I think that's misleading what counsel is attempting to do. Well, at this point, she's just showing her uh, exhibit. What exhibit is this? It's exhibit 138, the Jeep records. Yes. All right, now, um, were you actually with Eric Menendez the day that he signed this contract? No, Steve Goldberg was. And showing you the third page of the exhibit appears to be mm -hmm. a check for dated September the 21st of 89. That, that is correct, but that check bounced. All right, but this, this handwriting on this check is not yours. No, it was his. So I sent him the second check. All right, and the second check. So the real check that was paid was the check that I wrote. Your Honor, I have here a copy of that check. Um, do counsel, may I mark it as the next exhibit? Yes, go ahead. Exhibit 190, please. All right. If you can identify it in some way. So. This is a copy of a, a letter from Smith Barney with a check attached. It's check number 191. It's all Xerox. For what amount? The check is for $21,241.32. I'm going to show you exhibit 190. Mrs. Cano, is this yes. the check that you're referring to that you actually wrote? That is correct. And you wrote that check on January 26th of 1990? That is correct. But the check that Eric wrote was for September of 89? I am aware of that. I believe you indicated that you had full control of Eric's uh, financial affairs during this period of time. Yes, but it could be by phone. I mean, he had a checkbook with him the same way I had checkbooks with me. So that the check that you actually wrote to the Jeep people was written approximately four months. Two, three months after the check bounced and came back, he had not realized he did not have enough money on that account. He moved to strike everything after he did not realize his being non-responsive and calls for hearsay. After that? 
Yes, he did not realize. May that be stricken, please? Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Now, the policy, the Sun Life Assurance Policy, paid out on September the 6th, approximately. Is that correct? Around sometime in September. I don't recall what date. Did, when you had your conversations with them, did they ask you if the beneficiaries had been cleared of being involved? What do you mean? Your Honor, objection calls for hearsay. Objection sustained. Were you aware of the fact that generally life insurance policies do not pay out to people who are responsible for the death of the insured? Objection, Your Honor, assumes facts and not in evidence. Overall. Were you aware of that? Depending on the situation. Well, if someone is involved in the intentional killing of the, of the person upon whose life the policy is issued, do life insurance, from your experience in the life insurance business, do those policies pay out to the beneficiaries? Again, Your depending Honor, on the situation. I'm going to object to questions called for legal conclusions as part of the witness. There's no qualification. You'd have to lay a foundation. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. How long did you work selling life insurance? I have been working since 1980. And do you have um, a license to sell life insurance? Of course I do. Did you take any courses in order to become a? Of an course I do. And did you re receive any training in the um, propriety of issuing uh, life insurance proceeds to people who are responsible for the death of the insured? Yes, I did. Okay. And um, at the time that you obtained uh, the payout on the Sun Life Assurance policy on September the 6th, were you aware that uh, generally life insurance companies don't pay proceeds to people involved in crimes. Your Honor, I'm still going to object to the questions calling for legal conclusion beyond the scope of direct and irrelevant. Objection on the first ground. Um, it would also relate to her knowledge of the policies or practices of this particular company. Are you aware of the policies and practices of the Sun Life Assurance Company? Yes, I am. And did they have a policy that they paid life insurance proceeds to people who were responsible for the death of the insured? Same objection. Overall. Did, did they have that policy? I'm sorry, say it again. Did Sun Life Assurance Company have a policy that they would pay proceeds to people responsible for the deaths of the insured? I have no idea. So this policy paid out approximately 17 days after the death of your brother, is that correct? That is correct. They pay immediately. It's within seven days that they, they is the usual and customary way of paying after the claim is placed. Now, I believe you've indicated that you approved much of the expense uh, expenditures that Eric Menendez uh, made during the period of time before his arrest, is that, that correct? That is correct. And the pool table that you testified, um, did, he, did he consult with you in order to buy the pool table? We talked about it. Do you remember how much it cost? Yes, around $8,000. And did you personally pay for that pool table? I don't think so. Okay. Um, the rent on the condominium that he was... I believe it was mentioned. In what the was the question? How much was the rent on the condominium? All right, that has already been ruled upon. Did you approve the purchase of a condominium by Eric Menendez? Objection, Your Honor. Assumes facts in not in evidence. Overall. He never wanted to purchase a, a condominium. The furniture that was purchased by Eric Menendez, do you remember approximately how much money he spent purchasing the furniture? I don't recall, but something around six, eight thousand dollars as well. And did you pay for that yourself? No, we were together. He made the checks. And I believe you've indicated that you, you approved the purchase of the Jeep for about $21,000? That is correct. How about the Rolex watch? Did you approve that? I don't think it was Eric's, I don't think it was Eric's idea of the Rolex watch. You want to help the defendants? No, I do not. I know that Lyle was buying a Rolex watch and insisted that Eric should have one too. I was present when that conversation happened. You were present from what conversation? When they were talking in Princeton that they, Eric Lyle wanted to go and buy a watch and, and convince Eric to go with him to buy one too. Um, when did this conversation take place? Some place in Princeton the, the week that Jose died. After his death? Yes. Did the defendants go to Princeton between August the 20th and August the 24th? Of course we all did. No, not on the 24th. Okay, well. Then I heard it in California. You have to admit that those were very confusing days for me, too. So I, sometime I heard the conversation. Move to strike her answer. Everything after I have to admit is being non-responsive, Your Honor. 
overall the answer will stand. The, the, were you aware that Eric went on trips during the period of time? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? We haven't heard the question yet. Did you? Did What's you? What's your question? Did you approve the expenditure of money for Eric to take trips between the time of his parents' death and the time of his arrest? I object to that, Your Honor, on the basis of the 402. Overall. There is no reason for me to object. He was traveling to play tennis, and he was traveling to take things out of his mind. I believe you indicated that um, Eric Menendez told you that he wanted to give money to the homeless? Yes, he did. Are you aware of whether or not he ever did give money to the he homeless? He never got the estate money. Okay, but he did get approximately $350,000. I'm sorry, but that's peanuts. Pardon me? That's peanuts beside the estate. That money was not an amount of money to create a foundation. You don't create a foundation with that amount of money. It's a very small amount of money. I believe you indicated that um, that they never got the estate. Is that correct? They never, the estate was never probated to them. Is that correct? That is correct. It hasn't and, finished yet. And they got arrested, right? Yes, they did. I have nothing further this witness. Any redirects? When Eric talked to you about the homeless, he was talking about establishing a charitable foundation? That is correct. And about funding that foundation from monies that he would inherit? That is correct. And in your opinion, $350,000 would not be enough to fund a charitable foundation? That is correct. Now, plus he couldn't put all the money on the foundation. He needed to leave as well, so. Okay. Sustain the last portion of the answer is stricken. To the best of your knowledge, was there any other source of income for Eric uh, besides the insurance money? No. And at the time of Eric's arrest, did he still have a substantial amount of that insurance money in accounts that you controlled? Yes, he did. And in fact, wasn't the amount of insurance money that he still had used to pay the initial legal fees for both himself and his brother? That is correct. I want to show you a document, Your Honor. I'd like to mark this on 191. 191. I've already shown this to counsel. Mrs. Connor, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Is that a memorandum that you received from Sun Financial Group following the telephone call that you placed to place the claim? That is correct. And does that document indicate that you made the telephone call to report the claim on August 23rd, 1989? That is correct. And is that the phone call placing the claim that you made from Jose Menendez's office at Live? That is correct. Now, does that particular, that memo was prepared by an employee at Sun Life? Yes, in the home office. And does that particular employee refer you to another claims person at Sun Life? That is correct. And is the claims person that that re re uh, memo refers you to the person whose affidavit Mrs. Bozanich showed you a little while ago, someone named Bonina? That is correct, Paula Bonina. Paula Bonina, B-O-N-I-N-A. So you spoke to, what was the other woman's name? Ellen Knott. And you spoke to Ms. Knott on the 23rd? That is correct. And did you, subsequent to receiving that memoranda from Ms. Knott, speak to Paula Bonina? Yes. And did you, subsequent to the telephone call where you notified the claim, have to submit anything in writing? Yes, I sent a fax, I believe, with the application, the copy of the application, which showed the boys as contingent beneficiaries, and I also had to send them the death certificates. And do you know what date it was that you sent that fax? I don't recall, but I'm sure that it was as soon as I could gather all the information together. Now, showing you um, Exhibit 138 again, that this is what Dan showed you. That's the uh, packet, the copy of the purchase documents for the Jeep? Yes. Could you look and see what is the date of that purchase contract? I can find it. Oh, I'm sorry. October 21st, 1989. And do, uh, do, 
Is there a signature on a, on a line that bears that date, a signature that uh, looks like Eric's signature? Yes, that's Eric's signature. And does he sign um, in more than one place? Yes, he signed in four places, right? And are at least two of those signatures dated? Yes. He's signing on a dated line? That is correct. Now let's turn to the check, the one that uh, bounced, as you put it. What's the date on that check? September 21st, 1989. And does that appear to be an error given the date of the crime? Yes, Eric made a mistake. Now you said that Eric was not attempting to purchase a condominium. How do you know that? Because I know as a fact that if he would, first of all, he told me, and secondly, if he would have, I, I know that I would have been part of it. When you say he told you, he told you what? He told me that uh, his brother Lyle was buying a condo. Overall. Told you his brother was buying a condo? Yes. And uh, did he have a conversation with you about uh, loaning money to Lyle for that purpose? That is correct. And was that in a telephone call? Yes. And was he specifically asking you in that phone call if there was enough money in his United Jersey bank account to cover a deposit check that he was lending to Lyle? That, that is correct. Overall. That is correct. And to the best of your knowledge, did that deposit check that uh, Eric wrote uh, to loan Lyle money ever clear the bank? No, they, they never went through with that operation. And did you, we, did you become aware of the fact that Steve Goldberg got involved and dissuaded Lyle from doing that? Yes, I was aware of that. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Anything else by the prosecution? Um, just a couple questions. I believe you indicated that Eric Menendez had no other means of support at this time. Is that correct? That is correct. Did he ever go get a job? At the state of mind that no, he no, was. I, the question is, did he ever go I don't get know. a job? I don't know. I thought you were involved in this financial. Yes, matter. but not. Job was never one of the issues, so I don't know. He might have. I don't know. Now, where else did the legal fees come? You indicated that he used the remainder of the money that he got from his father's death to pay legal fees, is that correct? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I believe you indicated that at the time of his arrest that Eric Menendez used the remainder <coughs> of the life insurance money he had from his father's death to pay his and his brother's legal fees. Yeah, that, is, that misstates the testimony. It was to pay the initial legal fees. Right. Objection it was paid, overruled. The retainment was paid with that money. And that was the criminal legal fees, is that your understanding? That is correct. Do you know who paid for the rest of it? An objector is <coughs> beyond the scope. Sustained. <coughs> Nothing further. Anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. You're excused. Um, your, your Honor, I would ask that she be subject to recall, please. All right, yes. you will be ordered to return upon notice by counsel. Good. Yes. All right. Thank you. Is the next witness before both juries? Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. Cano, I want to direct your attention to a meeting that you had with Lyle and Eric Menendez on the Wednesday or Thursday following your brother's death. Do you know which meeting <laughs> I'm referring to? Yes, I do. And can you tell the juries whether or not the meeting took place on Wednesday or Thursday or whether you're sure about that? I really am not sure which of the two nights, but I know it was one of those two evenings. And can you tell us what the purpose of the meeting was? Yes. The purpose of the meeting was to explain to them my findings at their father's office of the financial issues of his father, of their father. And before the meeting, had you been to Jose Menendez's office? That is correct. And why had you been to the office? Because I felt that someone in the family had to take care of Jose's pending business, and I <coughs> called Marcy, his secretary, and asked her to come and get me, that I wanted to go and put a financial statement together for Jose. And did you, in fact, do that? Yes, I did. And did you go to the, his office on more than one occasion? Yes, I did. And when you got done at the office, did you have certain documents that you took with you? Uh, no, I did not have anything. I asked Marcy to help me in uh, finding all Jose's personal files so I could gather together some information and, and have an idea of what Jose had pending that I might be of help. 
And when, if ever, did you first tell Lyle or Eric Menendez that this meeting was going to take place? I told them, I believe, the same Tuesday. I told them that I needed to talk to them. I did not specify why, and they sort of evaded me. And then I did the same thing again on Wednesday. I only saw them in the evening, early evening time after I left the office. And was there a meeting um, beyond the meeting you're discussing that you were preparing for? Yes, that's correct. And was that a meeting, well, who was that a meeting with? That meeting was on Friday after the memorial services, right at Live Entertainment with the chairman of the board. And who is that person? That's Peter Hoffman. And why did you plan to meet with Peter Hoffman on Friday after the memorial service? Because of my findings at the office of my brother, I've, I've realized that there were some benefits of my brother that I thought that they could be negotiated. And I wanted, because of the situation where the boys were left and, and all the speculations that were being done at the time that it could have been related to the business, I thought that I could get Peter to um, subsidize some of the losses of the benefits that my brother had based on, on the children and, and help them out that way. And so did you arrange for this meeting on Friday with Peter Hoffman? No, I arranged it on Thursday. And did Lyle or Eric have anything to do with arranging that meeting with Peter Hoffman? Not at all. Did they know that such a meeting was planned to take place? No, on they Friday? did not. Objection sustained. The answer is true. Did you inform either Eric or Lyle prior to telling them that you wanted to meet with them that you had planned a meeting with Peter Hoffman? No, I did not. And when you contacted Lyle or Eric uh, Menendez concerning the meeting you wanted to have with them, did you have a telephone conversation with them about the purpose of the No, meeting? we were all the family. When they came together, we were all the family together. So I just approached them and said, boys, I need to talk to you. It's very serious, and I need to get together with you privately. And they just evaded me all the time, and they didn't want, were not interested in getting alone with me in any kind of conversation. So I had a hard time setting up that meeting. And how is it that you finally did uh, conduct a meeting with him? Well, I insisted finally that it was very important that I had uh, a meeting that I wanted to do with Peter Hoffman, and that it was very important that they knew what the meeting was going to be all about so it wouldn't go over their head. And I wanted them to be present as well. And when you went to this meeting, where did the meeting take place? I'm sorry, which meeting? Where did the meeting take place with Eric and Lyle? In their room at the Bel Air Hotel. And was there anyone else present besides no, there yourself, was not. Eric and Lyle Menendez? No, everybody was getting to get, uh, ready to go for dinner. We were gathering all together at the dining place normally for dinner. And did you take any documents with you to the meeting? Yes, I did. Can you tell the jury what documents you took with you? Well, I took all, I did a rough financial statement of assets and liabilities of Jose, and uh, I review all the insurance things, and I review all the benefits that were inside his contract, and basically put all that together to come up with some assets, you know, the assets he owned and the assets that were speculated that he should own or whatever, put them all together to have a rough idea of what Jose was worth so I could inform the boys and at the same time I also put some other information that I was going to present to Peter Hoffman. And prior to attending the meeting with Eric and Lyle, did you have knowledge of a life insurance policy that you in fact wrote for your brother? Yes, I did. And did you have that life insurance policy with you when you went to the meeting with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday or Thursday evening? No, I did not. I, I called my office and because I couldn't find it in Jose's files. And since I had a copy of it on the file, I faxed it directly to Sun Life when I did the claim for the boys. Right. Do you know when you submitted the claim to Sun Life? Yes, I did. On uh, Wednesday. And did either Wednesday Eric... Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning I did. Did either Eric or Lyle Menendez have any contact with you in reference to submitting that claim? No, not at all. Was that something you did on your own? That is correct. And you were you aware of the policy because you, in fact, were the person who... That's right. I'm the agent. Anyway, agents are the ones who do that normally, so I did not need to, to inform them about it. I knew it had to be done. Could I approach a witness, Your Honor? Yes. Do you recognize that document as the insurance policy that you wrote for your brother? 
Yes. And was that policy written in 1987? 1986, I believe. I think it was September 1986. Uh, it says issue date January 87, but I wrote it in September 86. And physically, that policy was located where after the death? Well, the application, um, the application copy was in my files in Florida, in West Palm Beach, Florida. This actual policy, I don't know where it came from. I would imagine it came from Sun Life, or uh, we never found it. And showing you what has been marked previously as exhibit number 181. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. Just tell the jury what that document is, please. This, uh, this is a document that I roughly prepared of Jose's assets to show the boys and to myself find out what they, Jose owned, et cetera. And exhibit number 182? This is a financial statement that I found on Jose's files, which I used to lead me sort of of where to find or what to look for when I did my own financial statement. Did you find 182 prior to the meeting with Lyle and Eric Menendez? I'm sorry? Did you find that document prior to your meeting with Lyle? Yes, Menendez? I did. As a matter of fact, I asked Marcy about this, and she told me not to believe it too much because she knew that Jose had inflated it. Okay. Objection sustained. Everything after yes is stricken as non-responsive. Uh, your next question, please. Thank you. And exhibit number 183, do you recognize that? Yes, I did this uh, to show Peter Hoffman uh, how many liabilities of taxes the boys would be having and in order to help me in my negotiation. And is that a document that you had with you when you met with Lyle and Eric on Wednesday or Thursday? I am not sure if I had this one or if I did it. That's why I'm not sure if I saw them Wednesday or Thursday. I know I did this one on Thursday before the meeting, but I'm not sure if I had that one. And 184? These, yes, I did this exactly to discuss with the boys. These are the different issues that I wanted to talk to them about. And that's a piece of paper that says on the top, issues to discuss. That right? is correct. And along the side, there are various issues. That is correct. And 185, do you recognize that document? <laughs> yes, this is another document that I found on Jose's personal financial um, file. And uh, it's, there's a letter, and then on the uh, it's just another financial statement that he had prepared for a bank. Right. Now, prior to attending this meeting on Wednesday or Thursday, were you also aware of a will that your brother and his wife had executed back in 1981? Yes, I was. I was a witness on that will. And did you have that will with you when you went to this meeting on Wednesday or Thursday? No, I did not. But you were aware of it? I was aware of what the, of the will had. Definitely. And on exhibit number 184, um, your one-page sheet, which says issues to discuss, one of the issues you have on here to discuss is the estate. That did, is correct. Did you, in fact, discuss that issue with Lyle and Eric Menendez when you had this meeting? Very briefly, because they really would not, did not want to listen to what I had to say. I was able to jot a couple of things to them. They just discarded the whole issue, and they told me they were not the beneficiaries of that, that they were out of the will. And do you recall? What topic you discussed first in this meeting with them? I don't recall exactly what's it called, the topic that I discussed first. The first thing I told them is that I had been at their father's office and that I had been putting together their assets and liabilities. And immediately, Lyle interrupted me and they said, Aunt Marta, we're not in the will. And I said, what do you mean you're not in the will? Of course you're in the will. He says, no, no, no. And then Eric said, no, Aunt Marta, we, our dad took us out of the will over a year ago. And I said, no, you're not. I remember, and you are in the will. I was a witness, and I know you are the beneficiaries of this money. So that was the beginning of the whole discussion back and forth of them trying to convince me that they had nothing to do with this. And I told them, well, whatever it is that you think you are or not, I do know that you are the beneficiary of the life insurance because I wrote that and I would know if you were changed. Let me, let me yes. break this down a little bit. Did you mention your estimate of the value of the estate? Yes, I did. And did either Lyle or Eric react in any way to your statement of what the value of the state, yes. the state was? Yes, they did. And who reacted? And Eric was, was the, the first one to say, I can't believe my father had so much money. And what, if anything, did Lyle say in response to that? Lyle just looked at me like not believing what I was saying. He was really pretty distrustful at the time. And did you also discuss the life insurance policy 
that you had written for your brother, the Sun Life life insurance policy? I began to tell them about the life insurance, and they again interrupted me. I believe it was Eric, and said, and Marta, that insurance was never done. My father never took the physical. And did you know what he was referring to when he, he said his father had never taken the physical? Well, I figured that it was because I had already had a conversation at live on, in reference to the $5 million policy, and I explained to him that I wasn't talking about life contract benefit, contractual benefit insurance. I was talking about another life insurance that I had written for their father, right. and I knew they were the beneficiaries. So you started talking about the Sun Life policy, correct? That is correct. And at the time you were talking about the Sun Life policy, there was also, to your knowledge, another insurance policy on your brother? There was supposed to be, based on his contract, a $5 million policy, which apparently Jose never took the medical, therefore was never done. And when Eric Menendez said that his father had not taken the physical, did you know or believe what life insurance policy he was referring to? Yes, I knew he was referring to the $5 million policy because Marcy and everyone at the office had already told me that, and we had had a, some kind of discrepancy on that. And from anything that either Lyle or Eric said, were they aware, to your knowledge, of the existence of this Sun Life policy that you had written back in 86 or 86? No, they had Objection, no. Objection, uh, calls for speculation on the part of the witness. Objection sustained, the answer is true. Can you tell me what, if anything else, you said about the, the Sun Life insurance policy uh, other than what you've already indicated? I explained to them what I was talking about. I explained to them that there was a life insurance policy that I had originally written for their father many years ago, and I had converted to a higher policy back in, at the end of 1986, and that I knew they were the contingent beneficiaries on that policy. And did they respond that they knew it as well? They asked me what policy was I talking about, how much was this policy for, and they said, are you sure we are the beneficiary? And Marta, my father took us out of the will, and I said, not on this one, because I would know. I definitely would know on this one, because I'm the agent. And did you also have further discussion about the $5 million policy that had been issued by the company, or supposedly was going to no. be issued by the company? At that point, I started... Um, talking to them what I was going to present to Peter Hoffman, and among them I was going to make a claim to replace the $5 million policy, which was never done, but that I felt that the company had an obligation to them on a, on a, f a figure like that, whether it was in other kinds of benefits or what have you, but I did feel that the company was liable on not having pursued that Jose did take this policy from his contract. That was part of his contractual employment. And what, if anything, did Lyle or Eric Menendez say in response to that suggestion? They continued telling me that they were not on the wheel, that uh, they were not the beneficiaries, so they really weren't, they were sort of discarding me. They were not interested in what I was talking about. I have one moment, Your Honor. That's all I have. Thank you. Any examination on behalf of Eric Menendez? No, Your Honor. Cross-examination? Yes, please. May I have the exhibits? Yes. Actually, may we take our recess right now so I can look at these exhibits? How long is your examination? It'll be about 10 minutes. Can we just have a brief recess, like a five-minute recess? Uh, let me see counsel here so we have some idea of the schedule first. Resume with the examination of the witness, cross-examination. Thank you. Mrs. Cano, um, I believe you testified in direct examination that um, you believe that the meeting that you had with, the, with your two nephews occurred on either Wednesday or Thursday of the week after your brother and sister-in-law were killed. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you remember testifying at a previous hearing that it was your best recollection that it was on Thursday that the meeting occurred? I testified to both. I testified that I wasn't sure if it was Wednesday or Thursday, and when I was pressed to try to pinpoint one, I said, well, maybe it was Thursday, but I do not, I'm not sure which of the two nights it was. Um, directing court and counsel to volume 74, um, the testimony on August 23rd of this year, page 12,450. <coughs> Line, do you have it? Mm -hmm. Okay, line 20, question. And your best recollection of when you had the meeting with the defendants was on Thursday night, is that correct? Answer, I believe so. If you check the previous several questions, you will see what I'm referring to. 
Okay, so you have, in fact, reviewed this transcript before testifying today, is that correct? I sure have. All right. Um, you understand that um, the day on which you ha had the meeting with the defendants may have make a difference, is that correct? I don't think it makes a difference. Well, I, don't, I don't see why it would make a difference either Wednesday or Thursday. Do you know that on Thursday um, afternoon that your nephews bought two, three Rolex watches at the Century um, City Shopping Mall? I wasn't aware it was Thursday, but it still wouldn't make a difference <laughs> if I met with them Wednesday or Thursday. I don't see why you would refer to the difference. They didn't buy it with the estate money. They bought it with a card. With a credit card? Yes. But not so, from the state. So although you testified on August the 23rd that your best recollection was that it was Thursday, it's now your testimony, um, and sometimes your testimony uh, before, that it was Wednesday or Thursday that you had the meeting with the defendants. Is that I correct? I think it's the same thing I said before. If it was Thursday evening, it could have been Thursday evening. It could have also been Wednesday evening. If I'm going to be really honest, I have to say that I'm not sure either one. If you ask me which of the two you pinpoint me, maybe it was Thursday, but I really don't know. May I approach, please, Your Honor? What? May I approach, please, with exhibits 130, 183 and 184? Yes. Okay. I believe you testified on direct examination today that exhibit 183, which is a list of assets, liabilities, taxes due, and then net and monthly payments, is a document which you prepared on Thursday, um, the following the death of your brother and sister. Could be. Could be Thursday. I do believe. My recollection, this is the last one I did, so I probably did it Thursday morning. All right, and I mm -hmm. believe that in prior testimony you gave that you visited your brother's office on <coughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in order to get an accurate uh, picture of his financial situation. That is correct. I believe your testimony was is that Exhibit 184, which is an exhibit entitled Issues to Discuss, was an ex it was a list of things that you prepared, and for what purpose did you prepare Exhibit 184? That it was specifically for the boys. That was for Eric and Lyle. These are the situations that I wanted to talk to Eric and Lyle about. Okay, so the issues to discuss were not for any meetings with people um, at live entertainment, but rather were f was for the purpose of your discussion with your nephews. No, it's for both. I mean, I prepare for them, but of course the information there I was going to use as well in my meeting with, with Peter Hoffman. It's, I, this is what I wanted them to be aware of before the meeting, but of course these are issues that I was going to talk about in the meeting. And is it your recollection that you had Exhibit 184 with you at the time <coughs> that you met with the defendants to discuss their financial situation? That one, yes, I did. Now, I believe you indicated that um, they, meaning the defendants, um, were not anxious to meet with you or didn't want to discuss finances or something to that effect. Do you recall your testimony yes, earlier? Yes, it, it had nothing to do with finances because they didn't know that that's what I, had, I was going to do. They just didn't want to meet with any one of the family privately. I, I got that feeling anyway. Okay. Um, and would it be your uh, testimony then that the only that you only had one meeting with the defendants before the memorial service in Los Angeles dealing with the issue of assets and liabilities and those kinds of things. That is correct. And that meeting now to your best recollection was either Wednesday or Thursday night. That is correct. Okay. And you had exhibit 184 with you in preparation for the meeting with your nephews, correct? This is 184, yes. Okay. That's right. Now, I believe you indicated on Friday after the memorial service that you had a meeting with executives from Live Entertainment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And that meeting occurred at approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon? That is correct. Aside from being at your brother's office on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to check into his assets and liabilities, had you had any other meetings with any of the executives at Live Entertainment before the meeting you had at 1 o'clock on Friday, the 25th of August? I, I did, well, they came in, I was at my brother's office, and they would come in and say something to me constantly, different people, so I don't know if you call those that meetings, but I do remember meeting, and I don't recall if it was the day before or the same day, but I do remember meeting with David, um, with the two Davids before meeting with Peter Hoffman. I don't know if we were waiting for Peter or if it was the day before. I can't recall that, but I do know I met with them for a few minutes before. Now, by the two Davids, do you mean David Campbell and David Mishra? That is correct. And it's your best recollection at this time that you met with the two Davids either the Thursday 
or the Friday of that week. That's what I recall. I know I met with them, but I think it was one of those two days. I, I can't exactly tell you, but I think that that's my best recollection is one of those two days. Now, the meeting on Friday um, with Peter Hoffman, was Roger Smith at that meeting? I don't think so. Were the defendants at that meeting on Friday after the memorial service? Yes, they were. Okay, and had you had any other meetings with your nephews at live entertainment or discussions with live entertainment executives with your two nephews prior to the one o'clock meeting on Friday the 25th of August? No. I know that we were together waiting for Peter to come in and maybe that's what you're talking about. The only people that were present in the meeting were Carlos Baralt, Peter Hoffman, David, not David, uh, they've, um, if you tell me the two last names, I tell you which Campbell one. Or Campbell or Miss Campbell. David Campbell and the two boys and I. That's what I recall. And that is the meeting on Friday at 1 o'clock on August the 25th. That, that is correct. That was during the reception. The reception was happening at live. During that meeting, was there any discussion about the $5 million life insurance policy that was part of uh, your brother's compensation package? Sure. At this time, I'm going to object. It's beyond the scope and calling for hearsay. Well, the question itself does not uh, call for the substance of the conversation, just whether such a conversation occurred. But this and the scope. Objection overruled on that ground, since the subject has been raised. I don't recall, but I am. Um, it's part of what I wanted to discuss about, but I'm not. I'm not sure that we we talked specifically of that. I believe you received. I believe you indicated that you received information that your brother had not taken the physical which was necessary to put in force the $5 million policy. That, that is correct. Where did you receive that information from? Different, different sources. It was told to me by the um, controller. It was told to me by Marcy. And of course, afterwards, it was confirmed by the boys. Before you spoke to your nephews about this fact, yes. had you had any prior discussions with them about whether or not your brother had taken the physical. In other words, you had a meeting with your nephews on Wednesday or Thursday night at which this subject was broached, the $5 million in the physical, correct? That's correct. Had you had any prior discussions with your nephews before this meeting? With about my the nephews? No. About the physical for the $5 million policy? No, not with my nephews. Okay, so the first time that you became aware that they had knowledge about the $5 million policy and the physical was during this meeting you had with them in preparation for the meeting you had on Friday, August the 25th. That is correct. Okay. Now, I believe you indicated that um, during this meeting with your nephews, um, you had some, you had a state of mind that your brother had written a will which had left his estate to his sons in the event that his wife um, died, predeceased him or died at the same time, correct? Yes, that was a will done okay. in the past. And at the time that you had this discussion on Wednesday or Thursday of that week, um, had you seen a copy of the will since the death of your brother and sister-in-law? No, I had not. I did have one in my files at home, at my office in Florida, but I had not looked at it. Now, when you came into town, I believe you came to Los Angeles on Monday, the 21st of August. Is that correct? That is correct. And when you came into town, did you bring a copy of the will with you? No, I did not. I believe it's your testimony that um, the following day, which was Tuesday, the 22nd of August, you began your search at your brother's office to look for his assets and liabilities. That is correct. Were it was you asked morning Tuesday? Were you asked by anyone to do that? No, as I stated before, I there was a call coming in. Carlos and all the men had left, looking for the safety deposit to see if they could find the wheel or what have you, and. We was, I was with my sister Terry, Terry answered the phone, and it was a call from the broker's firm. And when that margin call came about, that's when I realized that what am I doing here, sitting and, and crying. I have to go and try to put things together for Jose because there might be some issues that need to be resolved. That's, I did it on my own. I just called Marcy and told her to come and pick me up. And that was Marcy Eisenberg, your that is correct. brother's secretary at yes. the time of his death, correct? Mm -hmm. And did she, in fact, come and get you on that Tuesday and take you to live entertainment? Yes, she came on a limo to pick me up. Did she come and pick you up on any of the other days to take you to live entertainment to continue your search? Yes, she did. She uh, picked me up every single morning. Um, I believe you indicated um, 
that you told the defendants what your estimate was of the um, estate of your dead brother. Do you remember your testimony? Yes. And what figure did you quote them? Well, I, I quote them on a gross basis around 14 million. And you say that they expressed a surprise at that amount, is that correct? Honestly, not only surprised, they were not even interested in what I was talking about. They said, I'm Marta, we're not in the wheel. They just did not. The only surprise that I heard is when Eric said, I can't believe my father had so much money. Had you ever stayed at your brother's home in Beverly Hills prior to his death? Yes. Okay, do you know how much he paid for that home? I know now, I didn't know at the time. Do you know how much he paid for that home? I think it's appro approximately around $5 million. Now, um, during the week that you were, well, the four or five days that we, you were in Los Angeles before the memorial service, did you ever go to your brother and sister-in-law's home uh, for the purpose of searching for any assets or liabilities in the home? No, I did not. Did you ever go to the home at all during that period of no, time? No, I did not. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Was the $14 million figure that you mentioned an accurate figure, to your knowledge? It was inaccurate, yes. Accurate or in inaccurate? Inaccurate. That's correct. And did you also mention a, a, a net figure as yes, well? Yes, I did. And do you know what that figure was? Are you talking about the conversation uh, with the two defendants? Yes, Your Honor. In this conversation with yes. the two defendants? The net you? figure was around 7 or $8 million. I can't recall right now which one of the two. But and those were? Your computations? That was my computation based on all the gatherings that I did at his office. And was that also accurate or inaccurate? It was inaccurate. Both those figures were inaccurate? That is correct. And they expressed surprise as to both those figures? Yes. You were asked whether you stated in prior testimony, and in answer to the question, your best recollection of when you had the meeting with the defendants was on Thursday, and your answer, I believe so. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do. Do you also remember being asked this question? Do you remember when that discussion was? And this is at page 12422, line 15. Do you remember being asked this question? Do you remember when that discussion was? And your answer, that it was either Wednesday night or Thursday night. I don't recall which of the two nights, but I'm definitely sure that it was before Friday, which was the memorial. That is correct. And is that still your testimony? That is correct. The $5 million figure for the house, did you determine how much uh, was owed on the mortgage for that house? I think he had a very large mortgage, but I don't, re I think it was two and a half million in mortgage. And was the house, my recollection. was the house sold to your knowledge? The house was sold. Do you know what it was sold for? Objection irrelevant. Overall. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was sold around three and a half, four million, something on those numbers. Thank you. Anything else? <coughs> no, you are. All right, thank you. You may step down.